The faded green Mercedes Benz with the two Mossad agents in the front seat sat under a tree that grew smaller as the seven-person group chugged away from the shore in the old wooden fishing boat. Matt inhaled the sea air and clung on to the seat, feeling old fish scales, splinters, and dried salt against his palms. The air was still cool, but already he felt the hint of the balmy day to come as sheets of golden light bathed their wetsuit-clad bodies. The captain, Mahmoud, a little man with few teeth and the brawniest forearms Matt had ever seen, knew exactly where the sunken island was to be found, and also the best dive spots, as he'd taken probably hundreds of diving tourists out from the beach. Matt placed his hand on the rough gunwale. There were a few fingernail spots of green paint still attached, but the faded glory of huge holes of shimmering silver bodies in woven rope nets was lost permanently now to the more lucrative tourist trade. Adira stood in the small open cabin with Mahmoud, chatting amiably, and Matt watched as he occasionally pointed out different landmarks on the shore. Adira nodded, looking impressed, probably extracting as much useful information as she could from their ancient mariner. Each of them wore wetsuits with tanks, weights, and goggles pushed up on their foreheads. Matt admired Adira's physique in the suit, long and athletic. He turned and saw that Hartog looked hugely bulked, like some sort of Superman, and that Baruk also looked formidable. Abrams, Matt, and Andy were more modestly muscled, and Tanya looked tiny compared to the Israeli woman. However, her visible curves made it impossible for Matt not to think back to smooth, pale skin beneath his sheets. She smiled at him, and he smiled in return. They traveled for another few minutes, and then, with the sandy beach just a yellow strip in the distance, the captain turned off the engine and let the boat coast for a few dozen feet more. His eyes never left the shoreline as he lined himself up with a couple of taller landmarks, and then he called for Adira to nudge an iron pick anchor over the side. It loudly dragged about ten feet of chain, and then a few more dozen feet of salt-toughened rope into the magnificent blue water. Matt watched as the rope sizzled dryly on the gunwale and rapidly sank. In another second, it suddenly went limp. Bottom, Mahmoud said in English. He turned and grinned. Adira looked around slowly and then spoke in Egyptian to Baruch. He nodded and took off his mask. The agent had just been volunteered for topside lookout duties. Adira put a foot up on a seat and pointed out over the water. Out there, Mahmoud says we are just fifty feet from the island. He won't drop anchor any closer due to the underwater snags. Some places are only twenty feet deep. Others can drop down to eighty. He said that the island has broken into three pieces, and the fissures are the deepest areas, but there's nothing in them to see. She waved her arm over the water. Columns, sphinxes, and blocks are scattered in a wide area. She turned to each of them. We start with the island, and then we can broaden our search if we need to. She stepped down and walked in among them. Okay, we all get dive buddies. The Major and myself, Matt and Andy, Lieutenant Hartog and Captain Kovitz. She zipped her suit to the top and looked at her dive watch. Stay in visual. It's now seven hundred hours. First surface in thirty minutes, clear? Everyone nodded. Breathing equipment was given final checks. Goggles came down, and then bodies fell backwards over the side. They swam down at an angle into the azure water, and Matt was delighted to find that it was warmer in the ocean than up on the boat's deck. He had dived many times before, but was far from an enthusiast. Matt remembered descending in inky black water. There was something about not knowing what was below you that still gave him the creeps, especially as he understood that there were things in the depths staring back at you, 
big things, seeing you without you even knowing they were there. Matt shuddered. He wasn't looking forward to the night dive for exactly all those reasons. But this dive, this was more like it. The water was a magnificent blue, like tinted glass, and so warm he was sure they didn't really need their wetsuits. As he descended, he looked at his companions and smiled around his mouthpiece. The group stayed fairly close together, a school of oversized water mammals heading to the bottom to forage, clouds of bubbles streaming up behind them. They neared the sand, and Matt spotted his first relic, a broken sphinx, probably weighing about two tons, and nearly perfectly formed. Andy swam in close to him and pointed at the stone lion creature, then gave Matt a thumbs up. Matt smiled. The geologist's eyes were round with enthusiasm behind his goggles. They headed on towards the island, and the sea floor started to resemble a building site or a disused quarry. Huge blocks, half-sunken columns, and giant slabs of coral-coated stone were all thrown together, all encrusted with algae, barnacles, and coral of all colors and ages. Then, looming up in the distance, a small, broken mountain, the sunken island of Pharos. To Matt it looked like the carcass of some dead prehistoric creature curled up on the sand, the leviathan body all sharp angles and weird growths. The group hovered in the water. The remains of the island were several hundred feet around, and Mahmoud had been right. It was broken into the three. Fish of varying sizes patrolled the deep cracks that dropped beyond the sun's rays. Adira swam on strongly and was first to the top, where she waited, floating above one deep rent. She pointed to Matt and then to Hartog and then into the other fissures. The meaning was clear. Each take one and descend. Thumbs up were returned, and then into the cracks each team descended. Matt exhaled, and as the air left his lungs, his weight belt took him into the deep vent in the rock. It was wide enough for Andy to follow at his side, and the geologist nudged him, pointing out jutting edges and striations in the natural rock, and then making cracking apart motions with his hands. Matt nodded, getting it. The last earthquake must have been so huge it literally tore the island apart and dragged the rest to the bottom as effectively as the Kraken did ancient schooners. As they dropped further, they both switched on wristband flashlights and pointed them downward. Matt was surprised and dismayed by how far their crack in the island descended, and as he kicked lower, he had to stop several times to repressurize his eardrums. Close to the bottom now, the corals and sea grasses that relied on light had disappeared, and softer sponges dominated. Spiny crustaceans waved antennae from the rock ledges, and small fish darted in and out of Matt's light beam. He heard his breathing loud in his ear, and the occasional clang from one of their tanks as they bumped into the ever-converging walls. Andy jammed into him, and they both slowed as they came to the wedge end. Matt righted himself and hovered, panning his light one way, then the next. He examined the walls. There was nothing that even remotely indicated humans had touched these depths, let alone some sort of entranceway or passage. Andy floated up beside him and shrugged. Matt nodded and pointed along the length of the fissure. They'd do a slow traverse along the craggy corridor and then surface. As Matt and Andy were coming to the end, another flashlight flickered above them. They came up together to find the small form of Tanya and the much larger one of Hartog, together looking like a mother whale and its calf. Tanya waved them onto the fissure she had checked and led them down into the crack. About a third of the way in, they came to a stone block embedded in the fissure wall. To Matt, it looked like a piece of the ruined lighthouse that had tumbled in during the cataclysm, 
and then become overgrown. But Tanya tapped it and shook her head. Matt guessed she meant it shouldn't be there. She should know she's the archaeologist, he thought. He moved his flashlight along its edge and saw nothing that indicated it was anything other than what he initially suspected, a block of stone. He looked back at her and shrugged again. Andy, who was performing his own inspection, turned and made growing over motions with his hands. Matt nodded and hung suspended before the slab for a moment, looking at its shape and size, then reached out. As soon as his fingers touched the edge of the stone, his mind exploded with vivid images. He saw the world, earth, but not the earth as we knew it. The scene was so ancient, there was no moon yet captured by our gravity. The sky had few stars, and our world bubbled and steamed as it still cooled. It should have been impossible to recognize, but Matt knew it was our own. He looked out over a vast, blood-red landscape. The seas had not yet formed, but it was not devoid of life. There were monstrous creatures fighting and mating, killing and maiming. Things with vast, evil intellects, whose machinations touched the entire universe and whose lifespans could ride out a thousand apocalypses. The sounds were terrifying. Their bodies were so huge that mountains were crushed to dust when they fought, and craters were smashed into a continent's crust when they fell. Impossibly, Matt's mind registered it all, and the worst came when he inhaled, and the smell of their blood and excrement filled his nostrils. He ripped away his mouthpiece and jetted a stream of vomit into the water. Immediately, the murky clouds started to settle towards the bottom of the crack, and dozens of small fish shot from nowhere to pick out the larger chunks as it floated down. A free feast, pre-chewed, Matt thought. Tanya swam over, but with the images shut down and his breakfast gone, Matt immediately felt better. He nodded and had replaced his mouthpiece. Tanya pointed to the surface. They came up together, broke the surface, pushed their masks up, and trod water. Within another minute, all the divers had returned, and together they swam slowly back towards the boat. Anything? Adira called. Nada. Just a giant crack in the rocks that is home to plenty of sea sponges and a few nosy lobsters. The most we can get down there is a nice dinner, Andy said, and then grinned. That's if you like fish with a touch of Kern's sauce. I'm okay, Matt said. Must have been the breakfast or something. Just got a bit sick. I'm okay. He changed the subject, not wanting to dwell on the images, but knew that reading the copy of the Al-Azif must have affected him more than he'd like to think. The stone slab set into the wall, he said. Maybe nothing, but we weren't expecting anything obvious, were we? Describe it, Adira said quickly. Tanya recounted the size and shape. It was definitely lighthouse-era stonework, and the only sign of human habitation below the island's crustal surface. Adira looked to Matt and Andy, and the geologist bobbed his head. Maybe. I mean, it sure looked like a tumbled part of the edifice to me. But could just be where the earthquake tore open the surface skin of the island and some debris fell in. Matt nodded. Yeah, not sure it was anything significant, but might be worth bringing back a crowbar. Adira looked at the sky and then her watch. We take a break and warm up on deck. Then we have time for one more dive before we head back. We'll take a quadrant each and expand our perimeter search. In another few hours they were on their way back, the afternoon growing cold with a slight breeze kicking up over the water. Matt sat on one edge of the boat, Tanya and Abrams in the seat next to him. Going to be the first full moon tonight. If there's anything more to find, then this has got to be it. 
When they reached the shore, Adira froze momentarily, and then spoke in hushed tones to Baruch. He continued unpacking the boat, but his eyes slid left, then right, along the coastal road. Matt eased up next to her. Problem? She also continued with her tasks, but spoke softly in Hebrew, knowing only Matt of the Americans would understand. Our security is gone. Matt looked for the Mercedes that had been parked under the tree. She was right, it was nowhere to be seen. He responded in her language. Would they have been called away? If there were overriding orders, I would know. I need to call this in, she said. She looked from Abrams to Hartog, who now seemed tuned in to her unease. Our time is running out. Enough! Drummond walked from the shadows in the soundproof basement and stood before the bound man. Crohn stepped back, breathing hard. There was a small smile of ecstasy on his blood-splattered face. The huge bodyguard wore a plastic apron and dark shirt, sleeves rolled up. Blood and specks of flesh coated the material and ran down the plastic to the floor. Sticking from the large front pocket of the apron was a pair of greasy-looking bolt cutters. Drummond looked down. There were two seats, nailed to the ground and facing each other. They both contained naked men, one untouched, but with eyes heavy with fatigue and scoured of any human emotion. The other contained a man who had been beaten to a red mess. Bits of bone showed whitely at his eyebrows and cheekbones. Both eyes were swollen closed, and his lips were split, in one place so badly the remains of his broken teeth showed through. Scattered around him on the floor were ten fingers, looking like pale grubs trailing bloody tracks back to their former owner. Drummond walked around the ruined man, tisk-tisking, and placed a hand on his bloody shoulder from behind. He wore rubber gloves and gently patted his captive. He looked across at the untouched man. This must really hurt. The important thing is, I'm not doing this because I hate him. I don't even know Agent Herzl here. I'm not doing it for him, or Crone, or even myself. In fact, you may have noticed that I have not asked a single question of him, although I have many. Drummond reached up and stroked the man's sweat-soaked hair. Many questions, but not for him. I'm not a monster, not really. Nothing like what's coming. He stifled a laugh, then spoke in perfect Hebrew to Agent Herzl. Release you now? The battered head came up a fraction, and one of the eyelids twitched, but couldn't possibly open through all the swelling and sticky blood. Drummond straightened. Crone, show him our mercy. Crone turned and lifted a huge silver bowl from a tabletop and came and placed it between the battered man's legs. Drummond looked to the untouched, seated man, his eyes now burned like laser beams of pure hate. The older man smiled. Good. Anger, defiance, determination. You will need it all. Agent Kahan, what you see here is nothing more than a demonstration of our resolve. Soon you will pray to be given this merciful gift. Drummond held out his hand, and Crone placed a long silver surgical blade into it. In a flash, he dragged it across the man's lower abdomen, causing his entire bowel and intestines to spill forward heavily and plop into the bowl. The man shuddered, and his ragged lips opened in a moan. Drummond stroked the man's hair, almost the way someone would their favorite cat that had taken up residence on their lap. He smiled and watched as blood ran thickly, already overflowing the crowded bowl. The room filled with the smell of dark blood and the contents of Herzl's bowels. 
Phew, what have you been eating? Drummond laughed with good humor. Crone passed him a clean towel, which he used to wipe off the blade. This might surprise you, he went on, stepping out from behind the dying man. But a human being can survive, well, exist anyway, with his bowels outside of his body for many, many hours. He looked up with raised eyebrows. Not a good look, though, hmm? He walked slowly towards Agent Kahan. Now to you. And for you, I do have questions, and yes, you will answer them. Your only reward will be death. But by the time I finish, it will be the most blessed reward any man on this earth could wish for. He pretended to count for a moment. You have ten fingers, ten toes, a nose, two ears, and a penis. Plenty of things to remove, and I promise you each will be more painful than the last. Drummond turned and nodded to Crowan, who walked over and grabbed the man's left hand. He levered up one finger and held it, its joint now in the jaws of the bolt cutters. Crowan looked to Drummond, waiting. Question one. Charles Drummond stepped in front of Kahan. Agent Kahan, please tell me if they believe they can read it. It was five in the afternoon, and they were dry, warm, and sitting together in the cafe inside the hotel. Matt noticed that Adira and Baruch looked on high alert, and he hated it. If the Mossad woman was nervous, then he sure should be. Adira had called for more agents as support, and also a team to find the missing men. But they wouldn't arrive until the next morning, and the dive needed to be undertaken that night. By the morning, events would have already overtaken them, or not. Matt closed his eyes and leaned back, luxuriating in a beam of sun that came through a tall window and bathed the rear of his neck. He tried to shut out anything remotely to do with the book so his mind could rest. At 11.45 that night, they needed to be descending on the sunken island of Pharos. The moon would be at its zenith at midnight, and they needed to be there, ready. If something was going to occur, they would be on top of it, waiting and watching. It's too dangerous. We should think about aborting, or at least waiting for backup, Andy said. No, we need the book. End of discussion, Tanya snapped back. I agree. We can't wait, Abrams said. It'll be another month until the next full moon. He snorted and shook his head. Nix that. It'll be another 1,300 years until the next planetary convergence. And frankly, given what Dr. Albadi told us, we don't have 1,300 hours. We need answers now. And if, as we believe, Adira's men have been taken, then whoever did take them is only one step behind us. If we abort, we might be handing the book over to them. His face was grim. As risky as it sounds, we have to search tonight, with or without backup. We've got to believe we're still in front. The silence stretched. All eyes were fixed on the tabletop as they retreated to their thoughts. At last, Adira spoke. Major Abrams is correct. We have no choice but to continue. She got to her feet. Time for rest. Eat in your rooms and be down the front at 9.30 p.m. Baruch and I will be waiting. Matt saw Tanya look across at him and raise her eyebrows. He shook his head but she just smiled wider and nodded subtly. Adira's voice was cutting. I suggest we all get some rest, focus on what we need to do tonight, rather than on our genitals. Matt blushed. Tanya looked away, and Andy's head jerked up, his brow furrowed in confusion. Within ten minutes, Matt was flopped on his bed, feeling drained. 
He punched the pillow behind his head, but knew he'd never actually sleep. The best he'd be able to do was close his eyes and try and relax his muscles, if not his mind. There came a knock on his door. It's me, Tanya's whispered voice. Go away, he hissed to the door. The knock came again. It's important. The words were breathy. He groaned and then let her in. The wind had fallen away and the sea was like a sheet of oil. Mahmoud flicked a cigarette into the water as Adira came into his small open cabin. She handed him over some notes, more than double what he was normally paid. They talked quietly for a second or two, and he laughed and nodded, and then turned out the single light, so they were all in darkness. Matt sat in silence, just like the others. They were all thinking through what had brought them there, the coming dive, the missing Israeli agents, and who it was who had taken them and was probably watching them all right now. The boat chugged directly out from the coast, and Mahmoud glanced over his shoulder from time to time, lining the stern up with landmarks on the shore. It was dark, and in the cabin they could only tell he had turned when the red dot of his cigarette was pointed directly at them. Outside on deck there was more light. The moon was already huge as it steadily rose overhead and created a silver path on the still water that was an endless black plain. Below water, Matt knew there was more activity. Movement, predator and prey, eyes already on them. In fifteen minutes, the boat slowed and then stopped. Just as before, Mahmoud let the craft coast for a moment or two and then pushed the anchor over the side. He let out ten more feet of rope, tied off, and then lit another cigarette. He watched the shoreline for a few seconds before nodding, satisfied with his position, and then spoke a few words to Adira as he sat down to watch the divers. Adira pointed. The island is about fifty feet to our north, but he said there is a current running tonight, so we must take that into consideration in our dive, as it can push us off course. He will leave the lantern alight on the bow. It will be our beacon, our only beacon, if we surface away from where we went in, just head for that. Do we trust him? Abrams asked quietly. I trust no one. Baruch will remain with him again. But it is not our captain I would be concerned about. If another boat comes, we might not know until we surface. Matt was looking over the side at the dark water. Did I hear someone mention sharks before? Yes, plenty, Adira said, readying her equipment. There are great white, bull shark, tiger, all very big and aggressive. But I hear you only need to punch them on the nose, yes? She looked at him deadpan for several seconds before breaking into a grin. I joke. Don't worry about them, Professor. They will not bother us. I'm not worried. I've faced worse, Matt thought. Adira looked up at the sky and then at her watch. In about fifteen minutes, the moon will begin to be at its absolute zenith. It will pass through that apex for only about twelve minutes, if there is an opening and we can find it and enter it, then we will have less than that to locate the book and get out. Or we spend the next thirteen hundred years waiting for the next celestial convergence, Matt finished. We can do this, Tanya said. Matt saw she seemed to be speaking to herself. He checked his own equipment this time they had headlamps, wrist lights, and extra handheld flashlights with a couple of large 35-watt spotlights that could be positioned on stands. One after the other, they dropped over the side, with Andy and Hartog the first to the bottom, aided by the crowbars they carried. Anyone looking down from above would have seen the white pipes of light moving under the water, 
and nothing of the black wetsuited divers behind them. Matt felt he was holding his breath on the way down. The walls of complete blackness surrounding him made him feel tiny and vulnerable. His scalp prickled, and he couldn't help feeling he was being watched from somewhere out in the dark. In a few minutes, they were at the island that grew up out of the sand. They broke into two teams, Matt, Andy, and Hartog, and then Abrams, Tanya, and Adira, once again as directed by Adira. Matt could tell she felt the need to keep an eye on Tanya. There was quite clearly a great degree of dislike growing between the women, and he doubted it had anything to do with him. Matt's team descended into the first crevice and slowly drifted along its ravine walls, slowing now and then to inspect odd shapes or protrusions. After a few minutes, they gave up and drifted to the island's surface. They swam to the other team's position, hovering over their split in the sea mount. Looking down, Matt could see the pathways of white light, but this time he could also see the divers as the glow of the full moon was now reaching down into the bottom of the crevice. After another few minutes, the divers joined up. Adira looked at her watch, and her frustration was clear. Matt nudged Adira and pointed up at the moon. It was like a giant floating spaceship above them, and was so bright that the divers cast shadows. Everything was a twilight silver, and small plankton, invisible before, now phosphoresced like a glowing snowstorm around them. Fish seemed oddly excited and darted in and out of the cracks in the rock, and even the lobster and huge crabs were drawn onto rock ledges to peer at the divers, like theater-goers leaning out of their boxes. Adira nodded in return. The moon was peaking, and they were about to enter the apex period. It would be like this for another ten minutes only. Matt noticed a few of the divers had stopped using their lights, and it gave him an idea. He tapped the rock wall to get everyone's attention, pointed to his light, and shut it off. After a few seconds, everyone understood, and one after the other, the lights went out. As Matt expected, the lights weren't needed, and were in fact hiding more than they were revealing. Back along the rift in the island, the slab of stone they had seen in the earlier dive now gave off a faint glow. He shot towards it, and saw that there was a huge symbol showing on its surface. He approached it. Andy at his side. The geologist went to dig his crowbar in beside it, but Matt waved him away. He ran a hand over the whorls and long strokes. There was no indentation. The symbol itself gave off luminosity like a projection. As Matt's hand finished his tracing of the symbol, the huge stone swung as if on a hinge. They could all hear and feel the vibrations running through the water. Ancient coral and other debris floated away, but just inside Matt could see huge cogs of a clockwork mechanism working. He'd seen something like it before, the Greek Antikythera mechanism. That was an ancient mechanical device, a computer, created over 2,000 years earlier and designed to predict astronomical positions and eclipses. No technological device coming even close to it in complexity would exist for another 1,400 years. Who else but the Greeks could construct a hiding place such as this and then use the world's first computer to seal it away, Matt thought. There was a flicker of shadow, as if something above momentarily eclipsed the moon's glow, but when they looked up, there was nothing. Matt turned and gave the group a thumbs up and went to enter, before Adira pulled him roughly back. She held a finger up in front of his face and then turned and swam in first. In exactly one minute she returned, pointed to Matt first, then Abrams and Tanya. She held her hand up flat to Andy and Hartog. Stay, it said. Andy began to protest, 
but Adira pointed to both him and Hartog, and then the huge door, and then made an opening motion with her hands and arms. Hartog nodded, then Andy. Keep the door open. Matt bet both men were wondering how the hell they'd accomplish that feat with a couple of crowbars if the many-ton door started to close. All flashlights came back on as Adira led them in, and then along a stone passage to a set of stairs climbing out of the water. There was little or no growth, testifying to just how tightly the door must have been sealed. Many ocean plants, sponges, and algae started out as microscopic spores, easily able to fit into the tiniest of cracks. That seal, coupled with the size of the machinery, meant it was no wonder other divers had been unable to detect anything other than a deeply embedded block of stone, Matt guessed. Ancient Greek writing was carved into the corridor walls, but when Matt became spellbound by a certain phrase or image, Adira yanked him forward. They had minutes, and already time was becoming a scarce commodity. Adira came to the steps first, and removing the fins from her feet, climbed them, lifting herself free from the water. Matt, Abrams, and Tanya followed. The Mossad agent carefully took the breathing apparatus from her mouth and sniffed. She winced and wrinkled her nose, but then nodded. Stale, very, but I think not toxic, she said, waving her light around. I hope so, Matt said, because those guys sure didn't die of old age. Piled like corded wood just past the edge of the steps were half a dozen skeletons, all in the robes and gold-fiber belts of Alexandrian scholars. Tanya kneeled beside them. Ptolemaic clothing. Must have been the curators. She turned one of the skulls. Healthy, at least before they died. Wonder whether they decided to stay, the caretakers for eternity. Job for life, Matt said grimly. Adira clicked her fingers twice. Or they were slow and became sealed in by the door mechanism. I have no desire to be one of the next skeletons, she spun. Professor, we need to find that book now. Everyone spread out. The flashlight beams lifted higher. Tanya gasped, her mouth hanging open as she slowly panned her large light. This is truly the Bibliotheca Alexandrina. She laughed softly, tears, not salt water, making her eyes wet and shining in the darkness. They found themselves on a walkway built into the side of the hollowed-out island. A huge central room was sunk into the floor, and now it became clear why the ocean had to be kept so thoroughly at bay. Inside was bone-dry and contained a treasure trove from the ages. Matt didn't know where to start. He could see magnificent statues, some of Greek gods intermixed with Egyptian and Roman. There were rulers, other great figures of the time, in marble, polished granite, and coated in gold. There were onyx sphinxes, milky alabaster Anubis sculptures, many startlingly different when compared to each other, and not possibly done by the same artist, or even in the same era. Tanya held her arms wide. The riches of all the known world. Not just the riches, also the knowledge, Matt said, walking slowly down the steps and then in among artifacts. There were shelves and shelves piled high with scrolls. He groaned. Just for a day down here, just one day. I wish Dr. Albadi could have seen this. He moved his light around the room. Golden caskets with depictions of rays of light causing armies to fall. Ornate oil lamps with warnings of jinn. A huge, aged, tarnished bronze urn, a dozen feet across, inscribed with the image of a hideous face screaming in fury and covered in coiling rope or serpents. There were statues of monstrous cyclops and so much more. Matt turned, 
feeling exhilarated and near overwhelmed. The caretakers. I don't think they were locked in. I think they stayed on purpose. They valued knowledge over life. Move it! Adira's screamed words reverberated around the large room, echoing the chastisement back at them over and over. Their hunt sped up. Caskets of golden objects were ignored, silver weapons, some studded with brilliant stones, or intricate machines, were all now knocked aside. Matt found a long table stacked with scrolls that fell to pieces in his hands, but from the dry scraps of Egyptian and Greek he read, he knew they were not what he sought. Tanya smoothed out a large sheet of some sort of hide that was beautifully decorated with a map. You're not going to believe what this is. It's a map of Aztlan. That's the ancient name for Atlantis. You're not going to believe where it is. Forget it, Matt snorted. Seen it. Here, Abrams called from the far end of the chamber. Matt sprinted, leaping over chests and skirting marble statues. The Major shone his light on a small, coffin-shaped box that was so dark and polished it looked like black glass. He had pushed the lid aside and now stood back. Matt came over and peered in. Inside there was another box, this one gold, and on its lid the same sort of strange glyphs he had seen in the sinkholes. He reached in and gently lifted the lid. Immediately he felt a wave of nauseating dizziness, as if some sort of radiation had been released from the confines of the receptacle. There was a single item, a book. It was about a foot in length, and just less than that in width. The cover was of some sort of soft-looking leather, heavily tooled, the image of an inhuman face set into a boiling mass of coiling tentacles in the center. The craftsman had used large, polished rubies for the eyes. This managed to imbue it with a lifelike quality that was both beautiful and unsettling. I think this is it, Matt said weakly. Grab it, bag it, and let's go. Adira's voice was urgent. Matt shut her out and reached in slowly, his hands shaking. Beside him, he heard Abrams shake out a plastic bag and hold it open. Matt's fingers flexed, but it felt as if he were holding a strong magnet and approaching another of an opposing pole. His fingers tingled as they hung over the odd leather. Just then, from the sunken steps, there came a dull clunk. Everyone froze, and Adira sucked in a breath before roaring over their heads, The door! She pushed past Matt, grabbed the book, and jammed it into Abrams's bag. The Major rolled it tight and then stuck it into yet another plastic bag. He unzipped his suit and pushed it inside. He was already starting to sprint for the steps. Let's go, let's go, let's go! They all ran now, flinging priceless relics out of the way. Abrams shouldering aside an ancient wooden crucifix, dark stains on each of its arms, and then all throwing themselves into the water. Vibrations filled the chamber, and they could feel the dull thunk of heavy metal and stonework gears grinding against each other right through their skin. Matt remembered the corridor was about twenty feet long, short but narrow, so they could not all travel side by side. Someone would be last. He tried hard to remember how long it had taken the thing to open. Five seconds? Ten? Twenty? Please be twenty, he prayed. Up ahead, Matt could see a light waving back and forth. Hartog or Andy signaling. So close. They came to the end, and the huge door began its slow swing. Matt turned and saw the massive stone cogs working over each other as the clockwork machine worked to draw the gigantic slab up tight against the crevice wall. Adira went through, and she dragged Abrams with her, keeping him close. Of course, thought Matt. He now has the prize. Matt shoved Tanya forward, and she swum torpedo-like through the rapidly narrowing gap. Hartog reached in and held the crowbar between the wall and door, waiting for it to impact with the inch-thick hardened steel. Matt kicked furiously, and as he swam through the gap, 
the slab reached the crowbar and crumpled it as though it were a soda can. Matt breathed hard, feeling dizzy from the exertion. Andy swam over and grabbed his arm, his eyes troubled behind his mask. Matt nodded in return, but the geologist pointed up, and he realized the concern wasn't for him. The moon was still a distorted glow high above the crevice, though it had passed its peak, and the first thing Matt noticed was all the sea life had disappeared. Then he found out why. Overhead, a huge shape glided past, then another. Hartog grabbed Adira and used his hands and eyes to try and convey the trouble. She simply nodded, and from her calf drew a long diver's blade. She held the knife up to them, pointing at each. Together, the divers drew forth their knives and followed Adira as she swam up and out from the island's shelter. At the very edge of their rocky fortress, she stopped and turned, holding up three fingers. She counted down, three, two, one, and then brought her fist down. She spun and started to propel herself fast toward the position of Mahmoud's boat. Matt felt his stomach flip inside. Though the moon still gave them a faint twilight, the ocean at night meant that the depths of their vision ended in shadows that moved behind curtains of darkness. Each of them swam like seals as they rocketed out of the fissure in the sunken island, along the bottom, and headed for the safety of their boat. They moved fast, huge diving fins paddling strongly. But where they were like seals, the things coming out of the darkness were living torpedoes. Matt was thankful for the glow of the moon, as he could at least see the sharks circling, some small and under six feet, moving erratically and agitated, working themselves into the mindless mass that would become a feeding frenzy. But further out, at the very extent of his vision, he could make out larger shapes, huge, as thick around as a draft horse and longer than their boat, the ocean's apex predators, the Great White. A shark peeled off and lunged in toward them, seeming to pick out Abrams as its target. Hartog slashed at it, his blade pummeling the tough hide, but not opening or even denting its rough skin. It turned away, but another immediately took its place. Again and again they came at Abrams, and Matt knew why. It was the book. These primordial creatures, 450 million years in the making, were either seeking to attack the book itself or were perhaps trying to defend it from the mammalian apes that sought to steal it. There came a thud, a grunt, and an explosion of bubbles. Matt saw Andy tumbling in the water as a seven-foot bull shark flicked away. Adira was first to the anchor rope and looked up. The ascent was where they would be most vulnerable, especially in the moment they would need to look away and lift themselves from the water. The image of kicking, dangling legs among all the man-eaters made Matt feel sick from fear. Adira pointed up and then held up five fingers. She swam away a dozen feet and then used her knife to open a slit in one of her palms. Black blood immediately clouded the water around her. Matt knew what she was doing, drawing the beasts to her. With blood in the water, they could expect the furious eating machines to be driven into a frenzy of attack. Adira turned and furiously pointed to the surface. Abrams pulled on Tanya's arm, and the two of them started guiding the groggy Andy up the anchor rope to Mahmoud's boat. Hartog ignored Adira and swam towards her. The Mossad agent looked to Matt as she hovered in the water. She seemed to offer him a slight bow. Hartog saluted, and Matt bet that behind his breathing equipment, the big man was grinning. These people have no fear in them, he thought. He began his own swim upward, but couldn't leave the soldiers to their fates. He paused, hanging by the rope, looking down. As he watched, a monstrous shape loomed out of the darkness, the silver moon just lighting its gray-blue upper hide 
and the deathly white underneath. Its muscular barrel shape was easily twenty feet long. Matt marveled at the way the great white could sail through the water with only the smallest of flicks of its huge tail. Its mouth hung open, a dark, pitiless cave made more horrifying by the row after row of finger-length teeth. Triangle daggers designed for ripping, shredding, and sawing through meat and bone. It circled once more, and Hartog and Adira got back to back. A small knot of human flesh with just two blades, silver teeth, for defense. The shark turned and came at them, accelerating with a single flick of its six-foot, scythe-like tail. Hartog slowly lifted his arms out and leaned toward the huge creature. The diving knife seemed a futile weapon against the approaching monster. Matt felt a tingle run up his spine as animal fear made every inch of his body seem like it had electricity running through it. He could feel his heart beating in his throat, and he wondered whether Hartog felt the same, or if instead there was nothing but ice in his veins as he faced the giant man-eater. The massive creature barreled in, and at just a few feet from them, turned a degree and rolled to look at the pair with one black, soulless eye. Hartog struck out with his knife, using all his great strength to bury the blade into the hide. The shark veered away, wrenching the seal's arm and pulling the knife from his hand. There was no blood from the great beast, and Matt knew that even though the tough hide was breached, the skin and muscles on its back were inches-thick leathery armor. Hartog hung there, fists balled, but now without a weapon. The shark turned, and both the Special Forces agents swiveled in the water, Adira nudging the seal around behind her. It was her turn. Adira never twitched, but simply floated, arms extended, silver blade clamped in one hand. The other sharks stayed back, seeming to give this ruler of the deep its killing space. Hartog, Adira, and the giant shark were in the center of a twirling tornado of gray hide, black soulless eyes, and serrated teeth. The team had ascended to the boat, and Matt could hear above him the sound of bodies, tanks, and belts being pulled over the gunwale as he hung mid-water to watch. He wanted to do something, anything, to help. He knew there was nothing he could offer, but was condemned to at least watch the pair's stupidity or bravery. Whichever it was, they knew they had done their job, distracted the sharks to give the team time to escape. The great white flicked its tail once more, turning and accelerating. It came at her like a miniature submarine, and when it was within a dozen feet, she pushed away from Hartog and pulled herself into a bowl. The giant mouth opened, easily wide enough to consume her entire frame. But suddenly she unfurled and pivoted, and then one hand shot out and caught the top of the snout, and she pushed down so it changed course and started to pass her. Her other arm flashed around and the thin blade dug into its softer belly. She held onto the knife handle with both hands, as the forward momentum of the beast allowed the eight inches of toughened steel to traverse the belly, unzipping the softer part of its hide and spilling guts and blood into the water. Adira and Hartog immediately burst into action and frantically made for the surface as the huge, injured beast turned again. But her attack had worked. The blood and trailing organs were enough to attract all its primitive cousins. They shot towards the hemorrhaging beast and a true frenzy began. Matt had started for the boat as soon as Adira's knife made contact with the shark's belly, and when he had just one hand on the rope net ladder over the side, he flung himself up and onto the gunwale, surprising himself at just how fast one could move when they needed to. Fear gives wings, he remembered. Abrams grabbed him and pulled him onto the deck as if he were a stranded dolphin. He lay there momentarily, stunned and gasping, and feeling his fatigued muscles still buzzing with adrenaline. Hartog came next, 
but immediately turned and reached back to grab at Hadira and lift her over the side. She went down on her knees, breathing hard. She pulled off her goggles. I lost my knife. She grinned up at the seal. Hartog threw his head back and roared his laughter. He looked down at her, still out of breath himself. I'd kiss you, but you might do the same to me as you did to that shark. Matt reached out to her. We'll buy you a new one. He squeezed her arm. Thank you. She nodded, and he sat up beside her. Hey, I thought you said they wouldn't bother us. Her grin widened. And they didn't really, did they? She looked at Andy, whose arm bled, and she shrugged. A scratch. She turned to the captain. Mahmoud? She pointed a thumb to the shore. The old man saluted and flicked his cigarette into the water. Hartog helped Adira to her feet. Not bad at all, Captain Sanesh. Adira nodded. It's what we do, right? You can repay the favor by pulling in the anchor. I think it's time to go home. I heard that, the big man said, turning to the thick rope. Abrams came toward her, smiling and holding the still-wrapped book. Adira snatched it from him and unwrapped it, momentarily examining the cover. She snorted and then handed it to Matt. It better be worth it. Drummond and Crowan sat in the Mossad agent's car and watched as the boat powered back to shore. Crone held a pair of powerful field glasses to his eyes. They have it. Good. Drummond unfolded his arms to look at his watch. Make preparations to leave. I want to be home by tomorrow, with the book. He refolded his arms, smiling dreamily and almost hugging himself. The father will be so pleased. Adira squinted frowning as they approached the shore. She turned to Baruk and nodded toward the distant shape of the faded Mercedes as it pulled away from the sidewalk and then disappeared around a corner. They're back, he said to her in Hebrew, keeping his eyes on the disappearing taillights. Very unlikely, her eyes narrowed. We need to be most on guard. Always, the big man responded. What was it? Matt asked in Hebrew, joining her. Adira pulled in a cheek in annoyance. Remind me not to bring any more language specialists on my missions. Probably nothing, just looked a little like our missing agent's car. Your face tells me you didn't think it was nothing, Matt said. She smiled sadly. In my business, you learn quickly to discount coincidences. Great, Matt said in English, and then sighed. We should leave immediately. Yes, but our problem is we cannot afford to break cover and put ourselves at risk of being exposed to the Egyptian authorities. They only need to slow us down and they've won. She turned to look him in the eyes. We stick to the plan. I suggest you start work on understanding that book immediately, Every second may count. She leaned in close to him. You must keep me involved. This is vitally important to me. Matt stared back for a few seconds, wondering if the woman was under any sort of pressure. Probably, he thought. She had risked a lot for them. No, everything for them. Don't worry. I promise to share the results with you. She nodded. It needs to be guarded. For now, where the book goes, Baruch goes. Her implacable eyes moved from Matt to her compatriot. They gave no hint of compromise. Matt shrugged. Sure, sure, no problem. The boat scrunched up onto the sand, and Adira stepped over the side, holding her swim fins. She checked her watch. It's 2 a.m., she paused. The first flight to the United States is not until the afternoon. We must all stay safe until then. 
She turned and headed for the car. Baroque leaped over the side, landing softly. He held the boat steady as the others came over the side, and then he smiled at Matt. Just pretend I'm not here. He followed them to the car. Matt sat at the desk in his room, bent over the ancient book. The copy that Albadi had shown him was impressive, but contained only a fraction of the words and verse that the original did. He had no doubt that the hide covering the book was human, as there were open pores, hair follicles, and what looked like a mole still evident on its surface. It didn't bother him, as he knew that it was not unusual for ancient tomes to be bound in human skin. Anthropodermic bibliopagy dated way back to ancient snake-worshipping Scythians. Inside the book, the work was a mix of Syriac, Arabic, Greek, and a melange of other ancient languages. But there was also another, the one that Dr. Albadi had referred to as the celestial speech. It was supposed to be the language of the angels or gods, Enochian. But in the book, Abdul al Hazred called it the tongue of the underworld. Nice, Matt had said softly to himself, causing Baruch to momentarily look up from a magazine he was reading. Matt dived back into the pages of weird script, whorls, strokes, and curved lettering so elegant and beautiful it ranked with that of the finest Japanese calligraphers. It resisted all his efforts to be understood. He knew its secrets were there, but just at the edge of his consciousness, dropping hints but then dancing away, like a shadow glimpsed from the corner of the eye, gone when you turn to look. It was unlike any language ever constructed by a human mind or hand, of that he was sure. For some reason, Matt had the impression it was strings of blasphemic spells and incantations, secrets whispered by some race or species that might have touched humankind long before, but it remained impenetrable to him. In the end, maddeningly, Matt had to skip over the strange passages and instead work at translating the chapters that had been omitted from Albadi's copy of the Al-Azif. Even then the ancient prose was revealed to him as impressions, and it spoke to him directly into his mind, and more. When he closed his eyes to rest them from the rush of fantastic information, he saw everything, every page, every word he had read. It was as if the thing were imprinting itself on his mind once his eyes had captured their images. Several times it became too much, and he had to rub his eyes hard in a vain attempt to banish images that tore at his sanity. Periodically he felt light-headed, as if he were on a roller coaster rising and falling, and becoming dizzy from vertigo. Baruch had come over once and laid a hand on his shoulder, checking on him. He had brought water, and Matt had thanked him, having sometimes forgotten he was even there. Though the rooms were small, the proximity of his personal bodyguard hadn't bothered him at all. Baruch, true to his word, had remained silent and near invisible. But then, Matt thought, the passages had been absorbing. Unless he was grasped, he would have missed a fire alarm. The hours sped by as he sat hunched over. His back and neck screamed, but he was transfixed. He had never seen anything like this material before and the current events of the earth drops, disappearances, and monstrous emergences had made the fantastic things described all the more horrifying. Matt learned of the things that came before, the elder beings, the great old ones, a race of creatures or entities that once ruled the earth and who now slumbered deep below the crest of the planet or deep in the dark, fathomless seas. There were... Zastur, Azathoth, Gata Nathor, Shub Nigurath, Yog Sothoth, Nyar Lathotep, and the vilest of all, the great Cthulhu, hidden behind colossal red gates of a lost city. He read how they were worshipped by humans and non humans alike, 
mentioning the crawlers in the filth and the great eaters of flesh, which Matt took to mean the roaches and sharks. He then read of the Shogoths, the hapless monstrosities that were like the fleas on the hide of the great old one. They were its servants, its workers, and slaves. And finally, he learned more of the giant form of Cthulhu itself, the slumberer beneath them all, beneath us all. Alhazrad had tried to describe the being, calling it some sort of immense, near-immortal thing that was like an octopus, a dragon, and a deformed parody of the human form. There was a pulpy, tentacled head whose face was a mass of feelers atop a grotesque, scaly body. In other passages, he talked of a giant, many-limbed worm of vast intelligence, not dead, not alive, but aware of us tiny things on the planet's surface. It waited, to wake every few millennia, testing and checking, to see if the bounty of Earth had replenished enough for it to pour forth from the pit, like some sort of rupturing infection, and consume us all. How could it hide or remain undetected, Matt wondered. Perhaps it was too deep for us to see with our primitive instruments, or so large we thought it nothing but some sort of massive underground ocean. A touch on his shoulder. Jesus! Matt jumped. Baruch smiled. Sorry, Professor, but it's time to get ready. Matt smiled weakly at the Israeli. I was lost, a million miles underground. Al-Hazrad has been there. He described it in a poem. He slumped for a moment before looking up again, feeling slightly befuddled. His eyes wouldn't refocus on the man, as if they longed to be back on the page. What did you say? Baruch handed him another glass of water. I said we need to get ready. Final briefing before we depart. He snorted softly. You haven't moved for hours. Hours? Matt checked his watch, a little alarmed at the time. He nodded. I'm nearly done. He turned back to the last few pages. It was there, and it wasn't. The information sat in his mind unprocessed. The languages, the warnings, and the poems, all would have meanings that needed to be dissected and analyzed. I need more time. There's some I still can't understand. He read on, hurrying now, searching for and then finding what he was looking for, where the great old one would come next and how. A jagged pain ripped through his skull, and Matt sat back, pressing his temples. The pain passed, but there was a residue of screams and howls in his head that was like a tornado loosed from hell. There were voices, not just human, but of things that existed so long ago they were now little more than bones pinned together in museums. They were all trapped, in both the pages of the book and within the monstrous consumer of all things, Cthulhu and with its image came its plans. There's a poem here. Matt now knew where. The gate had deep. His gate. Matt pointed to the page. It's why the original caves were useless to us. It moves. His portal of return will be where the convergence is closest to the earth right now. Matt turned to Baruch. What part of the earth will be facing the celestial convergence when it is at its absolute peak? He closed his eyes. Because that is where Cthulhu will rise again. Adira gathered everyone for a final briefing in Abrams' room. In a small kitchen off to the side, an electric stovetop glowed red underneath a coffee pot. The Major was probably running on little more than adrenaline and caffeine by now. Matt accepted a cup and spent ten minutes telling the group what he had found, but finally stopped and held the book open at a block of magnificent script. He tapped the page. Here. Alhazred called it the path to the gated deep. It's a poem of sorts. 
He looked down at the text and licked dry lips. He cleared his throat and read. They slumber, a race far older than man's first word, in a city more ancient than Lemuria's first brick, the sleepers in the dirt, the burrowers below us all. Matt felt the increasingly familiar pain behind his eyes. He ignored it and continued reading. We who climb down into the depths find not just caverns of wet and slime, but carved faces beautiful in their hideousness, carrying not one visage of mortal man. Matt swallowed, feeling a ball of nausea roll in his gut. He blinked away tears and continued. Pathways spiral ever downwards to hopelessness and eternal blackness. There find mighty columns, towering edifices, and streets too wide for a sapien's feet. A primal city long past anything the tiny human mind could comprehend. He groaned and screwed his eyes shut, and then placed a thumb and finger into them, rubbing hard. Headache. Tanya grabbed his arm. Go slowly, you're doing great. Matt shook his head and blinked rapidly. It's strange. Feels like a bad vodka hangover. He winced again and continued. Gates of red granite so huge they could hold back an army now swung wide. Past them the old ones eternally slumber, dreaming and still reaching out to us and the earth shall fall before they rise. So this thing has a base, Adira's voice had a satisfied edge. A city? Underground? Abrams pulled at his chin. As I said before, it could be just allegorical. I'm not sure I really understand it. It could mean something else entirely, Matt added, still feeling lightheaded. I think you've read enough now. Tanya said, squeezing his arm. For today. He agreed. The descriptive passages of the book threw back monstrous images and a sense of hopelessness, not to mention the physical pain which still lingered. Tanya surprised him by not pushing him on the strange language. He guessed her concern for him overrode her archaeological background and her desire to understand more of the historical oddities of the Alazif. Matt stumbled and briefly held onto a chair back. Tanya grabbed at him. You're freezing and pale as a sheet. Matt nodded. Just a little dizzy. He leaned forward. The celestial convergence of our solar system... How can we find out what part of the Earth will be closest at its absolute peak? Tanya went back to her small computer tablet and typed furiously for a few seconds. She snorted softly and sat back. Back home. It's back home. She looked up. Sort of. It'll be over the USA. Kentucky, to be exact. Andy nodded and sat forward. That's interesting, and maybe only a coincidence, but you know what else is in Kentucky? Mammoth Cave, the largest cave system in the world. It's about 400 miles of caves, caverns, and slide holes, some of it still unexplored. How deep? Abrams asked. Deep, but not too deep, Andy said. From what I remember, its deepest point is about 400 feet. He clicked his fingers. But there's a pretty good-sized sinkhole in it. He looked up, brows raised. The sinkhole itself has been dated to about 1,300 years ago. Looks like it's about to drop again. We need to be there with the entire army if that's what it takes. Abrams got to his feet. Are we done here? No. Adira, who had been leaning back against the wall, watching everyone, strode to the center of the room. She stood before Matt. How did Abdul Alhazred put this thing back to sleep? Matt shook his head wearily. 
I don't know. Think! Adira's voice was like a slap. Lighten up! Tanya got to her feet, and the look that passed between the two women bordered on the volcanic. Matt held up his hand, waving them down. It's just that there are some language elements that defy description. I think some of it is Enochian, but it's not based on any linguistic construct I or anyone has ever known. They're symbols, but I know they have meaning. He shrugged. I mean, I might know and just not realize it. Or maybe I just need to look at it from a different perspective, one I don't fully understand yet. He had the alazif on his lap, his hand on its soft surface. I need more time. Abram stared for a few seconds, his jaws working. We have the flight home, fourteen hours, and then, different perspective or not, the celestial convergence will be at its peak and over the USA. Whatever is going to happen will begin there. We will have something we can use to stop the thing rising, or... He shook his head, face grim. Or we prepare for war. Adira paced for a moment and then turned. We meet downstairs in twenty minutes. One more thing. Abrams nodded to Hartog and stood straighter. Captain Sanesh, we want to thank you personally and on behalf of the United States for all your assistance. But if you can get us safely to the airport, then your job is well and truly done. Tanya smiled and folded her arms. Hartog looked pained, clearly bothered with the new orders. Adira's face was untroubled, and she just tilted her head. Matt didn't think for a moment that Adira thought her job was done. Matt felt sickly and weak, the effects of the book still pulling at him. Baruch was hurriedly packing for him, or rather tossing his stuff into a bag and pushing it down hard. It didn't matter. He didn't have much. Most had been lost when the SUV was blown up in the Syrian desert, and what remained was part of his cover story. Matt sat forward. What now for you? Baruch turned and looked as if he was going to ignore the question for a moment, but then stopped what he was doing. All agents are being recalled for defense of the state. Matt raised his eyebrows. What, the earth drops? Baruch shook his head. No, what is coming out of them? He smiled sadly. It seems we are also at war, Professor Kearns. I'm sorry, Matt said. Baruch shrugged. Home defense, we are used to it. Matt sighed and sat back. Home defense against the end of the world. Baruch zipped up his bag. Done. He grinned and held out his hand. Where's my tip? The Mossad agent's smile froze on his face, and he stood extremely still as if listening. The door burst open. Adira spoke softly and urgently to her uncle, General Meir Shavit. As always, she imagined the old man in his favorite chair, chain-smoking his cigarettes, one eye half-closed from the curling smoke. I cannot just take it from them, she said, beginning to pace. The old soldier's wheezing formed into his usual slow words. You could, Adi, if you wanted to. But I agree this might become messy, that is, if the soldiers foolishly decide to put up a fight. A cough and what sounded like a long pull on a cigarette. Adira stopped at the window and opened the curtains a crack. I believe Professor Kearns is the only one who can decipher it. Even if I secure it, it might end up being useless to us and then too late for anyone else. There was a low chuckle. You give the Americans too much credit, and us too little. There was more wheezing. 
So then, Adi, I think if this Al-Azif book won't come with you, then you must go with the book, hmm? I already have a seat for you on their flight. He laughed slushily and then coughed. Just tell them you are there for their own protection. As we have heard, there will be an attempt on the book and their lives. He shifted in his seat. After all, we don't yet know who tortured Dr. Albadi or removed our agents, so this is probably true. I agree, uncle. She shivered slightly at the thought of being allowed by the agency back into America. Adi, the new agents I have sent will conduct an investigation into the disappearances, but by now it is likely to be more a body recovery than a rescue. She listened as the general breathed laboriously in and out for a second or two. This is the business we are in. He sighed, and his voice grew distant. Contact me when you know more. Good luck, Addy. The line went dead. Adira held the phone for a second or two in her hand, her mind working. From down the hall, there came a crash of splintering wood. Matt felt his breath catch in his throat as the largest man he had ever seen came through the door. For such a physical giant, he moved quickly, his dark eyes missing nothing as he took in Matt, the book, and then Baruch. The Israeli agent also moved fast. The Glock pistol was in his hand in a second, and two shots were discharged. The giant ducked the first, but took the next in the chest. It didn't stop him. In fact, he didn't seem to feel it, even though there was a smoking hole in his shirt. He crossed to Baruch in two steps, chopped at the gun hand, and struck him under the chin with such force that the agent flew backwards into the wall. Baruch was highly trained and sprang back, shrugging off the hammer-like blow and diving for the big man's midsection. The giant clasped his hands together and brought them down like a pile driver between the Israeli agent's shoulder blades. Matt could feel the impact of the blow right through the soles of his feet, and it jolted him into action. He leaped up, dragged his chair with him, and broke it over Baruch's opponent's head and shoulders. That was his plan at any rate. It didn't break like in the movies. It just bounced off, as if he'd simply struck the wall. The giant ignored Matt, reached down to Baruch still hanging on at his waist, and grabbed his head. In one swift movement, he spanned the skull so quickly and violently that the Mossad agent's head was now facing the roof. Matt nearly gagged. Baruch had a startled look on his face, as if he suddenly realized he was dead. The giant held onto the body and turned to the door. Sir! Another man stepped in, flanked by two brutal-looking Egyptians carrying long blades. This one was wearing a tailored suit, his silver hair brushed back in an expensive haircut, and movie star teeth on display in a wide, satisfied smile. You must be Professor Matthew Kearns. It's truly a pleasure. And I am Charles Sheldon Drummond, a fan of sorts. He gave Matt a small bow, and then turned to look up at the giant next to him. Cron, let's get ready to receive our visitors. Drummond turned back to Matt. Oh, Professor, did you hear what happened to poor Dr. Albadi? Matt nodded, wondering what the man was playing at. Yes, your Syrian informant wasn't as cooperative with me and needed to be punished. In fact, punished to pieces. So you sit quietly over there and don't make a sound. Drummond's face hardened, and Matt saw something behind the eyes that told him that this suave little man would like nothing more than the chance to punish him. Matt sat still. I can wait, he thought. Opportunities always present themselves. Crowan picked up Baruch's gun and then came and stood in front of Drummond, 
his huge body effectively shielding the doorway. He pointed to the two Egyptians and ordered them on either side of the door. The trap was set. Drummond then looked out at Matt and smiled broadly. Professor, move to the other side of the room and don't say a word. Remember, I don't want to hurt you, so please don't make me. Crohn then took the limp body of Baruch and twisted the head so it was back in the right position. The sickening crunch and crackle of vertebrae made Matt wince. When the huge man had finished, he held the Israeli's body up in front of himself, one hand on the collar and the other holding the head straight. Matt went and stood against the wall. Hartog came through first and looked briefly at Baruch and then at Matt. He sensed the danger a second too late, and before he could spin, Crohn had hammered the side of his head with the gun butt. The seal dropped to the ground. Abrams came next, followed by Andy and Tanya together. Crohn and the Egyptians grabbed one each and flung them to the center of the room. Crohn threw Baruch's body aside like a sack of rubbish and rolled his shoulders, slabs of muscle on top of a deep chest and huge arms ending in sledgehammer fists. The man was a born killer of men. Drummond stepped out slightly, a small pistol now in his hand. Weapons on the floor and up against the wall. He leaned forward, looking out into the hallway. Oh, please, come in, Captain Sanesh. No need to be bashful. He waited two seconds. I'll shoot one of them. He smiled his megawatt smile and pointed his gun at Andy's face. Adira came in, arms straight down and slightly out at her sides. Her eyes flicked to Baruch's body. Matt had never seen a look of such pure hatred on her face before. This had just gotten personal. She stood in the doorway, her eyes flicking from Matt and the team to Crowan, sizing him up, and then to Drummond, before looking down again at her fallen comrade. She looked back to Drummond, her face impassive, but her eyes burning with a molten fury. Now, now, he grinned at her. I know what you're thinking. Can you take out Crowan and my two men and then get to me before I can fire? He shook his head. The answer is no. I'm a crack shot and I will hit you at this range. Crowan will also snap the American woman's neck as punishment. All your exertions will achieve is two more bodies, one of them being your own. Drummond turned to Matt. Time to finish up. Professor, the Necronomicon, if you please. Don't give it to him, Adira said. Matt froze. Drummond turned and fired at Adira. The bullet whizzed past her face, grazing her cheek and leaving a line of red. She didn't flinch. That will be all, Captain, or the next will be between your very angry eyes. He turned back to Matt. The book, now. Matt looked to Adira, and then to Abrams, trying to elicit some sort of word, plan, or even the indication of a plan. There was nothing from them. He felt helpless. Hartog was still unconscious, and Abrams, Tanya, and Andy were bailed up against the wall, with Adira just inside, but up on her toes, her arms still straight down at her sides, fingers beginning to flex. Drummond's lips compressed in annoyance, and the muzzle of his gun started to travel towards Matt's thigh. Now. Matt held it tight in both hands. You won't be able to understand it. It will be useless to you, he said quickly. Really? Then you won't mind giving it up. He pointed the gun muzzle at Matt's groin. This is going to hurt me a lot more than you. He flashed his smile. I'm kidding, of course. This is only going to hurt you. He leveled the gun. 
The throwing blade entered the back of Drummond's hand, but didn't pass right through the meat as it hit the metal of the gun. He howled in shock and dropped the weapon. Crone spun, but before he could fire, Adira's leg lashed out, kicking the gun up to discharge harmlessly into the roof. She dived for the book, her hand flashing out to it, and her palm slapping down on its cover, just as Crohn brought one of his pile-driver hands down on her back between her shoulder blades. The two Egyptians went to launch themselves at Adira, but were immediately set upon by Abrams and Andy. Matt joined in, leaping onto the back of one man and pummeling his head. Tanya pressed herself against the wall, apparently unsure of which of their attackers to target. The Major quickly knocked his opponent down and then kicked him unconscious. He turned to help Matt and Andy, who struggled. Andy took a kick in the chest and flew back to hit the wall hard and sit slumped and unmoving. Matt then took a backhanded blow to the chin and was knocked against the table, where he sat dazed for a moment. Abrams then traded blows with the last Egyptian, standing toe to toe. Drummond grimaced and wrapped a rapidly reddening handkerchief around his palm. He spat his words, Quickly, Crowan, kill her! As if it were a dream, Matt watched the mad dance that Adira and Crowan performed in the light of the doorway. The big man outweighed the Metsada agent by 150 pounds at least, and in his hands he had produced two ancient-looking curved blades that looked like a combination of Macedonian copis blade and boning knife. Matt was once again amazed at how the big man moved, fast, fluid, and professionally, the knives apparently part of his body. He knew his art. But so did Adira. Her black spike knives had materialized in her hands, and she parried, blocked, and ducked as Crowan's trunk-like arms swung and thrust. The giant jabbed with one arm while spinning and thrusting with the other. He was blindingly fast and caught Adira on the bicep, opening a line of red. But even before the big man could recover from his extended arm thrust, Adira had slid down and jammed one of her eight-inch spikes deep into his inner thigh. She ripped it free, and her target, the large femoral artery, spurted like a tap. Crowan fought on, but already the carpet beneath him was becoming sodden. He lunged again, becoming more furious, possibly knowing that his biggest advantage, his great strength, was leaking away. He was an imposing figure, huge and maddened, but though he would have had no trouble disposing of any other adversary, the person he fought that day had been trained in a dozen different fighting techniques, many of them designed to combat and kill bigger foes. Crohn's hand, gripping one curved blade, came down fast. Adira blocked it and then swung high and around to jam her remaining spike into the back of his neck. His eyes widened and his mouth hung open in shock, revealing to Matt the tip of Adira's blade in the back of his throat, like some sort of sharp metal tongue. The spike had severed his spinal cord, and Adira leaned in as if to caress him, with her lips just brushing his ear. For Baruch. She pushed the huge lump of dead flesh from her and watched it fall heavily to the red carpet. Sirens sounded from out in the street, and then jarringly loud in the small room was the sound of gunfire. Adira went down hard. Abrams leaped to his feet just ahead of Andy. The two Egyptians were unconscious, and Matt pushed one off and crawled over to the fallen Adira. Turning her over, he saw the blood on her body. It still pumped. He pressed his hands on the wound and looked up at the shooter. Tanya. Drummond was edging to the door, and Abrams, who hadn't seen what Matt had, roared to Tanya, Captain Kovitz, take that man down! Tanya turned and fired at Abrams. The bullet went past him and he froze, his face screwed in confusion. Drummond walked to her and took the gun. Thank you, darling. Pretend time is over now. Tanya walked calmly to the table and took the book. She turned to Matt and smiled. You talk better than you fuck. 
Matt knew he looked like a stunned fish, but he just couldn't get his mouth to close. The siren stopped just outside, and they could hear the sound of car doors opening. I bid you all a good evening. Drummond panned the gun around the room. You haven't got the book, but you do have your lives. He gave them his Hollywood smile. At least until the great old one rises. Tanya motioned toward Matt. He's read it. Drummond shrugged. The father said the ape wouldn't understand it even if he did read it. It's of no matter now. Without it, they can do nothing but wait and become more... cattle. He looked out the window and then at his watch. The police are here, and I'm betting you all have a lot of explaining to do, especially with those bodies and fake passports. He looked down at Crohn's body. Crohn, you're fired. He looked up and grinned. One needs to retain one's sense of humor, right? He gave them a small bow and went out through the door. Tanya turned and blew Matt a kiss, and then followed him. Matt cradled Adira's head. Her eyes opened, and she sprang immediately to her feet. He tried to reach for her. You're hurt. She looked down, pulled her shirt open. Ah, it's nothing. She looked around quickly, and then went to leave the room. Abrams caught her. Forget it, they're gone. We need to tend to your wound. He looked to the door. And the police will be here in about thirty seconds. She punched her thigh. Shitza! She pressed the wound in her shoulder. Stick to the cover story. It's solid. She pulled out her phone and walked away a few paces, speaking rapidly in Hebrew. She listened, grunting now and then, and keeping her eyes on the street outside. She disconnected and turned. We were attacked, robbed. She pointed to the two unconscious Egyptians and Crone's body. There were five of them. We overpowered three, but the rest shot at us and escaped. She growled and lashed out with her foot, kicking Crone's body and cursing again. I wish you were alive so I can kill you all over again. She rounded on Abrams. Your security is worthless. How did this Kovitz woman infiltrate your ranks? Abrams's mouth worked for a moment, surprised by the attack. He shook his head. Captain Kovitz was assigned to me just months ago. She was competent, friendly, just normal. Hartog shrugged. I didn't notice anything unusual about her. There was blood covering half his face. She must have been deep cover, no amateur. Adira bared her teeth. Ach, a sleeper. This has been years in the planning. Remember what Albadi told us, Matt asked. There are cults that still worship Cthulhu. I bet they had infiltrators in every country, every government body, just waiting to see who got the first lead. What do we do now? Andy asked. We've lost the book. Silence stretched, and Matt rubbed his eyes, the images flashing like a reel of photographs. We don't need it. He leaned his head back, feeling the dull throb behind his eyes. I can still see it. Every page, every word, every curl, dot, and stroke. Can you recreate it? Adira asked, walking closer to stand over him. Matt opened his eyes, focusing on her. I think so, yes. She smiled down at Matt. Good. Then we must get you home. You are now the prize. Adira looked at Abrams, her eyes level. Until the professor is safe, he is still under my guardianship. Abrams seemed to think for a moment and looked briefly at Hartog, who nodded. He turned back to her. Okay, until then. Now what? Andy asked, rubbing his own head and wincing. Home? Adira crouched down to Matt, looking into his eyes. 
Yes, and we find this father. He seems to be their leader. We also need to find out exactly what is going to happen in Kentucky, yes? She placed a hand on his shoulder, leaving a print of her own blood. She looked at her hand and then felt the wound on her shoulder again. Ach! She stood and went to the electric stovetop. She removed the coffee pot, took a large spoon from a drawer, and rested it on the red coils. She turned back to Matt. What do you need? Matt thought for a moment. Paper, lots of it. It needs to be written in Syriac, Arabic, and Greek. Ink, pens, and then peace and quiet. Heavy footsteps sounded just outside. She turned. Remember the cover story. It will work. As we're foreigners, they'll want to sweep this under the rug. We can be out of here in a few hours and still make our flight. She turned back to the now red glowing spoon. She snatched it up and then held the flat end against her wound. Smoke curled and it sizzled as the flesh sealed over. She never flinched. Chapter 16 Mammoth Cave National Park, Kentucky Big Ben Jorgensen inhaled deeply through his nose. Instead of the sharp smell of cold, dry stone, there was an odd, burning odor. Not the hint of a clean fire. Instead, it reminded him of the time they were at Hank's cookout, and for a laugh, Hank threw a handful of deer gut on the flames. It stunk to high heaven. He wiped his wet brow. And what was with the heat? It was always cool down in the caves, but today he could feel the perspiration running down his back and sides. It had to be damned eighty degrees. He sighed and checked his watch again, wishing he were out in the fresh air. The heat didn't worry so much as confuse him. Mammoth Cave was formed by hydrological means, not volcanic. Water seeping through holes in the sandstone layer above the limestone had eroded away the caves over millions of years. There was no geothermic activity, or at least there shouldn't be. Ben took his position up on a rocky ledge, looking down on the shiny, sweat-soaked faces of his guests on today's tour. The group was only half what it should be. People were just staying home. He wasn't surprised with the sinkholes closing roads, and he'd heard a few sad sacks had even fallen into them. The government had been telling people it'd be best to stay indoors at night. Guess a giant hole is harder to see in the dark, he thought. He sucked in a deep breath, trying to ramp up his enthusiasm. He had done this many times, and it was as informative as it was theatrical. He'd turn on and off lights, showing different formations, in the huge bowl-shaped cavern, and then take them over to the bottomless pit. It was only about 135 feet deeper than where they were, but the lighting made it look like it fell away forever. To finish up, it'd be off to the cave pool and point out a few of the blind crawlers in the glass-like water. Then he'd round them up, herd them out, and get ready for the next bunch, if there were any. He checked his watch. Not long now, he thought with relief. He usually loved being down in the caves, the peace and quiet, the coolness and sense of strength and permanence. But today, strangely, he wanted to be out in the air or fishing or home with his wife. Today he just wanted to be anywhere but down in the mammoth caves. Ladies and gentlemen, he waited. Heads swung towards him, and murmurs fell away. There was silence except for the wheezing of a kid with a red face who looked like he enjoyed his dessert just a bit too much. Ladies and gentlemen, this is one of the lowest points in the Mammoth Caves. Just to your right, you can see the railing that guards the bottomless pit, the gateway to hell, as it has been called, and a very sacred place for the previous locals dating back many thousands of years. No questions, please, no questions, he secretly prayed. It's not really bottomless, is it? 
one big, surly, and hot-looking guy asked. No, but it is a deep sinkhole dropping away further into the depths. Ben looked over the heads, keeping his smile in place. Well, how deep? From Red and Beefy again. About one thirty feet, or all the way to hell, whichever comes first. He winked and started moving. Please walk carefully to the railing, but secure all loose objects. Wouldn't want them to end up in hell, right? said Beefy. Oh, fuck off, Ben thought, keeping his smile tight. The group moved quickly, almost rushing, even though there was enough room for twice as many at the railing. And please, there came the sound of a plastic bottle banging against rock, once, twice, three times, each strike getting fainter and fainter as it fell. Ben sighed. There was always some asshole who just had to drop something. He didn't want to think how much shit was down in that hole by now. He placed his hands on the light panel and flicked the first switch. Lights came on about fifty feet down. He cleared his throat, lowering the timbre of his voice to give it the right gravitas. And down we travel into the very bowels of the earth. Ben flicked another switch, and a light came on about a hundred feet down. Abandon all hope, ye who enter here. A few oohs and ahs let him know that at least some of the group were still impressed by nature's wonders. He hit the third switch for the final ring of lights, about one thirty feet down, and so just up from the bottom. He compressed his throat, ready to speak in a baritone he knew would resonate in the stone chamber. He was set to deliver his lines about Hades and the underworld when the red-faced guy had something else to add. Hey, Ranger Jorgensen, there's something down there. Ben groaned. Probably the bottle you just dropped, jackass, he thought, wishing he could say it out loud. And I think it's coming up... The big guy leaned out over the railing, straining to see down into the depths. It looks like oil. Huh? Ben came down from his perch and walked quickly over, trying to maintain his cool and his command, in case he was being pranked. Camera phones were being pulled out, ready, even though photography was banned in the caves. Hey, please don't! Ben knew the high-intensity light could damage the mineral composition of some of the delicate formations. That's gonna... There was a yelp from one side of the hole, and then a short, sharp scream before the crowd started to push back, hard. The people at the rear couldn't see what was happening, so reacted slowly. The people at the front were still jammed in against the railing. Ben started to increase his speed to get to the hole before there was an accident, but thought his eyes were beginning to play tricks on him. People looked to be leaping over the railing. Stop that, he yelled pointlessly. The red-faced guy was at the back now, shoving and elbowing hard, when what looked like a lasso made of licorice flung up out of the pit and wrapped around his neck. He screamed, the voice much higher than a man that size should have been able to manage, and then he was pulled onto his back and dragged backwards. Ben stopped dead with his mouth open. The guy must have weighed an easy two hundred pounds, but he was yanked up and over the four-foot-high railing as if he were a child's balloon. People were running now. Screams of panic subsumed all of his warnings, and groups broke away into myriad dark chambers, not caring where they went as long as it was away from whatever was coming up out of the pit. Ben was frozen in indecision, his mind trying to make sense of what he was seeing. He started to back up, all the way to his perch, and then turned to look back down on the hellish scene. Something dark that at first looked like a huge black cake covered the entire width of the bottomless pit. Once it reached the rim, it exploded into separate fragments, ten-foot-tall amoebic blobs of shiny blackness, covered in eyes and all thrashing limbs. The things took off after the fleeing people. Ben's eyes were so wide they threatened to pop out of his skull. 
and he was transfixed as one charged toward him, rolling, scuttling, gliding on centipede legs one moment and a slimy slug foot the next. He held up a hand, his mind now fully short-circuited. Call the police, he said softly as the thing loomed over him. I want it sealed off, the entire area. General Decker paced as he spoke into the phone to Perry Logan, the base commander at Fort Campbell in Kentucky. Logan's base was a big one, an army installation known as the 101st Airborne and 160th Special Operations. Decker stopped to look back at the live feed from the satellite of the Mammoth Cave's main entrance. There were the flashing lights of the local police, blocking all the roads. And Perry, pull those local cops back. They have no idea what they're up against, he snorted softly. For that matter, I don't think any of us do. He listened some more to the local commander, and his eyes closed. Sealing the area off was a pipe dream. There were hundreds of miles of caves, and literally hundreds of entrances. They were still finding new ones all the time. Decker exhaled. Okay, Perry, let's assign flamethrower units at all the major entrances. I'd like to try and at least contain them. He disconnected and then checked his watch. Major Abrams was due to touch down soon, and he had a chopper waiting for him and his team to bring them straight to the compound. Decker now ran the entire U.S. operations, called Project Underground. He had sent the president, safe for now in the sky on Air Force One, a recording of the interrogation of the thing that Ford had locked up in his deep containment cell and had been immediately given the green light on everything and everyone he wanted, unlimited resources. Decker stood back from his screen. The Mammoth Caves event was not the first. Across the country, across the entire globe, there were more attacks, bigger attacks, and huge seizures of all populations. General Henry Decker knew he was fighting on two battlefronts. One was the public's right to know, versus his obligation to keep them safe. His duty won out. National security protocols had now been brought to bear on all information traffic to shut down the collecting, reporting, and dissemination of news associated with the sinkholes and mass disappearances. He had to believe he was doing good by blindfolding the masses. If not, the public would panic and then surge, but to where? The phenomena were occurring from coast to coast and country to country. There was no safe haven anymore, and he just couldn't afford millions of people on the move. He sat down heavily and tapped one hard fist on the desk. And then there was the second battlefront. The public didn't know it yet, but they were at war. At war with ground troops the likes of which they had never seen. He sat back and closed his eyes, letting his mind work. And these were just the forward troops. What comes next, he wondered dismally. He hoped Major Abrams was bringing him something they could use. Matt felt he was in a dream. He saw the pair of hands working furiously, daubing the long lines of ink onto the pages and turning them into script of multiple ancient languages. The hands didn't stop or rest for even a few seconds, and the stack of pages began to rise. Blisters rubbed where he held the pen, but it didn't matter. They weren't his hands, and it was all a dream. The story flowed smoothly, along with the poems of beauty and horror and the insightful advice about beings long dead or never dead at all. But the strange symbols were not there. The fast-moving hands were not managing to recreate every curve, cross, and dot, the celestial speech of the angels, or of hell itself, or whatever it was, remained immune to his translation or memory. He knew this book, the Necronomicon, or Al-Azif, or the Book of the Dead, was more than just a collection of thoughts from a mad Arab. It was a book of war and warning about cruel elder beings and spells and creatures that had once inhabited our world 
and sought to do so again. The book was both the poison and the cure. It was also a guide to hell itself. Matt dimly became aware of the shaking of his arm, firm, then firmer, and then the voice. He blinked and licked lips that were parchment dry. Adira sat next to him, Abrams and Hartog in front, and Andy Bennett behind. Huh? He felt groggy. We land soon. Adira leaned around in front of him, trying to look at his eyes. You've been at this non-stop for twelve hours. How are you doing? She handed him some water. Matt took the cup and drained it. He knew exactly what she was asking. The question wasn't so much one of concern for him, but for his progress. More time. I need more time. He waved her away and picked up the pen again. Once more he felt himself slide back into the dream. Time passed and he would not remember it. Instead, what Matt experienced was a world to come. He saw the images of what had been before and what was to be for the human race. Vile creatures herding humans like long lines of cattle into caves and holes and basements. The things like many-limbed amoebic blobs, eyes and mouths forming and unforming on their disgusting hides, towering over their human stock, uncaring, unfeeling, little more than army ants for a monstrous leader yet to come. From time to time, one human soul would break away, but would be quickly chased down, grabbed, lifted, and stuffed into a puckered hole that opened in one side of the dark horrors. Matt wept as his hand flew across the page. The lines of people were endless, thousands, hundreds of thousands, and many more kept corralled in yards, waiting, waiting. The other billions of humans fled in panic, but nowhere would be safe, as they too were part of a grand new plan. And then that too became clear. A huge living thing lifted itself from the earth, its size beyond anything in human memory. It grew and grew, squeezing forth from the underground, like a huge mass of pus from a wound torn open. Alhazred had tried to describe what he saw, but his words fell short of fully describing the horror. It was worm-like, a pulpy, rubbery-looking body, pulsing with enormous strength that barely supported a grotesque, octopus-like head. But the worst of all was the thing's face. Masses of eyes dotted the head, spider-like in their tight clusters, and each one glistened with a frightening but pitiless intelligence. Matt could already feel its malevolence and its hunger as it rushed upward to sate its lust for flesh. Matt placed hands over his ears as the scream of countless people rang out when the huge head dropped down upon them, its maw open wide. No! He was caught then, trapped, the tentacles wrapping around his body. He fought, but the bonds were unbreakable. There was a sharp slap across his face, and he opened his eyes. There were arms around him, and he found Adira gripping him and holding him in his seat. Hartog and Abrams leaned over their seat backs and stared down at him. Adira grabbed a towel and dabbed at his forehead. You were crying out. I've been trying to break your trance. She wiped his hair back with the damp towel. We've been worried. I'm okay. Matt didn't feel okay, and he could feel his heart careening in his chest. His stomach still felt like it was swollen with a poisonous liquid. It's the book. I... He looked down. There were hundreds of pages written in Syriac, Greek, and Arabic calligraphy. Did I do that? She smiled. You've done nothing else. Her forehead creased in confusion. You don't remember? Matt shook his head. All the people, the entire world is doomed if we don't stop it. She gripped his arm. Did you find something? Matt closed his eyes for a second or two and willed himself to calm down. 
I saw it, and it will consume us all like grains of rice. Adira's fingers dug in, and her gaze intensified. Professor Kearns, did you find something we can use? Matt searched his memory, riffling through the images. At last he slumped. No. Ach! Adira let him go and leaned back into her chair. She breathed calmly in and out for a few seconds. Abrams and Hartog sat back down in their own seats. She smiled sadly. Buckle up, we're landing. She seemed to think for a while and turned her head. Matthew, I think you do know, but perhaps you just don't know it yet. The answer is there. Alhazred found a way, you will too. Matt sat back. I need to rest for a while. Abrams's voice floated back immediately. Sorry, Matt, not yet. We need to report straight back to base, and you'll be coming, Professor. He stood up to look at Adira. And we'll be on home soil and safe. Captain, you have been of enormous help, but there are too many people who do not want you roaming around the countryside. I'm afraid you don't get to leave the airport, and we'll be on a turnaround plane within twelve hours. He sat back down. Adira closed her eyes. Chapter 17 Murrow Observatory, Oldham County, Kentucky Amazing. Simply amazing. You can almost feel it. Walter Brayshaw held out a hand, flat and flexed stubby white fingers, wiggling them in the air. They tingle. Huh? Jeff Swartz didn't look up from the screen. Pringles, none left. He continued tapping keys and rotating the powerful 24-inch Ritchie Chrétien telescope to follow the celestial body convergence occurring almost directly overhead. No, tingles! Walter swung in his chair to stare at his fellow astrophysicist. The bearded scientist leveled his thick-lensed gaze at his colleague. Tingles, I said. He held out a stubby arm and shook the hand in the air. See? Swartz turned and then let his gaze run from Walter's face to his hand. He held out his own for a second or two, shrugged, and then swiveled back to his screen. It's not related. Focus. Walter blew air through his lips and went back to his own screen. Focus, he repeated softly. Jeff was right. This was important. The Moore facility was tiny, and its primary responsibility was to measure transiting exoplanets, a fancy name for mapping celestial bodies as they move over the face of another. And what was happening right now in their own astronomical backyard was big news. Walter swung back again. This won't happen again for another 1,300 years, and we, my friend, are in the box seat. He whooped, fist pumped, and then grinned, his tiny teeth just showing through his straggly beard. Jeff wiped a hand up over his brow, continuing up and over his thinning hair. Jesus, man, I'm hot. Are you hot? Huh? Walter shook his head. Not really. He lifted one meaty arm. There was a huge wet ring under it. Maybe a little. He went back to his screen. A line of dots was strung up overhead, some the size of grapes and others little more than pinpricks of light. Jeff sipped from a bottle of water. And in twenty-four hours, when the big cheese rolls around, we'll have them all in a line. Walter clapped once, and his feet stomped under his seat. I can't wait, I can't wait, I can't wait. Jeff stood up, frowned, and then kicked off his brown slippers. He clawed his toes on the floor, three feet of solid concrete foundation for telescopic stability. Hey, I knew it. 
He clawed his toes some more. This is where the warmth is coming from, the floor. It feels like it's heated. Walter turned and blinked at him. He stared for another moment and then got to his feet. He stepped out of his prized Australian sheepskin boots, Uggs, he called them. He also clawed his toes. Holy shit, man, you're right. He looked up. You don't think... Jeff shrugged and looked at his feet. Why not? With that amount of focused gravity, it absolutely could cause crustal friction. The displacement alone would throw up a few extra degrees. He looked up. Is it a problem? Walter pursed his lips. One or two degrees, now. But what about in 24 hours when the moon lines up as well? Jeff winced. We better tell someone. I'm not going outside. Way too much weird shit going down. Walter sat down and went back to his screen. So I agree. You better tell someone. Fort Benning, Columbus, Georgia. Matt felt overwhelmed by the assembled military crowd packed into the room. Abrams had brought them directly to Fort Benning, the new command center, and one of the largest army posts in the U.S., with over 20,000 active-duty military. According to Abrams, it could deploy combat-ready forces by any delivery medium at a moment's notice. Matt guessed if there was one place you wanted to be when preparing for a home turf war, it was right there. A long table had been set up on a platform at the front of the hole like room. Abrams sat next to Matt and Andy, and along from him was the general, Decker. Hartog had showered, shaved, and was down the back. When Matt caught his eye, he nodded and gave him a you'll-be-fine gesture. Dozens of seats were lined up and filled by various military personnel. Most sat talking in groups or with arms folded, eyes like hawks trained on the team at the front. Ladies and gentlemen, Decker's voice boomed, shutting down the chatter. We are enacting War Plan Red. The general's eyes moved across the senior people in the room. None flinched at the term for a strategy to deal with a mainland invasion. We envisaged a non-indigenous force would one day seek to either occupy the mainland territory or try and decimate the population through a weapon of mass destruction. We always envisaged that invasionary plan would be human foreign power enacted. The ground has shifted under our feet, literally. Ladies and gentlemen, here are the facts. Decker clasped his large hands together. An enemy force is already among us, capturing, subverting, and killing our people. Decker nodded to the rear of the room, and the lights dimmed. The wall behind him lit up, and then the horrors appeared. The screen showed the Shogoth in the containment cell. People sat forward, faces twisted in disgust, and there was angry murmuring. Jesus Christ, what the fuck is that thing? came from one large man in the front row. The thing was shown feeding, its body bloating as it consumed the flesh. Pulsating eyes popped open on its glistening dark hide, and ever more mouths opened as it consumed its prey, ripping it first to shreds and stuffing the pieces of dripping meat into the holes. The crowd shifted uncomfortably. Decker's face was impassive. Like I said, things have changed. He jerked his thumb over his shoulder at the images. What is it? Hell if I know. It's called a Shagoth. But as for what it really is, our best and brightest have no idea. We can analyze its characteristics and make some educated guesses. He lifted some notes. High percentage of water amorphous striated muscle that's enormously strong and pliable, has a toxic mucus layer in cells that are like chromatophores, except they don't just allow the thing to change color, 
They also allow it to change shape. Decker looked over his shoulder, his face like stone. When this thing was brought in, it looked like a man. The closest we can come up with is that it's more closely akin to some sort of a giant, semi-intelligent slug than anything else. Decker exhaled between his teeth and moved to the next image. This one was a film that started rolling as soon as it appeared. It showed an aerial shot of a large and deep sinkhole, with dozens of people milling around, some taking pictures. The people stopped moving and all stared in the same direction, toward the rim of the pit. Something came up out of the dark hole. Matt expected it to be some of the horrifying Shogoth, but the thing's body kept coming. At first it looked like dark scaffolding. Long, shiny legs gripped the edge of the pit, claws digging into the concrete, and then it dragged the rest of itself free. Long, insectoid legs, shining in the sunlight, and all spiked and barbed like a monstrous locust. It rose higher and higher, gaining a height of about three stories. Its long body was that of a primitive reptile with short, stubbed tail, and it had a mottled hide more like bubbled flesh than scales or skin. It seemed to lack eyes, but the enormous head swiveled toward the people, who were all apparently rooted to the spot. They finally started to flee, but the creature moved fast, too fast for something that size. It quickly ran down its prey. A long, sticky tongue shot out, lapping at the fleeing bodies, and like ants on an anteater's, people were glued to the long tongue and reeled back up and into the open mouth. That's enough, Decker said softly. The image froze behind him, and the room sat in silence for several seconds. The National Guard took this monstrosity out, eventually. Had to blow it to pieces and burn what was left. Like the Shogoths, it is, was, we believe, a primitive form of life, but not mindless. These bastards are moving to a plan, under orders. They're feeding, yes, but they're also stopping us from entering the sinkholes. Where the fuck are these things coming from? Are you saying they've been under our feet the whole time? Asked another granite-faced military man, chin jutting. Matt saw he had enough bars to cover most of his left breast and sat with folded arms across a button-popping frame. Matt had been introduced previously. He was Fort Benning's commanding general, James McAllister, to date, he had seemed most pissed off because Decker, of equal rank, had been given mission seniority. Decker shook his head. I don't know where they were or where they're from. Our seismology teams are getting readings from across the globe of activity about a mile down that are not related to anything geological. We're also getting data in now on the planet's crust starting to warm probably related. He shrugged. The issue for today is, these things are here, now, today. Whose orders? You said they were under orders? McAllister asked. Decker nodded to the man. We believe there are two distinct forces at work against us. He nodded again, and once more images appeared behind him. The smiling, tanned face of Charles Drummond filled the screen. Decker's mouth turned down as if he had just smelled something bad. Charles Sheldon Drummond. Movie production, publishing, media consulting. In the field of entertainment or communications, you name it, the guy had his thumb in it. Seems he's been financing some sort of global cult that intends to aid and abet whatever is occurring right now. Drummond has also shown aggressive intent to slow down our efforts to even understand what is going on. My team was attacked in Egypt. People were tortured and killed. More worrying is that it showed us we have been infiltrated. One of our own people was a sleeper agent for Mr. Drummond. 
This group has now gone to ground. Whatever is occurring is at point of culmination. McAllister shifted in his seat. The sinkholes, the quakes, the weird creatures, the people attacked, and also disappearing. I can see the effects. They're as plain as the nose on my face. But that doesn't tell us what this culmination point is or what's about to occur. Decker sat back for a moment. We had an interesting conversation with some of our observatories yesterday. Seems the celestial convergence that is occurring now is producing some physical manifestations. Abnormal gravity effects causing crustal friction, resulting in a rise in ground temperature. Also, the sinkholes have began to outgas nitrogen. By itself, nothing serious. But in combination with other phenomena, it starts to build a picture. He turned to Abrams. Joshua, do you want to take it from here? Thank you, sir. Abrams sat forward. Our Earth was formed a little over four and a half billion years ago, and the Moon formed about thirty million years after that. At that time, the Earth was nothing but an ocean of magma. When the Moon did coalesce and first form, it was very close to the Earth, possibly as close as 20,000 miles away. Still sounds a lot until you realize that the Moon is currently more than ten times that away now. That lunar proximity would have had a tidal effect even on the seas of molten rock. Abrams interlocked his fingers on the table. Once the world cooled, it was another billion years before even single-cell life appeared— and then it took four billion more before the first rudimentary animals evolved. Those missing billions of years have always perplexed scientists. There should have been something more. His face was grim. Now we think there might have been. In this primordial stage of the Earth's life, we believe there may have been a rise of other life forms in the nitrogen-rich, high-gravity, high-heat planetary climate, something that rose to dominate the world and then, for whatever reason, fell away, either into death or long-term hibernation. Below the crust, said Don Mancino, McAllister's senior officer. Below the crust, below the ocean, Abrams shrugged. Whatever this race was, it attained a civilization of sorts, and also had a high level of intelligence. Now, the Earth is unique among the terrestrial planets in having a large satellite, and we know the emergence and development of life has been strongly influenced by the presence of the Moon. It affects our oceans and tides, it affects our planetary rotation, and it can even affect our moods. Well, this effect is about to be increased tenfold by a planetary lineup a celestial convergence. The planet will be warmer, gravity will be altered, and perhaps the atmosphere itself will change. The higher nitrogen is indicative of the planetary atmosphere of about four billion years ago. In effect, the environment will be altered. Terraforming, Mancino said matter-of-factly. The environment will be temporarily more primordial. Abrams nodded, but then turned to Matt. Now another piece of the puzzle. Professor Kearns. Matt nodded, feeling lightheaded, the lack of sleep dragging on his frame. From a satchel, he pulled free the manuscript he had completed, now bound with simple boards. He opened it, knowing exactly where he needed to go. We met a brave man in Syria a Dr. Hussein Ben Al-Badi, the former doctor of anthropology at the University of Damascus. He gave his life to impart certain information about the location of an ancient book that foretells the events we are now experiencing. Matt looked down and saw the words, but then lifted his head, not needing to read as each of the letters, words, and syllables was imprinted on his mind forever. From the darkest core they will rise. From beneath the rock, beneath the soft earth and slime, they will come. 
the great old one and its armies, where man rules sure of himself and comfortable in his vanity, they know we are but caretakers for the true master. It sleeps, powerful, all-knowing, and patient beyond time itself. Cthulhu shall rule again. Matt felt the same heady rush when reading or speaking the words, and he licked his dry lips before continuing. This book, written nearly 1,300 years ago, originally known as the Al-Azif, and also as the Necronomicon, or the Book of the Dead, or even the Book of Old Ones, contains a prophecy. And all the signs we are seeing bear out the fulfillment of this prophecy. And that is, the great old one, Cthulhu, is once again awakening. He rubbed his eyes, then looked along the faces in front of him. They displayed a mix of alert concentration and disbelief. This thing is an ancient being of immense power. From what I can decipher, this Cthulhu and its minions are currently sleeping beneath the earth and beneath the sea. When they first ruled, it was for billions of years, and it was even before the primordial ooze. But something happened, some sort of great cataclysm that made the world unsuitable for them. Some died, some left, and some, like Cthulhu, the great old one, hibernated. Coo what Is this a joke? McAllister's features seemed to have screwed themselves into a knot on his face. Decker held up a hand and nodded to Matt to continue. He did. According to the book and to Dr. Albadi's research, there have been five appearances of the Old Ones in Earth's past. These appearances correspond exactly to the five mass extinction events throughout Earth's history. Matt looked along the line of faces again. When this thing rises, nearly all life on Earth vanishes. Bullshit! McAllister turned to Decker, his jaw thrust out. That's what we're working with now? Fucking voodoo? Voodoo? Matt's eyes went up. Are you shitting... Decker leaned forward. There were cords standing out on his neck as he glared at McAllister. You think we're making this up? He jerked a thumb at the image of the long-legged creature frozen on the screen behind him. Maybe that's just a lot of Russians in a big fucking suit? His head seemed to extend on his neck even further. You got better intel, thoughts, or theories. Then why don't you impress us with your own insights? Come on up and take the floor, General. The silence hung thickly. McAllister sat stunned, his face reddening. It's just... Decker continued to glare, and Abrams leaned forward. Thank you, Matt. He looked McAllister in the eyes. That's what I thought at first, General, that it can't be real. I didn't want it to be real. Abrams raised a hand to the rear of the room. But it is. Once more, the screen behind them came to life. This may help us to understand what we are dealing with. We have determined that the nearest Earth point of the celestial convergence is approximately over the state of Kentucky. We rerouted one of our Vela satellites and used ground-penetrating radar at maximum over the area. This is what we came up with. Images flashed on the screen one after the other. The first showed a high-altitude shot of Mammoth Cave National Park. Then each successive shot peeled another surface layer. Soil, limestone, sandstone, and then, deeper, there appeared a dark stain. Even more layers were stripped away, and the dark stain seemed to shift and pulse with life. What in goddamn hell is that? Is it a lake? Oil or something? General McAllister asked, his forehead folded into deep clefts over his brows. Abrams looked from the screen. We're not sure what it is, but it's about ten miles down for now and seems to be coming to the surface. 
That thing is enormous. What the hell size is that mass? Don Mancino asked. Abrams exhaled and looked at the screen. It covers a distance of approximately five miles. Five fucking miles? McAllister said, his face turning beet red all over again. What happens when it gets to the surface? Matt felt like he was going to black out and felt Abrams' hand still grip his forearm. He closed his eyes. Have you not been listening? When they rise, it will be the end of us all. How much time? Mancino asked. Matt opened tired eyes. The peak planetary convergence is tonight, in about twelve hours. He smiled sadly. It will be a new dawn for Cthulhu, and the last for humanity. He slipped out of consciousness. Chapter 18 Adira Senesh sat in the hard wood and plastic chair, staring straight ahead, and with one wrist handcuffed to the armrest. The two police guards, Deck and Bill, she had learned, stood a dozen feet back against the opposite wall, facing her. Both had grown tired of trying to eyeball the tall woman, and now spent their time chatting while occasionally glancing in her direction. Time passed at a glacial speed. She focused, thinking through what needed to be done. Drummond had eluded them and was in the possession of the original book. The traitor, Captain Tanya Kovitz, had been worried that Matt Kearns had read it, whatever it still contained, and whatever it was that Kearns could not yet understand must have extreme value to them. They had traversed oceans and countries to maim and kill to ensure they took it from them, just so they couldn't read it. Bottom line, if they wanted it, then she wanted it more. Major Abrams had dealt her out of the game. She'd expected that. Now it was time to change things up. She looked up, her eyes half-lidded. Water. What? The guard closest to her, the one called Deck, turned to frown at her. Water. Thirsty. Deck looked at his partner after a moment and shrugged. Please, I'm thirsty. She stared straight ahead again. Bill shook his head. Forget it. She's not leaving the room and neither are you. You want to give her something, then she can have the rest of yours. He turned to stare hard at Adira. Okay, she thought. So you are the tough one, then. She looked up, her expression one of defeat and fatigue. She slumped, making herself small in the chair. So thirsty, she pleaded. Deck reached into his pocket and pulled out a half-full plastic bottle of mountain lake water and unscrewed the cap. He held it out. Adira looked at the bottle hanging just two feet from her face, a spec op soldier would not have even engaged with her. An experienced soldier would have put the bottle down and just kicked it over. Her eyes flicked from the bottle to the hand. Only an inexperienced soldier would allow any part of his body to come within reach of an enemy opponent, especially one who was extremely well trained. Adira exploded forward, dragging the chair with her. She grabbed Deck's wrist with her unchained hand and forced it back. The big man bent backward, and she shoved him hard into his more alert companion. Both collided with the wall, and by the time they had regained their feet, she was ready. She swung the chair into Bill and rounded on Deck, punching him twice rapidly in a two-knuckle blow to his temple. Bill went for his gun— but by then she was close enough to launch a vicious kick up under his chin, which caused him to bounce into the wall and then pinball back toward her. She hit him again, a flat strike to the bridge of his nose. She could have killed them both, but it was enough that they would be unconscious for hours. Adira stood silently, not even breathing hard, just listening. 
No sounds from outside the room. She kneeled quickly, finding the handcuff keys and freeing herself. She then stripped the men of their guns, money, both their two-way radios, heavy torches, concealed weapons, and anything else she could fit in her pockets. She then tied their hands and legs behind their backs. She picked up Dex water and sipped as she got to her feet, cracking the door a fraction and looking out and down the empty corridor. She eased out and moved quickly to an exit. Escape from airport security would be simple. She was already on the inside of the secured area. U.S. security provisions were extremely tough and effective against people trying to get into airports, not break out. In another ten minutes, she found the car park and jacked a small sedan. The parking card was in the glove box. I love this country. She shot out into the street and turned hard into the main boulevard. In a few minutes, she was moving toward the city center. She knew the town and knew there was a Mossad safe house nearby. She needed to find Drummond, and for that she needed a connection to him. She needed Matt Kearns. General Decker called for a break in the meeting so the group could grab coffee or food, or just generally stretch their legs. Matt and Andy decided to walk for a bit in the huge grounds of Fort Benning. The secure grounds they were in was part of a massive complex the size of Rhode Island. Offices, accommodation, restaurants, training fields, firing ranges, with huge tracts of land for field exercises and jogging tracks. In some areas, you felt you could have been in a secluded forest, and it would have been too easy to get lost. The pair headed off for a quick head-clearing walk, and maybe a coffee and donut if they could find one. Once out in the fresh air, Matt felt better immediately. His phone buzzed in his pocket, and he pulled it free, frowning down at the small screen. Trouble? Andy asked. Nah, but more a bolt from the blue. It's from my ex, Megan. Haven't heard from her in a year or so. He read the message. What's it say? Andy tried to see over his shoulder. Matt blocked him. Urgent news. She wants me to come to the front gate. They won't let her in. He raised his eyebrows. What's that about? And how did she find me? Jesus. Andy snorted. I miss you, honey, and it's time for you to say hello to Matt Kearns, Jr. I'll piss off. It's been ages. Still. Matt grimaced at the thought Andy had planted in his head. Nah, impossible. Something's not right. He looked around, seeing where he was in relation to the front gates. Only about ten minutes. They only had thirty minutes, but his curiosity was overwhelming his good sense. Want me to come? Andy asked with a lopsided grin. No way, it's... Forget it, buddy, I'm coming. Any chick who'd put up with you for more than five minutes is worth seeing. He slapped Matt on the shoulder and pointed. This way. It took them twenty minutes to pass the front gate, explain they were going for a walk, and then another ten to find the small car parked by the roadside. When they approached, a hand came out and waved. Matt slowed, Andy at his side. You've got to be shitting me, Andy said and snorted. Do all your women friends look the same? So, Megan, Matt folded his arms at the car window. Adira lowered her sunglasses. Matt, Andy, sorry for the subterfuge, but I needed to talk. And yes, it is urgent. I thought you were confined to the airport, Matt asked, scoffing. I convinced them I can be of more assistance in the field, so... She shrugged and then looked at the military facility. So how's it going in there? Have they ordered a nuclear strike yet? She smiled. They will, you know. On home soil? Matt shook his head. No way. Professor, Matthew, when a man has a hammer, 
Everything needs hammering. This is the military you're dealing with. To them, everything has a military solution. Matt exhaled and looked around. He knew she was probably right. He could tell the way the mood in the room was shifting toward a conclusive response. There is another option, Adira said, pushing her sunglasses back up on her nose. Get in. She motioned to the seat next to her. She looked up at Andy. You don't need to come, Mr. Bennett. Nice one, and I missed you too, Andy said with one brow up. But if my buddy is going, then I go too. Matt got in, and Andy jumped in the back and rested his elbows on the seat between them. Adira turned to Matt. The book, the Alazif, is in your head, but the answers have not been made apparent to you yet. Charles Drummond wanted that book for a reason, even if it was just to make sure we didn't have it. I want to know why. I don't have the copy I made, Matt held out his hands. The copy is in your head, but what you wrote down was incomplete. You are missing many of the symbols I remember you telling us. We need the original. Her eyes became flint hard. And for that, I want to talk to Charles Drummond, one on one. General Decker Fort Benning's Commanding General James McAllister, Major Abrams, and Sergeant Major Don Mancino shared a coffee as various teams ran some tactical response scenarios. McAllister nodded his thanks as Decker topped up his coffee. He sipped and then looked at his officer. No one saw this coming. Decker shrugged. Yes, they did. Unfortunately, we didn't know they did, as they've been dead for over a thousand years. He exhaled. The way I see it, we've got an immediate threat to the population in these goddamn creatures rising up and attacking our people. They're hard to kill, and there are more of them by the hour. But the worst of it is, we have the greater threat in this giant being rising to the surface of our planet. We need to break our problems down. Decker looked to Abrams. Major, your job is the Shoggoths. Get down to the containment cell and pull that freak apart and find out what makes it tick. I want to know how we can kill or at least hurt it. Also keep on that Kearns guy's back. He's the only one who's looked at the book, and I think there's more we can learn from him yet. McAllister nodded at Don Mancino. Don will send a team after Drummond and this traitor, Captain Tanya Kovitz. If they're in, on, or under our country, we'll find him. He looked up at the screen. It showed the faint image of Cthulhu underneath Mammoth Park. That thing reminds me of some sort of giant infection under the skin. You know what we do in the field if we get a growing infection in a wound? His eyebrows went up. Decker nodded slowly. We cauterize. It's a big infection, so we'll need a big instrument. McAllister's face became grim. You thinking Castle Bravo? Decker smiled. Way ahead of you, Jim. We're upgrading a B-83 as we speak. It's our best nuclear earth penetrator. Big end-of-town bunker buster. Normally, we can punch out about 1.2 megatons, not enough. We're scaling it up for a 20 megaton strike. It'll be about a thousand times more powerful than the atomic bombs we dropped on Japan. When this thing detonates, it will form a fireball almost five miles across and scour a crater 500 feet deep. Mancino whistled. Let's hope that does it. What about fallout? Decker exhaled, and his lips compressed momentarily. We can expect a mushroom cloud rising to 47,000 feet, with a contamination plume expanding to a diameter of 62 miles within 10 minutes. He looked at each of the men, his jaw set. Conservative estimates are that it will onward expand at more than 220 miles per hour, 
and that around a hundred miles of the state will be significantly contaminated, and a thousand square miles of land mildly contaminated. Jesus Christ, Mancino grimaced. That's most of Kentucky, four and a half million people. We need to get them out. Decker nodded slowly. We're going to do our best. His face was grave. But if this thing starts to break through, then either the B-83 drops, or we say goodbye to everyone and everything on the planet anyway. McAllister blinked a few times. And I pray we don't have to use it. Chapter 19 Charles Drummond and Tanya stood in an antechamber outside a huge door, awaiting their audience. The father would not be rushed, would not be at anyone's beck and call. Two of the shaven-headed priests stood up against the wall, their eyes on the floor. They didn't move or even seem to breathe. Since the two had led them into the room, it was as if they ceased to be alive. Tanya held the Al-Azif under one arm and shivered despite the heat. Drummond looked across at her and smiled. Don't be nervous. You're given a great honor to meet the father. Not many of our flock even know he exists. In fact, not many would even get to meet me, let alone know about me. She grinned nervously. I just don't know what to expect. Maybe I'm just overexcited to meet someone who's actually communed with the great old one, she said, trying hard to stop her teeth chattering. Drummond watched her face for a moment. He could almost smell her fear. The freckles across her nose and cheeks were more prominent against the cold pallor of her skin. Like I said, he asked to see you. Perhaps a reward is in order. Your service as a sleeper agent working within the military for nearly ten years has been exemplary. We couldn't have monitored the Americans or obtained the book without you. He nodded and smiled again. Whatever you receive, it will be a gift. Just remember that. She sucked in a deep, juddering breath. Another thirty minutes passed before one of the priests stepped forward and opened the door and pointed. Drummond steadied himself, and once again was nearly overwhelmed by the rank, fishy odor. He almost chortled at the thought of what the woman was experiencing, it being her first time. He half turned. Follow my lead, bow your head, and do not look at the father unless he asks you to. Tanya nodded jerkily and stepped forward on stiff legs. The huge, familiar figure was already waiting for them. The cowl pulled over the large head was a portal into utter darkness. The father beckoned them to the ground before him, and Charles immediately went to his knees. Tanya followed. Charles, you have done well. The father looked down at Tanya. And Captain Tanya Kovitz... You have something for me. Tanya kept her head down, nodded, and held out the book. A priest came and took it from her and disappeared back into the shadows. Drummond didn't even know the man was there, and it made him wonder who or what else was lurking in those darker alcoves watching them. The father held forth his hand to Tanya, and she stayed still unmoving, not knowing what was expected of her. Drummond felt his irritation rise at her inexperience, and he hoped the father wasn't as insulted as he was. Kiss it, you stupid bitch! Show your obedience! Tanya's head came up, and she saw the hand for the first time. Drummond heard her rapid intake of breath, and he smiled. The hand was a mottled greenish-black, with lumps and protrusions all over the boneless-looking fingers. Tanya reached out slowly, and Drummond could see her own hand shook. The father's beauty was not for everyone. 
Her head started to tilt upward, slowly, jerkily, her eyes rounder than he thought possible. Hold yourself with dignity, he prayed. The woman's mouth opened wide in a silent scream, and he saw her tongue retreat to the back of her throat. The father leaned forward, and she now looked directly into his face. The dark folds of the cowl rippled as things inside the hood coiled, writhed, and twisted, like some many-legged sea creature moving in agitation. Drummond watched from the corner of his eye, becoming tense, as it looked for a moment she might snatch her own hand away. But instead, the father's hand continued to reach out, those long, boneless fingers extending, impossibly long, and coiling around her wrist and forearm. She looked down in horror at first, and then pain as the sting began. Drummond saw the skin on her wrist redden. I am your servant, Tanya hissed between tight lips and gritted teeth. Yes, you are, and you will be forever. The voice was watery, bubbling, made by a tongue and vocal cords not meant for surface speech. The grip tightened, and the skin on her wrist began to blacken. Tanya's resolve snapped, and she began to scream, a long siren sound that rose in pitch and intensity. Before the noise became unbearable, there came explosive movement from under the cowl. Black whipping tendrils shot out to wrap around her head and neck, holding her tight and dragging her closer. Charles got to his feet and backed up a step. He'd never seen this before and felt his own fear tingle his spine. The masses of rubbery strands, pipes and limbs forced themselves into her mouth, nose, ears, and ripped away her clothing to find other egress into her pale body. She seemed to swell, and angry red fissures opened all over her, as if her insides were growing too large for the delicate outer sheath of her skin. Then, to Charles's horror, she just burst apart. She didn't explode exactly. It was as if her outer shell were violently cast off. The discarded bits of her face, head, and body flew to the corners of the room, and then she, it, stood there, bloated, glistening black, and her once beautiful blue eyes were still there, but now many more formed and popped open. They slid along her bulging body and its ever-sprouting multiple limbs, some human arms, some whipping tentacles or crab-like claws. Just as quickly as she had become the grotesque thing, she began to reform back into a Tanya shape. A few shards of her former self still hung wetly to the new, false, pink skin. The father released what had been Tanya and said words to her that were in a language Drummond had no hope of understanding or ever being able to form with his own primitive tongue. Tanya stood next to the father, naked, and glistening as if coated in oil. Drummond felt his mouth go dry. Years ago he had been asked to serve the father, and in return for saying yes he had been rewarded with immense wealth and power. Further, he had been promised he would be a king among the remaining peoples of earth, after the great old one arose. Now he wondered whether his final reward might in fact be something far different. Charles, the voice bubbled up again. The great old one will soon breach the weak skin of this world. But first a human must say the words to break the final seal. The father lifted his boneless hands once more, palms up. His head tilted back as he seemed to look up through the ceiling above them. I can feel it now. The pull of all the planets. The gates will open. The hands dropped, and the father glided backward toward the rear of the room. Stay with us, Charles. We need you. 
and need to protect you, our future king. Charles could have sworn he heard a sound like a wet laugh, but was more concerned about not being able to leave. Tanya remained where she, it, was, and two of the priests appeared and murmured something to her. She nodded and then looked at him. Charles knew now what the priests were, what everyone in this place was. Vile Shoggoths, the mindless protoplasmic beings that lived to feed the Great One and themselves. They need me to utter the last incantation. But then, how long will I remain human, he wondered. A sudden wave of fear rippled through his gut, making him feel lightheaded. He pushed it down, straightening his spine. They want me to rule over what is left of the human race, and I will rule. He swallowed, his mouth dust dry. The priest came over and motioned for Charles to follow him. Down. Tanya followed. Outskirts of Franklin, Kentucky. Hours passed, and Adira still drove hard. She had left the Interstate 85 Highway long back, skirted Atlanta and Birmingham, and now was roaring up the 65. She drove as if their lives meant nothing, and Matt wondered what would happen if a local cop decided to try and pull her over. Andy was in the back, his head now resting on the seat, and he watched the blurred scenery speed by as if in a trance. Matt looked down at the woman's waist. She had two guns strapped to her front. I assume negotiated diplomacy is going to be done Mossad-style, he asked. There will be no negotiation. She smiled humorlessly as she drove. As soon as Charles Drummond ordered my colleague killed, he signed his own death warrant. While he talks, he can live. Her face became hard again. And then he dies. Franklin, Andy said, coming up. Adira nodded and slowed for a moment to look down at a small box in her lap. She grunted and looked back to the road. Not far now. What, you're tracking him? How? Matt tried to see the device she was using. Not him, Adira responded, looking at the device one last time and then stuffing it back into her top pocket. The book. You're tracking the book. Of course, when you made a grab at it in the hotel room. He shook his head. You could have been killed. She looked at him, her smile flat. But I wasn't, and it was a worthwhile risk. Andy cleared his throat. I don't mean to rain on any parades, but we should tell Major Abrams where we are. We're not exactly the Seventh Fleet, are we? We need backup. He sat forward. Matt, we need backup. Yeah. Matt turned to Adira. He's right, you know. If you've got a lead, you must share it. We can't afford for Drummond to get away. And I'm sure the Major would love the opportunity to bring Tanya, uh, Captain Kovitz, in. She kept her eyes on the road. If I see Captain Kovitz, I will kill her. Whoa, whoa there. This is America you're in now. Andy leaned further over the seat back, his face twisted. For all we know, she might have been brainwashed or blackmailed into helping Drummond. So none of this shoot-first crap, okay? Then you keep her out of my way, Mr. Bennett. For believe me, if she even looks like she might be a threat, I will put her down. She half turned. As for Drummond, I will just need a few minutes alone with him. And I don't need backup. Great. Matt exhaled between compressed lips. And then we can call in the Major. I mean, when you've had your minute. He can have what's left. Her smile was devoid of any humor. When you call him. Matt felt a dawning realization. Oh, Christ. 
You're not even supposed to still be here, are you? She turned briefly and smiled. I don't think any of us are supposed to be here, do you, Professor? Chapter 20 Westerville, Ohio Billy Jenkins turned into State Street from Lincoln and breathed a sigh of relief. Creepy as all shit is how he was planning to describe it later to his friends at the mall. He pedaled harder, still a few papers left to toss, and then back to the shop for his pay. His mom had told him they were all grounded, but today was payday, and hell if he wasn't going to get his money. He took a corner sharp and frowned as he remembered the blocks of tomb-quiet streets he had just left behind. The usually friendly residents weren't out and about like they should have been. This was a midday delivery, and he should have seen people walking dogs, jogging, hosing lawns, or washing cars. It was summer. People were outside in summer. Not today. Today, the few people he did see stood still as sticks just inside their houses, standing behind windows or at doors half-cracked open, just staring at him. And they were all wet, as if they'd just stepped out of dirty showers. And what was with the clothes? Most just wore rags, like they'd been in a freaking bomb blast or something, their shredded clothing just hanging on their oily bodies. Just up ahead was Crozer's groceries, and he quickly lifted his arm to check his watch. He had time to grab a quick chalk mint shake before finishing up his run. He turned into the store parking lot and had rolled toward the front door, coming to a stop next to a power pole he was going to prop his bike against when he froze. Billy stared, his brow creasing as he tried to understand what he was seeing, Inside the store there was a maelstrom of chaos and confusion. Shelves were tipped over, and the dozen or so people inside, checkout guys and girls and customers alike, were all stuck in something. The thick, soundproof glass out front stopped any noise escaping, and the electronic doors were shut, but he could see there was some sort of black, ropey stuff all over them, and they were immobilized, like they were trapped in a web thingy, but a living web thingy. The coils were wrapped tight around arms, necks, legs, and waists, and it was slowly dragging everyone toward the rear of the store, where Billy knew was the entrance to the cellar's cool room. Fishing. They're all in a fishnet. Caught, was what came to mind as he stared with his mouth gaping. The black stuff tugged again, and they were all dragged another few feet. The faces of the trapped were terrible, all screwed up in pure horror. He wheeled his bike a few feet closer to the glass and saw Mrs. Hornsby, Jake Hornsby's mother, extend a hand to him, as though trying to reach for him. Her mouth was almost a perfect circle. She was probably screaming her lungs up. Just then... Another black length of wet rope lashed around her free arm, and then the net was jerked some more. Billy started to back up. One by one, all the people disappeared between the fallen shelves toward the entrance to the cellar. Crozer's groceries was finally still. Billy looked around. The car park was empty, and he wondered what he should do. Just then, the electronic doors pinged, and one of the slimy bits of black rope started to creep out into the car park. Billy dragged his bike around and jumped down hard on the pedal. He rode and rode hard. Fuck the shake, fuck the paper run, fuck his pay. He was going home. Abrams watched Decker as he took the call he was waiting on from the Secretary of Defense. The general gathered a few notes and then snatched up the phone, his face grim. The greeting was short and pleasantries near non-existent. Yes, ma'am. Whole towns are now off the grid. Everyone gone. Decker's eyes flicked down to read the reports and then came up to stare into the distance. 
Abrams could see the frustration in the older man by the way his jaws clenched, and answers became shorter and sharper. No, ma'am. No, ma'am. Unlikely, ma'am. No, ma'am. Decker exhaled and turned to shake his head at Abrams. Begging your pardon, ma'am, though we believe these things have a base intelligence, they couldn't give a hoot in hell for negotiation with us. I can't tell you what else they want right now, other than what they're taking, us. It seems we... Decker's fingers tightened on the phone. For meat. They want us as meat, or they want us to become like them. We've shot some of them so full of holes you'd think they were Swiss cheese, but they don't go down. We've burned them, crushed them, and blown them to bits. Then the damned bits just disappear into the ground. We're not sure they were dead even then. Decker closed his eyes. We're still working on that, ma'am. We've got just about every military laboratory involved in weapon research, but so far we have a single one in containment, and the others are evading capture for testing. He moved around his desk and tilted his screen back. He then called up a live feed from the deep containment cells. Abram saw the general's jaws clench and knew the man was feeling the same revulsion and anger that he did when seeing the creature. The cell now looked like the inside of an abattoir, its surface streaked with blood, mucus, and other body fluids torn and spattered from the animals that had been pushed inside. The Shagoth had drawn itself back into the Harry Wilcox shape and stood passively in the center of the room, its wet nakedness incongruous in the red mess of once-living creatures that surrounded it. The thing was a marvel, a perfect copy of the man it had been, except for one thing. Two of its eyes were fixed on the glass panel in front of it, and there was also another eye, perfectly formed on the side of its head, that kept an unblinking watch on the sliding door. Ever hungry, Abrams thought, with a twist of nausea in his belly. Fucking monster, Decker whispered, with enough hate written deep into his features that Abrams bet he wanted to walk in and try and tear the thing to pieces with his bare hands. He pushed the screen away as the Secretary of Defense's voice lifted from the handset once again. That is the only option we think has a chance of success, Decker said, his voice low. We've initiated convoys and airlifts of the Kentucky population. We'll move mountains to get as many men, women, and children out. Decker exhaled slowly. We don't have much time, and that's why I need the presidential authorization. If we're having trouble with things that are only a few times our size, what happens when a monstrosity breaks through that's the size of a mountain? He looked at his watch. We lose Kentucky or we lose the planet in about ten hours. Ma'am, I need the president to approve the B-83 burn now. Abrams leaned in a little closer, but heard nothing. The Secretary of Defense had gone quiet. Finally... There was a few final words spoken, and Decker nodded. Yes, ma'am. I hope it won't come to that either. He hung up and turned to Abrams. She'll seek immediate authorization. However, a coup is being enacted, and I've been requested to join them. Abrams knew what the initiative was. In times of significant threat from any sphere, be that biological, geological, or military, the government must be able to continue to function. COOP was this perpetuation plan and stood for continuity of operations. All senior White House officials and military heads would be gathered in the massive underground city deep within Mount Weather in Virginia. It was basically a hollowed-out mountain, hermetically sealed, and designed to withstand anything nature or humankind could throw at it. Abrams knew, however, that what they were facing was neither natural nor the result of any human endeavor. 
Decker looked up at the toll major. I will refuse the request to join them. Joshua, we need to find something, anything we can use against these goddamn things. The phone buzzed again, and Decker lifted it and barked into the receiver. What? He gritted his teeth and listened for a second, shaking his head. This just keeps getting better. He handed it to Abrams and then walked to the window with his hands clasped behind his back. Major Abrams here. He listened and couldn't help groaning when he heard that the police guard stationed to watch over Adira Sanesh had been found bound and gagged. Thank you. He hung up, and Decker turned to him, his expression flat. She's gone, Abrams said. The general grunted. I don't care. We've got enough on our plates without having to worry about a single Mossad agent on the loose. Decker turned back to the windows. Abrams stood, thinking through what it meant. The woman had been free for hours. What would she do? Where would she go, he wondered. A thought struck him like a thunderbolt, and he snatched up the phone, dialing the front gate. Major Abrams here. Has Professor Kearns left the camp? He closed his eyes, knowing the answer before it was even spoken. God damn it all to hell! He turned to General Decker, who was already watching him from under lowered brows. So, looks like we should care after all, the general said with a humorless smile. Abrams nodded. She's on the road, and I believe she now has Matt Kearns with her. What? Decker's face drained of color. And I think she's going for Drummond. Abrams responded. Not until we've finished with him. Decker's face went a shade redder. Find them. We find her, we find them all. Adira turned from North Street into Willow Lane, one hand on the wheel, the other holding the tracker. She slowed as the device's screen glowed red. Looking up, she saw they were abreast of an old building, incongruously well-kept in the rundown area, fronted by almost church-like black double doors. Adira sat staring for a few seconds and then drove on to the end of the street. She sat holding the wheel, her eyes focused on the horizon as a huge yellow disk was becoming visible. Moonrise, Matt whispered. Then we have little time, she said, and looked back at the black doors. It's dead. Andy was looking out of the back window. There's no one around. Adira turned the car at the end of the lane and pulled in. That two-story brownstone with the double doors, what we seek is in there. Now what? Matt had sunk low in his seat. Now we find a way in. Adira sat forward, looking up at the blacked-out windows, the walls and roofline. No problem. Matt turned from the building to Adira. Really? She sat back and stuffed the tracker into her pocket. Hand me that bag. She pointed at his feet and then checked each of her guns. Matt handed it to her, and she quickly unzipped it, removing two police walkie-talkies. She threw one to Andy in the back and shouldered open her door. I climb up to the roof and find a way in there. No one ever locks rooftop doors or skylights. And then you, Professor, will come in through the front door. Matt jumped when his phone buzzed with an incoming call. Ignore that, Adira said harshly. Matt checked the incoming number. Oh shit, it's Major Abrams. The phone seemed to ring ever more insistently, but Adira glared so hard he almost felt physical heat on his face. He let it go until it gave up. In another second, a text came through, and he read it. He knows you're here. He looked up at Adira. Then we better get moving. Wait at the front door. I'll let you in. 
Hey, what about me? What do I do? Andy asked through the open window. Adira started to cross the street, but turned to lift her walkie-talkie. You, my geologist friend, are the backup. Chapter 21 Abrams had been pissed off that Kearns had not taken his call, but any feelings of hostility or frustration was wiped away by what he looked at in the containment cell. Any feelings other than revulsion, that was. He stood at the thick glass viewing panel and stared in at the thing inside. Beside him, Eric Ford's face, like those of all the other scientists in the room, was drawn with exhaustion. It's quite impervious to projectiles. It's not made up of the same cell structure as we are. Our cells, human cells, as well as most animals, have a membrane as their outer boundary, the cell wall. This wall is surprisingly strong for something so tiny. Basically, they contain something called a cytoskeleton, like scaffolding to maintain the cell's shape. Ford folded his arms. But not this guy. Its cells do not have a cell wall, just a membrane. In fact, it's more like water and mucus than flesh and blood. One minute it can disassemble and then tighten its cells and create a shape like poor old Harry in there, and then the next it can expand to fill the room. He exhaled. Damn tough sons of bitches, too. Abram stepped in closer. Immediately Harry's mouth opened, and what looked like a length of dark, wet rope flew out to strike the window in front of the Major's face. It stuck, the suckers working, puckering and unpuckering. Abrams jerked back. Jesus Christ! Ford nodded. Gotta watch that. It can't break through, but it certainly knows we're here. As Abrams watched in horrified fascination, he saw that the suckers continued working on the glass, little tongues in the center of each that licked at the smooth surface. Surrounding the tiny orifices were hooks that closed like teeth, also scraping at the glass. Abrams grimaced as he imagined what it would be like if one of those things got hold of his skin. Eric, give me something I can work with. If we can't even put a dent in one of them, what can we do against thousands? Ford exhaled, compressing his lips. Bullets just go right through. He paced away from the glass. It shies away from flame, but doesn't really seem to burn, probably because it's coated in some sort of slime, ancient, primordial, and more like something you see coming out of a garden slug. Yeah, well, if it was a freaking garden slug, I'd put my size 12 boot on it, or cover it in salt. Abrams ran a hand up through his sweat-soaked hair. And why is it so goddamn hot in here? It's hot everywhere now. Ford stopped pacing. Hey. His head tilted. What you said. What, the heat? Abrams half turned. No, no. Ford spun back. You know, most gastropod bodies are made up mostly of water, just like this thing. And slugs produce two types of mucus— one is thin and watery, and the other thick and sticky. The thin kind is what it expels for sliding on, but the thick mucus coats the whole body of the slug, again, just like this thing. He began to pace in front of the glass. Harry's eyes followed him, all of them. Ford stopped and looked back at the Shogoth. The other thing we found is that this creature has a weird mineral balance, with the concentration of salts inside its skin almost non-existent, once again similar to a garden slug. The body of a slug has cell membranes designed to keep the nutrients and minerals inside, but which allow water through. He turned to Abrams, his face splitting in a grin. You know why slugs go crazy when you salt them, because the imbalance forces the water inside the gastropod out to try and dilute the salt concentration on its outside. 
The rapid movement of fluid rapidly dehydrates the slug to a point where it simply turns to mush. Salt? Abram stared in at Harry. Well, we've tried everything else. Indeed we have, said Ford. How about a little Trojan horse test first? He turned to one of the scientists, furiously taking notes on a tablet. Neil, prepare a rabbit carcass. Introduce a hundred grams of sodium chloride solution under its skin. The man nodded and hurried away. Ford folded his arms, staring at Harry. Could it be that simple? Abrams joined him. Could we be that lucky? He checked his watch. He remembered Dr. Albadi's warning in Syria about the previous mass extinctions. All major species wiped out, probably eaten alive. The thought that human beings might end up as just another footnote in the fossil record scared the shit out of him. Abrams's attention was drawn back to the glass as a small slot was pulled back at the rear of the room and a rabbit carcass was slid in on a tray. The door slid closed. Nothing appeared to be happening. Harry and the dead rabbit were unmoving at separate ends of the room. Ford nudged Abrams and then pointed to one of the screens that showed an image from the rear of the Harry thing. Look. A single eye formed and then popped open in the back of Harry's head. It moved along the scalp, parting the hair like a small, shiny animal moving through a field of long grass, and then stopped to fix on the rabbit. Immediately, Harry's back burst open. A ragged maw swung wide like a bear trap, and from within it, dark cords fired towards the small, dead body, enveloping it, and snatching it up, and then reeling it back into the huge mouth. The glistening tentacles and the rabbit whipped inside the black hole, which then snapped shut. The savage maw seemed to dissolve back into the body, and in seconds had disappeared without trace. Now, let's see. Ford leaned forward, and Abrams felt his heart rate kick up a notch. Please, please he silently prayed. In another moment, the skin on Harry's face and body blackened, and then his human shape first swelled and then burst open. He continued to balloon in front of their eyes, growing quickly into a massive bulb of glistening black flesh, multiple limbs, eyes, mouths, that issued all manner of screaming, hooting, cawing, and hissing. In another moment, the mangled body of the rabbit was spat onto the floor, and then great gobbets of slimy flesh began to be hived off as the creature tried to expel all traces of the salt that had contaminated the flesh from inside its body. While they watched, Harry's flesh shriveled, blobs dropping from him to hiss and steam on the floor. In a moment they were just puddles of stinking black mess, the hairy thing backed away from them, and in its eyes Abrams was sure he recognized the most basic of human emotions, fear. So you can be hurt, he whispered. He turned to the scientist. Cover that damn thing. I want to see if it can be killed. Ford shook his head. I'm not sure that's a good idea. This is the only creature we've been able to capture— if it's dead, then all our opportunities for study will die with it. Abrams gritted his teeth and slowly turned. I like you, Eric, but tomorrow this time we estimate there could be millions of these things running wild on the planet. And if that's not bad enough, soon their boss will make an appearance, a creature about five miles wide and we have no idea how deep. He stood in front of the scientist. Who knows, when they take over, maybe it'll be you in the containment cell with these things on the outside, experimenting on your body. Abrams stood closer to the man. So kill the fucking thing! That's an order! Ford's head bobbed. Okay, okay, I just... He shook his head. 
Okay, got it. He spun, yelling to his colleagues. I want the gas vents packed with sodium chloride dust. Let's give old Harry here a salt shower. In another few minutes, a powder so fine it could have been missed started to float down onto the top of the creature. If there was a perfect image of hell and madness, then Abrams reckoned the inside of the containment cell over the next five minutes was it. The creature expanded to twice its size, bulges formed, and hundreds of eyes popped open, mouths screamed, and other pustules and protuberances bulged, formed and unformed, as dark fluid sprayed. The Shagoth pounded on the walls and glass, the blows so strong Abrams felt them through the soles of his boots. A huge crack appeared down the center of the many inches thick screen in front of the men, and Ford and Abrams began to step back. In one final act of madness, or perhaps defiance, a huge mouth on the end of a column-thick limb struck the glass and suckered on. Dagger-like teeth dragged down the screen, gouging deep pits into the specially toughened glass. The Shagoth began to shrivel and melt away, steam rising until all that was left was a soup of black primordial ooze. Abrams's fists were bunched and his teeth bared. He turned to Ford, his eyes blazing. Weaponize it! Abrams rushed back to his office and was joined by Hartog in the hallway. Lester! He reached out to shake the big Special Forces soldier's hand. Sorry to pull you back in, but you know what we're up against better than most, and I need experience real close to me right about now. Any time, sir. Hartog fell into step with the Major as he moved quickly along the hall. Abrams turned to him. We've got a weapon against the Shagoth. It works. I've seen it. Let me at it. Hartog's face was grim. What is it? Salt, he shrugged. Plain old table salt. Melts him right away. Hartog half smiled. Sounds too easy. What about the big bastard coming up under our feet? Will it work on that, too? Abrams frowned. Don't know. But anyway, the general's gonna be taking that one head on. However, we need a plan B, and that's what we're about to go looking for. He pushed into his office, pushing the door wide for his lieutenant to follow. By the way, Sanesh is off the leash. She broke out of captivity and either took Matt Kearns hostage or encouraged him to travel with her. Like, who couldn't see that coming? That woman's a tornado. She was always going to break out, Hartog said. Abrams looked away. He'd underestimated her again. Well, we got a visual lead via various CCTV cameras and satellite images. It's being sent to me now. We picked her up as soon as she exited the airport car park. Abrams went behind his desk and sat down. He pushed his screen to the center for Hartog to see and then called up some data packets from their surveillance group. The film started with a view of the airport car park and the woman walking quickly to a small sedan and opening the door. The image jumped from city block to block, the car approaching and driving down various streets until it left the city entirely. The images then switched to the occasional building security feed, traffic camera, and ATM, each one picking up the same car as it sped along the highways. Hartog leaned in. That's Tarver Road. Abrams folded his arms. Yep, just outside of Fort Benning, and where she probably contacted Professor Kearns and the geologist Bennett. Both of them went with her. Hartog nodded. She could have made them go with her if she wanted to. She could have also killed them without blinking. But my bet is she told them something, gave them some news that made them want to go with her. Abrams nodded. That's my assumption. But what could she tell them? Hartog frowned at the screen images. 
She's out of the loop. Unlikely. Abrams pulled in a cheek. Mossad has a powerful network in every country, and she'll have tapped into that. As for what would she tell them, well, we know Matt Kearns is the only one to have read the book, and maybe he still has an attachment to it. Maybe she told him where he can find it. Hartog straightened. She's going after it. And Drummond. Abrams got to his feet. She'll kill him before we have a chance to interrogate him. Damn it, if someone is going to kick that guy's ass, it should be us, especially on our soil. He turned back to the screen. And here's where we pick her up again. Once again, the images of the car jumped from street to street, from corner to corner, sometimes swapping to high altitude as the satellite took over. The car finally entered a small street in Franklin, Kentucky, and then pulled over. Hartog chuckled softly. She's tracking him somehow. Abram smiled tightly. Yep, must have bugged him. Kept that little bit of information from us the whole time. Hartog smiled, his brows raised. She's good. Can't help admiring her. His eyes slid across to Abrams. Wish she was on our side. Abrams spoke through gritted teeth. That's just it. She is. We're all in this shit sandwich together. If that thing breaks through to the surface, then it's the whole goddamn world that'll go to hell. Israel, America, Australia, the whole freaking box and dice. Do we have a team on her? Hartog asked. McAllister is trying to run her down, but he wouldn't know what to look for. And besides, unless they've got shoot-to-kill orders, Adira will ignore them or send them home in body bags. Abrams turned. But I'm sending a team, leading it myself, a small one, one with experience. Hartog smiled and held his arms wide. Ready when you are, and don't forget the salt. Abrams paced while talking into a phone. The Sikorsky S-97 Raider helicopter's rotors were already turning on the tarmac. Hartog was leaning out, watching. The Major disconnected and stood, hands on hips, neck jutting, as he stared at the Weapons Research Division building. In a few more minutes, a jeep sped toward them, cutting across roads and bouncing over green grass slopes as it careened their way. It skidded to a halt, and Ford nearly catapulted out, carrying a steel ammunition box and a duffel bag. Abrams turned to Hartog and waved him over. Ford placed the box and bag on the ground and opened both. Inside were dozens of preloaded clips, knives, and in the large metal box, larger clips for Hartog's HK MP5N assault rifle. The scientist motioned with his hand. Compressed salt rounds. We used calcining lime and clay mixed with water to form a salt-based mortar. It's hard enough to survive as a projectile as it exits the gun barrel, but will break open in the target, delivering the salt packet into whatever you hit. Man, beast, or shagoth. He pointed to the larger clips. Same as the larger rounds, so you got enough for a small war, boys. Ford stood and then shrugged. These are our test batch, and you're our test subjects, our only test subjects. So unless we hear different, we'll be mass-producing them for the troops. Hartog unsheathed the knife and tested its edge against his thumb. It cut, and the seal sucked at the wound. Stings. He smacked his lips. Salty. Nice. Ford smiled. A little something extra if you're in real close. We upped the binding compound, giving the mortar extra strength. Still mostly salt, but it'll cut through flesh and retain its edge. Hartog nodded, resheathed the knife, and then strapped one to his leg. He then took the bag and box to the chopper, 
and Ford stood back and saluted. Good luck, Joshua, he snorted sadly. But frankly, I hope luck is the last thing you need. Abrams shook his hand. Thanks, Eric, he smiled. Hey, it's not every day you get to make war on a god, right? Abrams jumped into the chopper, and it immediately lifted off. He placed the phones over his head and heard Hartog's voice in his ear. What's the plan, boss? Abrams thought through his next steps, and then half turned. This S-97 raider will get us there in a little over an hour. If Sanesh is still out front, we stop them and find out what they know. But if they've gone in, then we go in. I want Drummond. I want the book and I want Matt Kearns. Everyone and everything else is expendable. Hartog nodded. Copy that. He started to slide the spare magazines into pouches on his pant legs and vest, and then handed Abrams a bundle of handgun clips. Abrams looked at them, six with ten rounds in each. He removed his own weapon, a large HK-45C, and ejected the existing clip, sliding in one of the salt-based ones. He slid the rest into the pockets of his Kevlar vest. Sixty shots to save the world, he thought grimly. He pulled his phone out and started to key in rapid words. If Kearns was still in communication, then he needed to listen, and right now. Chapter 22 Matt watched Adira as she calmly disappeared around the block to scale a few fences and then try and make it to the brownstone's roof. From there, she said she'd find a way in and then come down through the building and open the door for him. Simple. He waited for what seemed like ages and then turned and shrugged at Andy, who was sitting so low in the front seat of the car he was now just a hairdo and a pair of eyes floating over the dashboard. Andy held up his hands in a I-don't-know-what's-going-on mime and then pointed at himself. Matt shook his head and waved him down. In turn, Andy shook his head even more forcefully. Matt ground his teeth and waved an arm. Do as you're told, he scowled in return. Matt turned back to the building. She'll skin you alive if you fuck this up, he thought. He liked Andy, but the guy's hormones needed to be recalibrated. So far, he'd made a play for Adira, rebuffed, and then Tanya Kovitz, ignored. He was batting two for none. At least he wasn't a quitter, that's something, Matt guessed. Thinking about Tanya made Matt wonder about how long the military woman had been playing the double game, watching them and informing on them every step of the way. Oh, God, he had slept with her. Not that he'd got much sleep. Hellcat, he remembered. He had kind of liked it at the time, but now that he knew she was just doing it as a job, it made him feel he'd been deluded about his own prowess, so much for his abilities to win her over with his fantastic lovemaking. His face felt hot. He turned his focus back to the doors. He had to wipe his brow. It wasn't just his face feeling hot. The heat seemed to be radiating up from the ground itself. He didn't want to think about what could be causing it. He remembered an old literary quote from his high school days. Hell is empty and all the devils are here. Not quite yet, he hoped. It was taking too long, he thought, and shifted from foot to foot, trying to act casual, standing out the front of a pair of huge double doors in a strange street that was still as death. He started to contemplate edging back to the car, or calling Adira on his phone, or at least texting her to keep the noise down. Just then, one of the huge doors eased open an inch or two, and the stripe of blackness was broken by Adira quickly motioning him inside. Did you, she hushed him, speak quietly or not at all? 
she shut the door, plunging them both into darkness. This way. She grabbed his hand and placed it on her shoulder, and then together they eased forward along a dark hallway. He wondered how she could navigate so easily, and then remembered this was a top female agent in Mossad's Metsadi unit who had to ferret terrorists out of their tunnels as they tried to burrow into Israel. She had vision like a night hawk and was totally devoid of fear. Adira suddenly turned into a room that had a little more light peeking in through slits in heavy drapes. Matt looked around. It was a normal sitting room, with thick, comfortable-looking chairs and sofas, a piano, wooden mantelpiece and wall tables set with vases and candelabras. Is anyone home? I mean, here now? he whispered. She snorted softly. There's dust on the chairs. No one has sat on them or been in this room for many years. This way. She led him into another room that looked like a kitchen pantry. It was fully stocked with tinned and packet food, everything to prepare a meal, but nothing half-opened or used at all. It's like a studio set, a prop, to give the impression of habitation, nothing more. She looked around slowly. No one has lived here for years, if they ever did. Adira crossed to a bench top where a knife block stood and drew out the largest of the carving knives, new, unused, and the blade more than a foot and a half long. It was as much a machete as a carving implement. She held it up, turning it in the air as she examined it, and then looked back at Matt, a humorless smile touching her lips for a second, before she tucked the knife somewhere behind her back. Adira then reached into her pocket and drew out two black flashlights and handed one to Matt. Only use in utmost darkness and point it to the ground, never at me or at my face. She leaned in close to him. Okay, okay, got it. Matt looked around. So where's Drummond? He's not upstairs. There's nothing but dust-covered beds, wardrobes full of clothing, all unworn, bathrooms with untouched soaps in dishes, all as fake as it is down here. He must be somewhere else, and I'm guessing it's the basement. Great. Matt always knew it was going to mean heading deeper. Andy kept his head down, alternately playing a game on his phone and occasionally flicking his eyes up at the black double doors. The windows in the car were down, and he could feel the radiant heat coming in off the road. Twenty minutes back, he had cracked the door and reached out to lay his hand on the asphalt. It was hot, and not just from the day's fallen sun. He would have hated to have to run down the street barefoot. As a geologist, he was intrigued, especially as he knew the area was old, stable, with no volcanic or geothermal activity for millions of years. He tried to get more comfortable, failed, and sat brooding for a while. He wished Frank was here, and immediately felt a knot of regret turn inside him at the realization his old friend was gone for good. He shuddered at the thought of what happened to him, and he prayed that it had been quick. He checked his watch and shifted in his seat again. Over an hour. Time was dragging, and he couldn't shake the feeling he was being watched. He wished he had some field glasses so he could zoom in on the windows at least. Though they were all as black as bottomless pits, he couldn't help the crawling sensation that someone was peering through a crack in the shades, or whatever they had drawn over the panes. Andy's phone pinged with an incoming message. At last, he thought. He flicked off his game and read. It was from Major Joshua Abrams and contained two words. Turn around. Huh? Well, that makes no sense, he thought. Too late, we're already here, big guy. He was wondering whether he should respond 
or maintain Adira's radio silence when his phone pinged again. He read, Look behind you, numbnuts. Andy frowned and swiveled in his seat. Up close to his car, a dark SUV had glided up to within ten feet of him. In the front seat, he saw Abrams and the huge frame of the seal, Hartog. Abrams looked pissed, but Hartog was grinning. Andy waved. Abrams pointed at him and then beckoned. Fuck, what do I do? Andy groaned and gave up. He got slowly from the car and walked casually to Abrams' window. Small world, huh? He grinned, but immediately regretted it. Shut the fuck up. Abrams' voice was like a knife. Where are they? Andy cleared his throat. Uh, you mean Matt? Abrams growled. Get in. Andy slid into the back. What did he have to gain from shielding Adira? And for that matter, why and how else would they have gotten here? He saw the tightness in Abrams' jaw and immediately decided that playing dumb would be plain stupid. Abrams swung in his seat and glared, his eyes drilling right into Andy's soul. Andy cleared his dry throat. Abrams' glare intensified. Andy knew his rights, and he certainly wasn't in the armed forces, so couldn't be ordered around like some wet-behind-the-ears private. But out here, alone in the street, confronted by a furious army major and an enormous special forces soldier, he suddenly felt very vulnerable. And these are the good guys, he reminded himself. Abrams's glare was like an ice pick. Andy gave up and exploded. She came and got us, said that she needed to get the book back. She'd bugged it in Egypt, but never told us. She also said, enough. Abrams' voice was like a punch. Hey, Major, listen, there's no... Son, I have full takedown authorization under the Homeland War Protocols, and right about now I'm getting the urge to execute those orders. You understand what I'm saying? Abrams' red face seemed to extend on his corded neck right into Andy's. Andy nodded. Abrams sat back. Where are they? Andy pointed to the black double doors. They went in there, about an hour twenty ago. Abrams turned and said something to Hartog, who immediately grabbed up a bag with something heavy in it. We're going in, and you're coming. Andy nodded. He had wanted to go in anyway. At least now, he figured, he had two professional bodyguards. Abrams led Andy and Hartog up the few short steps to the door. He lifted an electronic lockpick to the door, inserted the pins, and pressed the trigger. The pins vibrated a second or two, and then Abrams turned the gun. The door opened. He looked back at Hartog, who had the ammunition bag over his shoulder, and his rifle hanging loose at his side. The big man nodded his eyes shining and intense. He was ready. Abrams then looked to Andy, who also nodded, but looked scared shitless. Stay behind us, okay? The geologist nodded again. Abrams eased open the door and went through the gap quickly, followed by Hartog and Andy. He shut the door silently, bringing down a veil of darkness. Abrams switched on a small flashlight, and Hartog flicked on his barrel-mounted beam, and they snaked their way down the corridor. Abrams held up a hand flat, and then stayed still and silent. Hartog and Andy froze, listening to the sounds of the tomb-quiet house. The Major sniffed. Dust, mold, the ocean, maybe. Weird, he thought and so silent like it was soundproofed. He couldn't hear the ticking of a clock, the soft whirring of a refrigerator, or even the sound of wood settling in the old beams or dry wall. It was as if they had stepped into a vacuum. If Adira and Matt were close by, 
they must be concealed. Abrams waved them on, and together they went quickly from room to room, finally coming to a door set into a wall, thick, strong, and ajar. He pushed it half open. There were steps leading down. He turned and raised his eyebrows. Basement? he whispered, and turned back to the door and pushed it wider. A blast of warm air, carrying an odor of mold and something disgusting like bloated bodies covered in fungus, rushed up at him. Jesus Christ! Stinks! Dead fish? Or whale? Andy grimaced and put a hand over his face. Abrams shrugged and then pulled his sidearm. Ready? Hartog nodded. No, Andy said. Abrams went in first. Chapter 23 Matt followed so close behind Adira, he had to keep a hand out so he wouldn't keep bumping into her every time she stopped or slowed. He wished she'd let him use his flashlight more. Just because she had the vision of a cat, he did not. After passing down into and through the empty basement, they had then entered something far more complex than whatever underground storage facility one might expect beneath an old brownstone apartment block. Already they had descended for what Matt felt must have been many stories below the earth, and the temperature rose with every step. Sometimes they had passed through heavy stone corridors, the stone blocks huge, green, and smoothed by untold ages, and at other times they crept between rough-hewn rock walls that looked chiseled by hand. Occasionally there were alcoves holding torches embedded into the wall. None were lit. Once Adira had stepped in to one of them and pressed on the stones with her hand, looking for secret passages. She had dabbed a finger into the extinguished torch and rubbed thumb and forefinger together. This was a light not that long ago. Maybe when Tanya and Drummond came through, Matt responded in a whisper. Yes, I think so. They went down and never came back up, Adira responded. She motioned forward, and once again they continued moving down along the slanting corridor. They next stepped through a large archway with wide-open thick wooden doors and found themselves in a cathedral-sized chamber. The walls were covered in the symbols Matt had seen in the original copy of the Al-Azif, and even now they remained a mystery to him. As he stared at the glyphs, which were all in a reddish-brown paint, he felt the nub of a headache begin to bloom in his skull. It was as if the images alone were like flickering strobe lights acting on some pain center deep within his brain. Adira slowed, and Matt nearly bumped into her. She turned. It's getting hotter, and the smell is stronger. Matt felt the perspiration running down his body, and he'd noticed the same thing. A corrupt, fishy odor permeated the atmosphere, as if they were heading down to some dark beach where the tide was out, and strange, slimy grasses and the bloated bodies of sea creatures had been left to rot under a hot, sunless sky. Look, Adira clicked on her flashlight and pointed it. Matt, relieved to be able to use his light, did the same. There was an altar at the far end of the room, and behind it and around the room's edges, hidden until caught in the glow of the flashlights, were dark alcoves, these ones entrances to more rooms or passages. The entire room had a sense of menace about it, and Matt felt his legs trembling. This place gives me the creeps. Adira's light caught something on the floor. Hmm, not good. Matt frowned and crossed to the glistening fragment. He used his boot to flip it over and immediately recoiled. Gak! He backed away. It was part of a face or skull, an eye socket, eyebrow, and nose. He felt his stomach flip. Is that Tanya? 
He put a forearm over his mouth. Maybe. Adira seemed unfazed by the grotesque body part. She looked up at Matt. If it is, then this is nothing more than leftovers from something's lunch. She stepped over it. Forget it, let's go. But... Matt grimaced, both admiring and fearing the woman. Wait. He stood his ground. Adira, there comes a point where courage starts to cross over into downright stupidity. This is more than we can handle. She stared for a moment and then nodded, her face softening. I'm sorry. I had no right to bring you down here, Professor. This is not a job for a civilian. She smiled sadly. But it is what I do. This is what defines my life. She pointed to the archway. Go back to the car and wait with Andy. I will scout a little more down here, and then I'll come back up and meet you. She stepped closer to him, and Matt could see how her eyes burned with an intensity that he only ever saw in the eyes of elite soldiers on the eve of a mission. She put her hand on his shoulder. Thank you. She went to turn away, but Matt reached out and grabbed her. Wait, wait. He felt almost a physical pain as his conscience wrestled with his innate sense of self-preservation. Forget it. I'll come with you. She held a hand up. No, you are right. You should not be here, and this is bigger than we expected. You need to go up and outside, and then call in Major Joshua Abrams and his team. Tell them what we have found. Tell them to come, and to be ready. She turned and vanished behind the altar without once looking back. Matt shifted his weight from foot to foot. In the end, he looked down once more at the piece of face. The empty, staring eye socket decided for him. I'm out of here. Chapter 24 General Decker looked again at the updated satellite images of the Mammoth Park topology, now from only about 3,000 feet. From this height, that part of Kentucky was usually emerald green. He exhaled, shaking his head. God damn it! The entire area over the National Park was a bilious smudge of black. Not just the dry, ashen cast of forest fire remnants, but a case of some sort of slimy, malignant fungus that had caused everything to rot. Much as he hoped it would all just go away or get better by itself, the evidence was now impossible to ignore. He reached forward and toggled some keys. The satellite images shifted to another spectrum, stratigraphic sonar representations. Cthulhu, it's real. He blew air through his lips. There it was, the deeper smudge now taking on a definite shape. There was a huge central body, like some sort of coiled parasitic worm, except this horror had enormous branching arms reaching out beneath the skin of the planet. And when you break through... He turned away from the screen and looked out at the parade ground, knowing what he needed to do. God help us all. Matt retraced his steps, keeping his flashlight usage to a minimum and cursing softly as he occasionally bumped into a wall or protrusion he hadn't remembered. He felt like a cowardly creep for letting Adira go on by herself. Of course, he knew very well he wasn't equipped to offer her anything other than company, and frankly, calling in backup was the most logical and sensible thing to do. I'm doing the right thing, he whispered. No. I'm a cowardly creep. Matt froze. There was a sound. No, a hint of a sound from up ahead. He flicked off his light and stayed motionless, holding his breath, remaining that way for many seconds, until his head started to pound. 
He eased out the air in his lungs, feeling the blackness fold around him. He suddenly remembered there were things that preferred the dark and saw far better than he in its Stygian deeps. He switched his light back on and looked up, just as something large collided with him, ramming him up against the wall. Clear! The pressure on his neck eased as Hartog stepped back. It's our missing professor! An electric shock of fear had nearly caused Matt to black out, and he had to gulp to pull in air over a galloping heart. Shit! He coughed, and looking up saw Abrams and Andy standing back in the shadows. Their lights came back on as well. Abrams stepped up and grabbed him, one-handed, lifting him slightly. Where the fuck have you been, Kearns, and where's Sinesh? The man's eyes were furious. Matt felt his heartbeat ease. Regardless of the fright they had given him, and Abrams' fury, he was glad they were there. I was coming up. Abrams let him go. Where are Sinesh and Drummond? What have you found? Matt rubbed his neck. I came back to get you, reinforcements. Adira went on to look for Drummond. He remembered the facial fragment. I think we found Tan... He looked quickly at Andy and changed course. Someone, or what was left of them. What? Andy's face contorted. Was it Tanya? Did you see her? No, no, I don't think so. It was only then that he realized that the geologist still held out hope that Tanya was a hostage and not a willing participant in Drummond's plan. Perhaps the fool even had feelings for her that had existed somewhere other than his groin. Matt shook his head and looked to Abrams. The Major understood exactly what Matt had meant. He gripped Matt's arm. Well, Professor, we're your reinforcements. He gave Matt a push. Show us where Captain Sinesh went. Matt walked them back along the passageway that changed to a tunnel, and then to rough-hewn cave and back again, until he found the large cathedral-like room with the altar. He waved them on, making sure to avoid the shard of human being on the floor. Matt saw that Hartog spotted it, but didn't mention it. Instead, the seal nodded his acknowledgement to Matt and held his gun a little tighter. The smell getting stronger, Andy said. The sinkhole in Iowa smelled a bit this way, but this is different too, moldier, stronger. She went through there. Matt pointed past the altar to the dark, curved passageway behind it. Hartog moved quickly around the stone altar and leaned in. He slowly moved the barrel of his gun and light beam in and around the dark hole. He turned and held up his hand. Abrams nodded, and then the seal slipped in. They waited. Andy sidled up to Matt. You think she's dead? I mean, was that her you found? He asked in a stage whisper. Matt shrugged. No, not a hundred percent, but it kind of looked like a woman, sort of. Sort of? What does that even mean, sort of? Andy's voice had gone up a notch, and Abrams briefly looked across to them before going back to work on his comms device. Matt winced. Andy, look. Ah, oh, fuck it, he thought. He's a big boy, and this might get a lot worse yet. Look, you remember Bill Anderson in the wall of the sinkhole? How we only found bits of him? Andy's lips started to curl in distaste. Matt decided to pull back a bit on the details. Well, we found something that might, and I mean might, have belonged to her. She's dead? Fucking hell, Drummond tore her apart? Andy's voice echoed. Matt held up his hands. Andy, we don't know that. Hey! Abrams shushed them as Hartog stepped back into the room. Just more passage, but the decline is increasing to about twenty percent. He looked at a large dial on his opposite wrist. We're already half a mile down. 
Well, we've lost contact now, too deep. Abrams looked at each of them. Looks like we're as good as it gets as far as the cavalry goes. So? He nodded at the dark tunnel. Only way is down. Hartog grinned and headed back into the tunnel. They traveled on ever deeper, once again through tunnels of brick, rock, ancient green stones, some wide, some train tunnel-sized. Abrams stopped to shine his light around at the walls and ceiling. Professor Kearns, the house above us, he frowned as he stared at the tunnel walls. Those old brown stones are usually about a hundred years old, but these tunnels... The house is younger than the tunnels. Andy, what do you think? Huh? What? Andy still looked a little dazed. The rock. He panned his light. The house seems younger than the tunnels. Andy nodded. You got that right. The geology in Kentucky is some of the oldest in the country and dates back to the Ordovician age, about 450 million years. The state was once a warm, shallow sea full of trilobites and cephalopods. Cephalopods, huh? Matt felt ill. Yeah, they're ancient types of octopus things, Andy said, turning back to the walls. I got that, Matt responded weakly. Anyway, Andy continued, to me it's pretty obvious that the tunnels were here first and the house was built over the top of them. This underground structure is old, very old. And it's not easy to work this rock. It's like iron. Matt added his light. And if you're going to work the rock, why create passageways in these shapes? They're not like anything I've ever seen before. Matt pointed to some arches stretching along the tunnel and away into the dark. We make doors and passages based on our physical form, we're upright bipeds. These doorways are wide, bulged in the middle, and enormous. Andy shrugged. There are mansions with big doors and passages. He shone his flashlight down the gloomy passageway. We're down a long way. We need to keep going, Abrams said quietly. This is leading us somewhere, and if Drummond is involved, it might be his home base, so I doubt he'll be by himself. Adira said we needed to be ready, Matt added, looking up at the formidable arches overhead. These structures were built by an advanced race that was here a long time ago. Matt's vision turned inwards as he saw the words, but they were already there. They always would be. The verses tumbled from his mouth, whether he wanted them to or not. They slumber, a race far older than man's first word, in a city more ancient than Lemuria's first brick. The sleepers in the dirt, the burrowers below us all. We who climb down into the depths find not just caverns of wet and slime, but carved faces beautiful in their hideousness, carrying not one visage of mortal man. Pathways spiral ever downward to hopelessness and eternal blackness. There find mighty columns, towering edifices, and streets too wide for a sapien's feet. A primal city long past anything the tiny human mind could comprehend. Abrams exhaled slowly. Streets too wide for a sapien's feet, huh? He grunted. Well then, looks like we must be on the right path. He nodded to Hartog, who had been silently watching the forward and rear passages. The big seal shouldered his weapon and headed off into the dark again. Abrams put his hand on Matt's shoulder. You next, Professor. Andy, you're my rear guard, okay? No problem, the young geologist said, looking nervously over his shoulder. Ever deeper they went, minutes turning into dozens of minutes, into hours, and the passageways turning to tunnels and once again to huge caves. The ancient symbols were always with them, pressed into the stone now and not daubed upon it. 
but carved so cleanly it looked as if they grew from the very rock surrounding them. Their meaning still tugged at Matt's mind, needling his brain, mocking him. At last they came to a split in the tunnel, and Hartog held up a fist. He turned to Abrams. Want me to scout him, boss? Abrams shook his head. Send a pulse. Hartog pulled what looked like a flashlight from a pouch on his thigh and aimed it down the first tunnel. It pinged a few times, and then he read from a small screen on its top. He shook his head. This one? Nothing. No movement and no blockages. Just goes on until the downward curve makes it drop out of sight of the sonar. He moved to the next and did the same. Once again the pings sounded for a moment, until he turned to them and shrugged. Same. We got miles of tunnel and a choice. Toss a coin? Abrams looked down at the floor of the tunnel mouths and clicked his tongue. Ground is too solid for any footprints. He checked his watch. No idea which way they went. We don't have time for dead ends. Then we split up, Andy said. He pointed to the left cave. I'll go down that one. He gave them a crooked smile. I want to get this over with as quickly as possible. We give it twenty and then come back, okay? Abrams cursed and stared off into the blackness of the right-hand tunnel. Matt knew he was weighing his options. There were very few, and the time running out was making wrong decisions costly and potentially deadly, not just for them, but perhaps the entire world. They didn't have a choice. Matt knew Andy was right. I agree. We don't have the time to check them both out. Okay. Andy and Hartog, you take the cave to the left. Professor Kearns and I will do the one on the right. Back here in twenty whether you find something or not. Agreed? Hartog nodded, and he and Abrams synchronized their watches. The seal then waved Andy on, and they vanished into the blackness. Matt looked down into the impenetrable darkness of their chosen tunnel. His cavalry had now shrunk to one man. He took a shuddering breath. Abrams, watching him, said, I know, Professor. Matt. I'd prefer to be anywhere else right now as well. He turned and entered the tunnel. Matt followed. Hartog and Andy moved quickly, the seal traveling fast, almost at a jog, chasing the spot of light emanating from his gun-mounted flash. Andy stayed as close as he could manage, looking back over his shoulder every few seconds. The hair on his neck was on end the whole time. They entered another chamber, and Hartog eased in, walking cautiously for a few paces before he froze and held up his fist. We got company. The words jolted Andy. What? Where? He whispered back, feeling a tingle of fear run up his spine to his scalp. Ten o'clock. Hartog brought the barrel of his gun and light slowly around toward the figure. Andy did the same, and as the illumination crept around the corner of the chamber, he could just make out someone standing about twenty feet to the forward left, up against the wall, back turned to them. Hey! Andy lifted his light a little more. The skin of the figure was milky white and smooth. He raised his light fully onto the figure as Hartog started to crab to the side, gun up. Andy sensed what Hartog was doing and moved to stay in front of him. The body almost shone in the glare of his flashlight. Andy's mouth dropped open. She was naked and beautiful. Tanya, he whispered. He edged forward. Tanya, it's us. I wouldn't recommend that, Mr. Bennett. Please stand aside. Hartog had his light beam on the former captain and was unblinking in his concentration. Captain Kovitz, you will place your hands on your head immediately. He lifted his rifle to sight along the barrel. Help me. 
The voice was barely recognizable. It had come from Tanya, but didn't sound like her. It was as if she was speaking while holding a mouthful of water in her mouth. That's why we're here, to help. Everything's going to be okay. Andy took another few steps and got to within ten feet of her. He held his hand out. It was shaking. He couldn't stop it. It was Tanya, but something deep inside his brain screamed at him to stop and back away. He ignored the little voice in his head and took another step. Tanya, you're safe now. It's me, Andy, Andy Bennett, remember? She turned. Andy sucked in a breath and then smiled, struck by her shameless beauty. Even though he had seen her naked form in his fantasies ever since he first met her, he could never have imagined such perfection. Her breasts were small, high, and firm, her stomach flat, and below that her pubic hair glistened like curls of silk in the beam of his flashlight. He swallowed, feeling slightly aroused even as his heart raced with fear. He turned to Hartog. Lower your weapon. Get that light out of her eyes. Andy moved again to stay in front of Hartog. The seal ignored him, keeping both his light and gun pointed at the woman. Andy saw that her blue eyes seemed darker than normal and that she stared unblinkingly at him. Then it clicked why. Her pupils were fully dilated, even though Hartog's light was aimed directly on them, and she still hadn't blinked. I think she's drugged. Andy took off his shirt and shook it. Let me put this on you. The material was dripping with his perspiration, but he was determined to give her some modesty. She'll thank me for it later, I bet, he thought. Don't! Hartog's voice was loud in the silent room. Mr. Bennett, please move aside, sir. Now! Here. He held out the shirt, anticipating laying it around her shoulders. His fingers trembled as one part of his brain couldn't wait to touch her, and the other screamed at him to flee. Mr. Bennett, something is wrong. I advise you not to move any more. Hartog's voice raised a notch, and he edged in a little closer, the gun up and now pressed hard into his cheek. Andy moved sideways, again staying between the edgy Hartog and Tanya, to avoid a reflex trigger pull making a fatal mistake. Tanya's lips parted. Help me. Her lips hadn't moved to form the words, and once again the sound had a strange bubbling quality. Her mouth didn't close, but now hung open, even wider. Get the fuck out of my way! Hartog's voice was a roar. That's not... Andy leaned forward. Yes, Tanya? A black tendril shot from her open mouth. In the blink of an eye, it flew past him, traveling the fifteen feet across the chamber floor to Hartog and striking him in the chest. Andy's head whipped from Hartog to Tanya and back again. The seal was thrown backward, but not to the ground. Instead, he was suspended in the air, the black pipe having speared him in the chest. His rifle was out of his hands, and Hartog gripped the thing impaling his body, his face contorted in pain. What are you doing? Andy's brow creased in utter confusion, and his mind refused to make sense of what he was seeing. What's happening? He spun back to the woman. Her face was devoid of any emotion or sensation. It was as if she were an unresponsive machine that had somehow speared the seal like a fish and was now reeling him in. Hartog made agonized, gurgling sounds. As Andy watched, the seal dropped one hand to reach for his sidearm and lift it free. Immediately, the glistening tendril in his chest widened. Hartog dropped the gun, throwing his head back in agony. The sickening sound of ribs popping and splintering filled the dark room, even drowning out the seal's grunts of pain. Andy rushed to him, but the man was already gurgling blood. Andy went to take hold of the arm-thick pipe, but saw that Hartog already had his hands wrapped around it, 
and where he had gripped it, the black mass was now spreading over his fingers. Andy's hands hovered, indecision almost causing a short circuit in his mind. Matt! he screamed. Major Abrams! His voice bounced away down the dark passageways without response. He picked up the handgun, ran back, and grabbed at Tanya. She was at least four inches shorter than he was, and he guessed he outweighed her by sixty pounds, but he might as well have been trying to tug on a block of stone. Then he felt the pain. Where his hands grabbed at the woman, there was a burning sensation that felt both hot and toxic, like a marine jellyfish sting. Andy looked at Tanya's face and saw she was still facing Hartog, but grotesquely, one of her beautiful blue eyes had slid around to be positioned where her temple should be, and it was watching him. Andy's heart thumped so hard in his chest it made him feel physically sick. He let her go and backed away, his head shaking. What's happening to you? Another dark tendril of oily-looking flesh shot from a newly opened hole in her belly, this one wrapping around Andy's neck. It tightened immediately. Andy's eyes watered from the pain and the despair. Just then, beautiful Tanya burst apart, revealing the bloated creature inside. Andy's fingers involuntarily tightened, and the gun went off in his hand. The shots and his last screams echoed along the ancient walls. Did you hear something? Matt stopped and half turned. Abrams came back and joined him, tilting his head. It's gone now, Matt said, but it sounded like gunfire. Abrams grimaced. Maybe. He checked his watch. If we head back now, it'll still take us fifteen minutes to reach them. Whatever is happening will be long over by then. Don't worry about it. I trust Hartog. That guy can deal with anything. We've got another few minutes and then we can turn back. One way or the other, we'll find out what the noise was then. He waved Matt on. Come on, let's finish our search and pick up the pace. They marched on, descending another few hundred feet as they went. Around them, they could now hear the shifting and cracking of rock, as though they were moving along some deep fault line, and the heat and humidity became more unbearable with every step they took. Matt laid his hand on the rock wall. This is impossible. The earliest traces of modern man arrived here about thirty thousand years ago but this system looks as old as anything in Egypt or Troy. This shouldn't be here. So who built it? Abrams was shining his light deeper along the tunnel. I think we're about to find out. With his hand, Matt traced some more symbols in the stone. An image flashed into his mind of a dark sea, so still that it could have been black ice, except for the vapors hanging over its warm surface. Without knowing, he had the feeling it was fathomless, but that still, down in that inky liquid, something watched and waited, something far older than humankind or anything else that ever lived on the planet. We're going the right way, he said. How do you know? Abrams asked, turning and shining his light back at Matt's feet so as not to ruin his night vision. Matt stared off into the dark, wondering that himself. I don't know how I know. I just know. Well, might have been nice to make the announcement before we split up. Abrams looked at his watch. Two more minutes. He turned and moved quickly along the edge of the wall, with Matt following. A hint of breeze sprang up, and in another minute it seemed to increase. Something up ahead, I think. Abram started to pick up the pace, and then, in the next moment, he stopped dead, his arms pinwheeling in the air. Matt lunged forward and grabbed him by the collar, holding on. The man's toes were already over the edge of a cliff. He dragged him back, the major falling onto his ass. Jesus Christ! Abrams got to his feet, 
and leaned up against the wall. The path had simply ended, and their tunnel had opened out into a larger cavern. The size was unknown, as their lights couldn't find either the other side, the roof, or coming to the edge again, the bottom. Wow. Matt put a hand over his face. Wafting up from somewhere deep down in the blackness was a foul breeze that once again reminded him of dead fish and bloated drying bodies on a beach. A fucking cliff. Abrams was still shaken, but he came forward and peered over the edge. Hey, thanks, Matt. I knew you'd come in handy. He straightened. I guess this is as far as we go. Matt shook his head. Look over there. Starting beside them and then set in along the wall was a wide pathway carved directly into the stone. It circled along and downward, spiraling along the outside of the enormous vacant space until it disappeared in the dark. The path crossed over in front of other darkened tunnels just like their own, each with the same strange alien shape that Matt had earlier noticed. Abrams reached into a pouch and pulled free a glow stick, cracked it, and then shook it. It phosphoresced a bright lemon yellow, illuminating the entire platform they stood upon. He held it out. Get ready to start counting. He dropped it over the edge. It fell and fell, and eventually struck bottom as a tiny dot. How long? Abrams asked. Eleven seconds, what does that make it? Matt asked. Not too bad, Abrams said. Given things fall about thirty-two feet per second and ignoring wind resistance, I put it at about three fifty feet down. He leaned out even further over the edge and looked down. What the hell? The dot of yellow light was moving. Well, someone is home, Matt said, feeling his stomach flip nervously at the thought of who or what could be down there. Could be Drummond? Or maybe it's Adira, he said hopefully. We should get Hartog and Andy. Abrams nodded. Agreed, at least to see if they found anything. He went to turn away, but stopped. Hang on, looks like we don't have to. He pointed. About two hundred feet down and further along the wall, standing still as a post in one of the cave doorways, stood Andy and Tanya, side by side, entwined and naked. They stared back at them. What the hell is this? Abrams growled in his throat. I thought she was dead. Matt felt confused and recalled the piece of face in the upper tunnel. Maybe it wasn't her. He looked up and snorted. Andy sure didn't waste any time. He waved, but neither Andy nor Tanya returned the gesture. Can they see us? He lowered his arm. If they've found Tanya, maybe she can lead us to Drummond and the book. Where the hell is Hartog? Abrams lifted a small pair of field glasses and focused in on the pair. You know, I've seen something like this before. Andy. Matt only raised his voice above a whisper, but it still bounced around in the huge cavern and should have carried to the geologist. The young man didn't seem to hear, or if he did, didn't acknowledge them. He just stood there hugging Tanya and staring back as though he was a wax dummy. Help me. The words floated up to Matt and Abrams. Matt swung to the major. Did you hear that? That sounded like Tanya. Abrams was frowning as he pulled the glasses away from his face. Oh, no. God, no. Matt started to jog down the path. Hey! Abrams took off after him, keeping close to the wall. Andy and Tanya stood in the cave doorway, waiting. Both had turned to Matt as he approached them along the steps. Matt held his flashlight out, lifting it from the path to the naked pair. He noticed they hugged each other tightly and seemed to glisten in his light beam. 
Matt stopped a dozen feet back, breathing hard. They just stood watching him, or at least facing in his direction. Neither moved a muscle, and he started to feel a slight rise of the hair on the back of his neck. Hey, buddy, how are you? Help me. Matt turned to Tanya. Was that her, he wondered. Though he had been looking at Andy, he hadn't noticed her speak. Her lips were slightly parted, but she could have been catatonic for all the expression she was giving him. Andy, where's Lieutenant Hartog? He took a few more steps. Matt felt a hand ease down on his shoulder, and he nearly leaped off the walkway. Shit. He spun. Are you trying to give me a heart attack? He turned back, shrugging Abrams' hand off. Matt went to step closer when Abrams grabbed him. Don't fucking move. The Major's hand was like a vice. Professor, we need to back up now. Huh? Matt couldn't understand why Abrams wouldn't want to ask them where his seal was. He half turned. But he saw the look on the Major's face. Determination, dread, and worst of all, fear. Abrams' eyes were wide and fixed on Andy. Matt's head spun back, and he moved the beam of his light over the pair. Oh, shit! He saw now what Abrams already knew. The pair weren't just entwined in some sort of lover's embrace, but instead seemed to have melted together. Where their ribs, thighs, and arms touched or overlapped, the flesh had merged, as if the skin, muscle, and bone had melted together like some sort of protoplasmic wax. Oh. Matt took a single step back, just as an explosion of thrashing black tendrils shot from the figure of the geologist. Not just from him, but burst from his face down to his belly button. He opened like a clamshell to disgorge a countless number of the whipping appendages. Matt was covered instantly, and Abrams fell back, holding up an arm that was quickly enveloped in the greasy ropes that had also now shot from Tanya. Matt cried out as his skin burned. The touch of the revolting mass was like a combination of venomous sting and scalding hot oil burn. He could see through the mess that Andy just stood there, arms by his side, face and gut split wide as more and more of the waving arms unloaded. He was a bottomless pit of the stuff. Shugoth! Abram screamed. The tendrils thickened, and then Matt started to feel them begin to work their way into his skin. Beside him, Abrams was almost totally enfolded, and his grunts and strains told him that the Major wasn't going to go down without a fight. More coils wrapped around Matt's neck, and he held tight to one and noticed a bulge form on the limb. The lump then popped open, and Matt was horrified to see it was an eye. The bulb swiveled toward him, regarding him with the pitiless stare of a predator. Just then, there came a staccato burst of gunfire, and the Tanya half simply exploded in a geyser of black jelly. There came more gunfire, and Andy, who had been as immobile as a storefront mannequin, started to shiver and dance as holes appeared all over his naked body. The greasy mesh that covered both Matt and Abrams fell away as another figure stepped out of the tunnel mouth and let loose another burst from her machine gun directly into the rapidly expanding Andy. His human skin split away and he started to rapidly inflate. Dozens of mouths broke open all over the putrid, bloated body, each one screaming in agony. Adira strode toward it, lifted her leg, and kicked what had so recently been Andy Bennett off the ledge. She watched it plummet into the darkness. Her teeth were bared as her eyes followed it all the way to the bottom, where it exploded like a balloon full of toxic fluid. She turned, her face ferocious, and approached Matt and Abrams. She held the gun dead level, its muzzle moving from Matt to the Major. Speak. Abrams held up his hands. Don't shoot, Captain Sinesh. It really is us. 
She turned the muzzle on Matt. You too. Now, quickly. Matt opened his mouth, but no words would come. Instead, there were the whispers, chants, and screams of an ancient race. There were images of burning lands, monstrous beings, and things whose size defied nature and sanity itself. The burning touch of the Shogoth and its intrusion into his system, even only briefly, had united with the traces of the Alazif he had absorbed, and they mushroomed into meaning. Last chance, Adira had moved the gun muzzle to Matt's face. I... Matt got to his knees. I'm okay. His vision cleared. Adira, I'm okay. It's me. She fired. Fuck! Matt grabbed at his head. Blood ran from between his fingers. Okay, it is you. She lowered her gun and held out a hand. You shot me? You fucking shot me? Matt looked at his bloody hand, his mouth hanging open in disbelief. Don't be a baby. It's just a graze. She shrugged. I had to be sure. Beside him, Abrams breathed a sigh of relief and wiped at his face. Matt grabbed the outstretched hand and she pulled him up. Adira then turned to Abrams, who was already on his feet, and now vigorously rubbing his hands over his face. Yuck! The Major spat something onto the ground and then wiped his hands on his pants. There were still glistening snail trails all over his body and in his hair. Matt guessed he looked the same, but it was what was inside him that worried him the most. He winced as he dabbed at the red grays on his cheek. Salt, huh? Adira cradled the gun in her arms. I could smell it in among the nitro discharge. Worked a treat, especially on a few men of the cloth I ran into. Salt, yeah. Abrams ran a hand up through his slick hair. These things are closer to slugs than animals, so salt turns them to mush. He looked back at her. Hartog? Dead, she said evenly. I came across what was left of him in the cavern. She motioned to the cliff edge. Captain Kovitz there, or what she had become, was waiting for you, Professor. Seems you're more a threat than they thought. Poor Andy was just another way to get close to you. They obviously didn't need Hartog, so consumed most of him. She handed Matt a sidearm, and only then did he notice she had strapped on the man's knives, which were now hanging on her belt with her own guns. Her pockets bulged, and reaching in, she pulled an extra magazine and handed it to him. You got twenty shots, Choose your targets carefully. We've got a long way to go. Abrams looked over the edge. You've been down there? She walked to the edge of the walkway. She seemed to have no fear of the height. Only part way. There are things down there. More like Andy and Tanya, but I saw other creatures even worse. She turned to Abrams and lifted her gun. Let's hope they're also like slugs. She looked down. In my years, many people have told me to go to hell. She stepped back from the edge. And now I do. General Decker put the phone down and sucked in a deep breath, his chest swelling in his uniform. He held it for a second or two and then eased it out before turning to the room. Most of his forward command was assembled, waiting on his instructions. Decker was now in charge, and his reporting line was to the commander-in-chief, the president, and only the president. The fate of the country was now in his hands. That was the president of the United States. By executive order, we have been given the green light. God bless America. There was a round of applause. Decker lifted the phone again. It went straight through to Bomber Command. Executive Order, Fox Delta Orion Victor, 
9937219. We have green light. He placed the phone back on its cradle and then switched on a large monitor on his wall. It showed a view from an Air Force control tower and a colossal plane beginning to move slowly down a runway. Decker felt his heart swell with pride at the sight of the massive bombing arsenal, the B-52 Strata Fortress. The winged monster weighed nearly half a million pounds and could deliver its payload from 50,000 feet, which was just as well as conservative estimates were that the 20-megaton bomb would produce a cloud to 48,000 feet with a significant EM pulse. Two F-22 Raptors would accompany the bomber to the drop zone to ensure air superiority over a clear flight path. Nothing would be allowed to get in the way of the Flying Fortress's mission. The Raptors would peel away before the drop and rely on their 1.82 Mach speed to get them well away from the magnetic disturbance or radioactive corruption. At least that was the plan. Both pilots were volunteers and knew the risks. Decker was already counting down the seconds. It would take them thirty minutes to reach the drop site. Lock and load, as they say. He sat down, his hands unconsciously crushing into fists. The men and women behind him, the noise, the heat, all of it, meant nothing compared to that plane and its destination. Abrams stopped and peered over the edge of the path. They had been winding around the outside of the pit, moving quickly and descending ever lower. Many smaller tunnels finished at their path, and though they were empty, Abrams had the impression that someone or something lurked back in the darkness. He could have thrown another of his glow sticks into any of them, but the truth was, if they were being left alone, then he'd leave them alone. Still, the skin on his neck crawled with warnings as they went past every one of them. He looked down at his watch once again and grunted. It's time. If General Decker has received approval, then he'll be on his bombing run. Matt stopped and stared for a moment, but then just nodded. Good. Adira scanned the pit's bottom and then half-turned. If everything is obliterated, then we won't care any more. Until then, we go on. Chapter 25 The raptors flew over the drop site, taking several images and then peeling away, stepping on the gas and leaving nothing but vapor trails. Decker looked at the aerial shots as they appeared on his screen. The slimy mess that had been the verdant Mammoth National Park was now like an anthill, crawling with the amoebic Shogoth monstrosities. The general ground his teeth, feeling an almost physical pain as he saw the lines of people being led into the holes in the ground. He couldn't save them. They didn't yet have enough ammunition to mount a successful ground operation against the Shogoth. These people were already lost, all he could do was stop them from suffering. I'm sorry, he whispered as he got slowly to his feet. Then his jaws clenched. But I promise every one of you that you will have your vengeance. Counting down to drop, the laconic voice of the pilot of the Strato Fortress came in as he began his final run. Five, four, three, two... One, payload away, returning to base. The aerial shot was taken from maximum height, where the National Park was just a field of green, with a black smudge as a target in the distance. With a drop from 50,000 feet, the amount of forward movement of the bomb would ensure it traveled many miles before reaching its mark. Military technology allowed a calculated precision that would mean a strike within a dozen feet of what they wanted to hit. The big plane turned like a super tanker in the air and started to wing away. It would take several minutes for the bomb to detonate, as it was designed to be the biggest bunker buster in the history of mankind. 
Its goal was to penetrate deep into the bowels of the massive monstrosity making its way to the surface. Decker held his breath. Detonation. The rear cameras of the plane whited out and they lost their images. It was just as well as no human eye could withstand the white-hot heart of nuclear detonation. He turned to look at the feed from the banks of seismometers dotted throughout the state to detect earth movement. The lines measuring the seismic waves barely registered anything above a normal background range. What the hell? Decker frowned. He had expected the machines to scribble widely as they either registered the massive hammer blow to the earth or the sensors were destroyed. The digital feeds registered neither result. What's going on here? What just happened? He turned to the room and was met with confused stares. God damn it, give me the Vela feed now! Decker's screen flipped to high altitude images from the satellite, and he drilled down to the black stain over the Kentucky landscape. He had expected to see a towering mushroom cloud of heat and the debris of the earth the burrower beneath, and vaporized human souls rising into the atmosphere. There should have also been a massive shock wave obliterating everything in a giant ring growing out from the detonation point. Decker knew that a nuclear detonation of that size would have achieved temperatures of around 180 million degrees, about ten times that of the surface of the sun. Everything should have been slag. Ground Zero, the melt zone, should be nothing but a crater like something only seen on another world. But instead, it was as before. Decker leaned forward, squinting. Not quite. The ground moved and heaved, like a monstrous blanket stirring with a waking sleeper beneath. Did we not get burn? He spun left and right. Well, talk to me. A military technician at another bank of screens shook his head. No, it detonated. It just... He stood back. I don't know, but the device definitely triggered. Jesus Christ! Decker felt like his head was going to explode. Give me the Vela feed from the time of the drop. Back it up. In a few seconds, the data froze and then swapped back to a silent view from space. A timer at the bottom of the screen counted down from the bomb release until it reached zero, impact. The digital counter continued, but this time it measured progress as the massive B-83 bunker buster drilled its way down through the rock and soil. But just when it was milliseconds away from its target depth, the ground below it appeared to open. There was a surge as something huge, grotesquely blossomed like a gargantuan tentacled flower, and then the counter stopped. There was an orange glow, and the oily smudge of the underground monster visibly swelled, but then nothing. Decker fell back heavily into his chair. It swallowed it. He leaned forward and clawed his fingers up through his hair. He looked up into the screen, now back to real time, and his mouth dropped open. Oh, God, no! As he watched, the earth became a window into hell. The massive stain was still there, closer and now with substance. A miles-wide head could be made out, and surrounding it, titanic arms that moved beneath a surface that was still, as yet, unbroken. But what horrified Decker the most was the giant single eye the size of a city block. General Decker opened his mouth, ready to issue his next orders. Instead, he stayed silent, his mouth hanging open for several seconds. He slowly closed it. He had no more options. Chapter 26 Adira was first down at the base of the enormous pit. With the small lights they each had, there was no way to really judge its size. They could only estimate based on the winding stone steps they had come down. 
About a hundred feet away, there was the faint shine of the dying glow stick. Its lemon yellow was incongruous on the black stones of the cavern floor. Matt took a single step before a muffled boom, like the beating of a titan's drum, thundered down through the huge cave. He, Adira, and Abrams were thrown flat to the ground as car-sized boulders hit the stone floor around them, followed by showers of dust and debris. The tumultuous echoes pounded away into the deeper tunnels, and the trio stayed down, hugging the stone floor. Abrams was up first, then Matt on one knee first, before getting warily to his feet. He dusted himself down. We're still here. He looked confused. The detonation was a long way away, but still we shouldn't be. And if we're still here, Adira stayed down, then so is our problem. Abrams coughed as the rock dust created a fog of fine silica particles that floated in the beam of their lights. He looked down at Adira, still prone on the stones, one side of her face pressed to the floor. Must have only been a partial detonation. You okay? She shushed him and held up a palm to them. Both men froze, waiting. She sprung to her feet and wiped her face. The floor. It's hot. Very hot. She wiped her cheek again. And there's movement below us, grinding and sliding, like something heavy being dragged across rocks. Must be the deeper effects of the nuke. Abrams shook his head. Can't be Cthulhu. We're miles away from Mammoth Park. We don't know that, Matt said. We have no idea what the true physical form of this thing really is. Sure, we're a long way from where we think it will emerge, but for all we know, this thing stretches below the earth like some sort of giant worm and spreads for miles, hundreds of miles. Matt shut his eyes. And the Leviathan that is Cthulhu, the oldest of the old ones, will rise. The earth will crush, and the seas drain as the flesh of mortal beasts will be but paste for its bowels. What the hell was that? Abrams asked, reaching out to steady Matt, who was about to topple over. Was that in the book? Yes and no. I mean, it was in the book all the time. I just didn't know it because I couldn't read it, Matt said, steadying himself. The symbols. Now you can read the symbols, Adira said. Matt nodded. I think so. Now you get it? Abrams asked incredulously. Must have been the Shogoth's touch. He looked across at them. I can feel it now. The celestial convergence is like waves of energy pulling at everything on the planet, drawing these things from below the earth. It's all focused on this place, right here, right now. Matt pointed. We need to go lower and find the gates, and then find the book. The answers must be hidden in its pages. I must see them again. I thought you didn't need it, Adira asked. The symbols, I didn't read them all. I skipped most of them. I couldn't understand them, so they were useless to me. That was then. It's like some sort of Rosetta Stone, converting the language of the old ones into a physical form. These things respond to sound, and the words, when spoken, create that sound. The celestial speech? The language of the gods? Abrams asked. Not of our god. This is what Abdul al-Hazred found out. He also managed to decipher the words. There are the words of worship that smooth its path and let it know that now is the right time for it to rise and feed again. There are also mystical locks and words are the keys. Matt wiped at his brow feeling like he had a fever coming on. There must also be words that do the opposite. Tell it that it's not time. They must be there. And these words can send it back, Adira asked. I don't know for sure, but if it can be called, then it can somehow be denied. Al-Hazred must have said something to stop Cthulhu rising. Matt grimaced. 
But by now we might be too late to send it back. It has almost broken through, and once it does, then it's all over for us. Abrams raised his gun, ejecting the clip, checking it, and then smacking it back in before reholstering. If the book can help, then let's go get it. Wait. Matt felt more images slide greasily into his mind. Drummond is waiting for us, and he's not alone. As far as I'm concerned, Drummond is just another slug. Adira looked along the barrel of the HK MP5N, as though lining the businessman up in her sights. She pointed. That way. The light from Hartog's barrel-mounted flashlight illuminated huge glyphs carved into the curved stone lintel of a train tunnel-sized archway. Adira lowered her gun and looked to Matt. What does it say? I am forever, Matt snorted. Worship me. Not fucking likely, Abrams said. Adira smiled humorlessly. Hmm, vanity. A mortal weakness we perhaps can use. She headed for the tunnel, gun held loosely in her arms, her finger on the trigger. Let us meet these vain gods and introduce ourselves. She turned to Abrams, her face severe. But remember, Charles Drummond is mine. Chapter 27 Captain Jerry Henson looked up at the sky, feeling tears dry on his cheeks. The moon, huge and yellow, had risen, and was only a few hours from reaching its zenith. The darkness and the pull of the celestial convergence were reshaping the world. Tides were lower than they'd ever been, the ground was hot to walk upon, the air smelled weird, and there was a gentle tug he could feel at his metal fillings, and even on the bones in his body. It all felt wrong. He looked along the dark street. It was all so quiet now. The initial wave of panic had overwhelmed police stations, councils, hospitals, and anywhere else that could possibly provide protection or refuge. But there was no such thing anymore. People had initially fought back, but their bravery was rewarded by them simply vanishing. They'd left, then, by road, sea, on foot, but only ended up being trapped in long lines of stalled traffic or in their march to safe havens, encountering people coming the other way. Those who were stuck outside at night just proved easy pickings for the things that now owned the darkness. There were few people on the streets, and those who remained huddled inside their houses were locked in rooms, basements, or even garages. But these refuges were not secure, because the things that boiled up from every subway, drain, or cellar were able to reach in under locked doors and even thread themselves through keyholes. The army had deployed, and those that had only been issued standard ammunition managed to keep the Shogoth at bay for a few minutes at best, before they too were overwhelmed and either eaten or converted to become the next lump of amoebic flesh to terrorize the neighborhood. As a final insult to the human race, men, women, and children were now being herded together, guarded by rings of the massive blobs of protoplasmic flesh. And herded was the appropriate term. Captain Henson had dated a cattle farmer's daughter when he was in high school, and one weekend he had visited her family's ranch in the holidays. This is what the people gathered there reminded him of. Cattle in pens, awaiting shipment to the abattoir. Henson's squad were some of the lucky ones. They had taken delivery of the compacted salt ordnance. The hardened salt rounds worked a treat, clearing the disgusting creatures from their path. Those that were too slow and took a hit either exploded or melted away, leaving nothing but foul-smelling black puddles of goo. They'd freed hundreds of people, and many were now being led back to secure camps. 
but in their eyes was shock and horror. As in all of the guarded fields Henson and his squad came across, the people inside this ring of monsters were listless and resigned to their fate. They had obviously seen what happened to those who tried to rebel or escape. He knew what would happen as well. He'd seen it with his own eyes, the horror of the things feeding. Henson wiped his eyes and held up a fist to signal the next move to his soldiers. For every ten souls they freed, there were thousands more being consumed or led down into the bowels of the earth to suffer whatever fate these monstrosities from hell had in store for them. Adira held up her hand, causing the small group to halt. You hear that? Smell it? For the last few minutes, water lapping, Abram sniffed deeply. Salt water. But we're miles from the ocean. Miles from any ocean that we know of, Matt said. Up ahead, he saw that the tunnel looked different. Wait here. He approached slowly. What is it? Adira lifted her gun. The air shimmered in front of him, like a curtain hanging across the passageway. He held out his hand. His fingertips touched the wall of distortion and passed through it. The air swirled around his fingertips as if it was a sheet of floating oil. He pulled his hand back, looking at his fingers, rubbing them together. There was nothing on them. Matt leaned forward, pushing his face into the swirling wall. Beyond, he saw a watery landscape with a twilight atmosphere. He pulled back, shaking his head. In there is not, uh, here anymore. He stepped back. In there is not really our world at all. It is some other place, perhaps another dimension entirely. He stared at the shimmering barrier, but his vision was turned inward as his mind worked. I think this is why these things can exist below the earth, but not be found. That world, their world, is beyond the physical, and maybe partway between here and some sort of metaphysical existence, what some would call the beyond. He turned and what others would call hell. You mean it's always been here below this building? Abrams asked. No, no. I think this place that Cthulhu comes from has always been in the same place, but the entrance is different. This time it's America, last time it was the Middle East. It might even open below the ocean. It's the planetary lineup, the convergence, isn't it? Abrams asked. Yes, this place only exists in our imagination or race memory until it wants to be seen. Matt nodded. The convergence is the catalyst, like a chronological lock and key that lines up a maze so we can enter. So the gateway only exists while the convergence is taking place. What happens when this convergence, the planetary lineup, starts to break away? Matt smiled without humor. Then I think whatever happens, we need to be in and out before the convergence concludes, or we could be trapped in there forever. Then what are we waiting for? Adira stepped through. Matt grinned and shook his head at the woman. Sure, after you, shrinking violet. Abrams was next through the shimmering curtain. Matt briefly looked over his shoulder and then followed. Matt almost fell to his knees from the heat. While it had been extremely warm and humid as they descended the pit, beyond the shimmering border it was like an oven. Oh, God! Matt pushed his hair back off his face. It's got to be 120 degrees in here. Together they stood on the shore of a dark beach under a sky of blackness, it was impossible to tell whether there was a cavern roof overhead or if they had instead crossed over into another dimension that had a starless sky stretching away into infinity. There was a body of water before them. 
Its far edges were hidden in darkness, so any other landfall could not be made out. Abram stood with his hands on his hips. Lake or ocean? Matt walked a few paces towards the water. Whatever it is, it's extremely salty. I can smell it. The surface of the oily water was only at times still. At other times, the surface bubbled and rose as small waves lumped up from hidden things that moved beneath its surface. Far out from the shore, perhaps at its center, the water, or whatever it was, rose in a huge column many miles wide and disappeared into the air. It twisted and pulsed with a strange life. Matt turned to look along the cliff walls surrounding them. In the far distance, he could see multicolored waterfalls emptying from many caves on the cliff walls for as far as he could make out. There could have been hundreds of them emptying into the dark water. Matt frowned. Can anyone else hear that? Weird sounds like howling wind or... Voices? He turned slowly. The voices of the damned in hell. Abrams nodded. I hear it. Yeah, like wind blowing, but there's not a breath of it down here. He panned slowly. I have no idea what it could be. Shit! Adira jumped aside and pointed her rifle at the ground. What looked like a long-legged trilobite had lifted itself from the cold, dark sand and proceeded to scuttle toward the water. Just like in the terrorists' camp, Matt said. The thing only managed to wade in about a foot before something rose up from out of the depths and using a long talon speared it and then silently pulled it back out into deeper water. Jesus! Matt backed away from the water. You're right. This is not our world anymore, Adira said softly. Abram switched off his flashlight. Save your lights. There's enough illumination for us to see. He swiveled. Nothing. No plants, no mosses, nothing growing at all. Adira snorted. You must have missed that thing in the water. No, I mean there's nothing as the basis of the food chain. No sun, so no life should be able to exist, Abrams responded. I wish that were true, Matt said. There are other forms of energy that can cause life to spring up. Deep-sea thermal vents are one. We have no idea exactly what's below that water. And I, for one, have no interest in finding out, Adira added. Me either. Matt pointed into the distance. We need to go there, close to the first waterfall. I think that could be a structure. He frowned, trying to understand the weird fluid in the falls. There was a constant stream falling from the caves to splash into the dark water beside the massive barriers. The sea boiled and frothed as it was struck. Abrams lifted his compact field glasses. Well, I'll be damned. Looks like doors. They walked quickly, their feet sinking into the dark granules. As they neared, they could see now that set into the cliff wall stood a massive pair of red granite gates. Each of the doors would have towered half a mile in height and twice that across. Matt stopped. Gates of red granite so huge they could hold back an army. Remember Alhazred's poem. There were raised glyphs carved into their mighty edifices. It was all true. They could just make out a pinprick of light at the base of the portal. That light. It's got to be Drummond, Matt said. He's waiting for us. Abrams lifted field glasses to his eyes again. If he's expecting us, he'll be ready for us. Adira added. Can you see anything? Matt asked. No, no movement. Abrams responded evenly and turned just as beside them the sea thrashed. Something heavy rose and fell back below the surface. 
Matt had the impression of a whale breaching and then dropping back, but doubted it would have been anything as benign as one of the giant sea mammals. Cautious now, they edged along the rock face bordering the sea. Sometimes there were expanses of sand, and others the beach nearly disappeared entirely, forcing them to walk within inches of the inky water. Together they moved in a crouch, shoulders hunched, as if expecting something to land upon them at any moment. As they hurried forward, Matt was sure he felt things shifting beneath his feet. He ignored it, hoping it was nothing more than movement in the silky grains. We've got company, Adira said matter-of-factly. Where? Abrams had his gun in a two-handed grip and had it pointed at the water and then spun to aim it behind them. I've got nothing back here. It's not up here. It's below us, keeping pace with us under the sand. Adira was keeping the barrel of her gun pointed at the ground. Under us? Matt asked the question, but he already believed her. He also had his gun ready, and now pointed down at the sand. He had felt something under his feet before, and now when he concentrated, he was certain he could still feel some sort of muscular contractions going on. It was as if something was sliding, lengthening and contracting, worm-like below him, and he didn't think there was just one of them. As from a signal given, more of the long-legged trilobites lifted from the sand and started scuttling toward the dark water. Whatever Adira, Matt, and Abrams could feel, the bugs also sensed, and it seemed they were smart enough to get the hell out of there. Matt spun at a soft, sticky sound behind him. He was in time to see something rise from the dark sand like a weird plant. It bloomed, opening a bulb-like end. There were no eyes or any sensory organs he could see, just a puckered hole that was tightly closed. Adira fired a quick burst at the thing, and as if on a spring, it was quickly pulled back beneath the ground. The same sound came again, repeated from a different position, and more of the worm-like stalks rose slowly around them, like dark blooms opening to an invisible sun, the petals shivering as if tasting the air. In front of one of the worm flowers, a slow trilobite moved quickly around the small forest of stalks. The blue men slammed down on its back like a hand and stuck there. Then the hapless creature was dragged, mewling, below the ground. Shit! Abrams fired on a few of them, but whether he hit them or not wasn't clear, as they disappeared so quickly it was hard to tell if there was any damage. More of the creatures rose to take their place. Save your ammunition, Adira said, while keeping her gun up. Like rippling waves, Matt saw that the sand was lumping and rolling toward them. They were attracting more and more of the creatures. He turned to Adira. There are too many of them, and more are coming. We need to be away from here. When he turned back, it was to stare directly into the face, if that's what it was, of one of the muscular, segmented worms. Once again it bloomed open, the edges of its petals shivering slightly. The puckered hole opened inches from Matt's nose, and he saw rows of tiny, needle-sharp teeth, all pointed inward and disappearing down into its throat. This was a mouth designed for gripping and holding on, something Matt had no intention of experiencing. He fired point-blank. He hit it. He had to have at that range. But the thing still shot forward and momentarily gripped his shoulder. The pain was excruciating. He punched at it and tugged, but the neck was like a cross between leather and rubber, giving a little but not breaking away. It suddenly let go and withdrew below the soil, taking with it a small chunk of his flesh. Ah, fuck it! Matt gripped his upper arm, dripping blood onto the sand. The effect was instantaneous. The ground began to boil beneath him. Run! Adira charged, putting her shoulder into him, to barge Matt forward. 
She aimed her gun down at the sand and loosed a dozen rounds into the agitated surface at their feet. She then turned and aimed at a few of the trilobites, still making their way back to the water, and fired again, killing some and injuring several, who bucked and flipped on the dark grains. The movement was enough to attract the worm-like predators. Adira ran hard, dragging Matt along with her. Abrams followed, turning to fire back at the feeding frenzy, and yelling over his shoulder as he pulled the trigger, This place is a nightmare! And it will be like this on the Earth's surface for the next few thousand years, unless we send this thing back. As they neared the speck of light, the water beside them at first smoothed and then lumped again. Not just in one or two places, but the entire surface became uneven, as if there was something under the water that couldn't break through. Matt felt his heart race. I don't like the look of this. Forget it, Abrams yelled. Unless whatever that is comes out, it's not our problem. The Major caught up with Matt, shielding him on the water side, with Adira on the other. They slowed when the small fire was in sight. I don't understand. The Red Gates should be open if Cthulhu is free. It doesn't make sense. Matt turned one way and then the other. There was still no one at the fire. He stopped. For the first time, he could hear clearly the noise of the waterfall. Underlying the constant splash of liquid was another sound. Matt frowned as he concentrated. He stared for a moment and then backed up a step. Don't stop. What is it? What do you see? Abram stopped with him, looking around. Give me your field glasses. Matt held out his hand, dread in his gut. Abrams handed them over, and then he and Adira kept watch for any danger while Matt lifted them to his eyes. It was as he imagined. No, it was worse than he imagined. The sound they could hear, it wasn't just some strange noise caused by rushing water or air movement against deep cavern walls. Instead, it was wailing, crying, screams of horror, terror anguish and hopelessness. The waterfall wasn't water at all. It was thousands of tumbling bodies, people, falling through space. Cries of the damned. Matt lowered the glasses. When the Shagoth have been hurting the people below ground, this is where they have been bringing them. He felt sick to the stomach. A living cascade of people voicing their last screams as they jumped or were pushed from the rim of the giant cave mouth about half a mile up on the cliff wall face. Matt could see that there were hundreds of these falls, and he followed the stream of people from one of them down to where they fell to the dark water and where the thrashing was occurring. Whatever was in that dark ocean was either consuming them or converting them as no heads bobbed back to the surface. Instead, they were totally swallowed up and disappeared. But maybe only vanishing as what they once were, the lumps Matt had seen before. They couldn't have been just some freak phenomenon. The dark ocean was coated in protrusions like dark boils, trying to burst free. There were thousands of them, hundreds of thousands. Perhaps they would soon be newly birthed as Shagoths. It's people. Matt said softly. Adira and Abram stared. Not an ocean, Matt staggered back, and not water at all. That dark mass is part of Cthulhu itself. Matt felt tears of futility on his cheeks. Perhaps the Shagoths, monstrous things to us, were just like some sort of tiny symbiote that existed upon the great old one. As it woke, so did they, dropping from its huge body like some sort of horrifying lice. He felt a building rage in his gut. A nightmare. He looked up at Abrams and wiped his face. No, this truly is hell. 
Adira made a noise deep in her throat that sounded like a growl. I have heard men and women die before. This is what it sounds like. She turned away from the stream of humans falling to their death. Don't look at it. We cannot save them, but perhaps we can stop many more suffering the same fate. Let us finish what we started. But Matt couldn't tear his eyes away. The people, human beings, the rulers of the world, reduced to little more than a stream of meat for some near-immortal beast that lived in this underworld. As he watched, he could make out strange creatures, like a cross between lizards and spiders, dotted with bulging eyes, enormous in size, crawling along the sheer rock face and letting long tongues unfurl, dipping them into the falling mass of humanity to lick up some of the bodies and then scuttle back to cling to the rock and digest their easy prize. Matt felt the victim's hopelessness and would have cried out in despair himself, but he felt a strong tug at his arm and so shook his head to clear away the dark thoughts. Adira was right. It was too late now for these people. The doors... Adira motioned to the massive red granite gates. At their base, four figures now stood. One was unmistakably Charles Drummond. A second was easily a foot taller, with a cowl pulled over its head. And before them was what looked to be a pair of children. Come, here is where we settle this. Adira ran toward the odd group, Matt and Abrams following. The dark sand made a dry squeaking beneath their feet, and Matt breathed hard, working overtime to try and shut out the cacophony of tormented wails that surrounded them. Abrams had his gun up, and Adira had the muzzle of her assault rifle pointed dead center at Drummond as they came to within fifty feet of the foursome. Matt still couldn't make out who or what it was with the cowl up over its head, but the smaller figures were unmistakably girls, no more than ten or eleven, perhaps even twins. They wore matching dirty pajamas and clung to each other, their faces streaked with tears and their garments with blood. Drummond held up a hand. Welcome! He flashed his luminescent smile. Professor Matthew Kearns, Major Joshua Abrams, and, of course, the warrior woman, Captain Adira Senesh. I'm so glad you could all make it this far. Adira and Abrams spread to either side of the figures. Matt saw the girl's eyes light up, perhaps with something like hope. One mouthed a word to him. Help. Matt stayed stony-faced. He'd heard that plea before, and it hadn't been from a human. Drummond waved an arm around. Don't be so gloomy. Yes, it is hot, and yes, it is dark, and sure, it's very noisy. He grinned. But these are all small prices to pay to be witness to a new dawn, or perhaps a very ancient one. Cthulhu rises, the great old one. His physical form is taking shape as we speak. At the peak of the planetary alignment... His physical form will combine with his spiritual essence, and then a page will be turned on this world. Drummond smiled apologetically. Humankind's turn is over, he shrugged. And as well as the human sheep, so will go the real sheep, and the cattle, elephants, whales, and just about anything that proves a good meal. His smile widened. Aren't you forgetting something? Matt asked. You're one of the sheep. What do you think you'll get out of this? You'll be president, king, is that right? That's your plan to be king of a graveyard? Drummond's smile never faltered. Better to rule in hell than to serve in heaven. Isn't that how the saying goes? Who the fuck is that? Abrams pointed his gun at the huge figure in the cowl. Drummond looked at the tall being beside him, and then to Abrams. 
Please, show some respect. This is the father. He is the gatekeeper and a personal attendant to the great old one. Some courtesy and deference is in order. How about we show our respect by putting some holes in him? Adira raised her gun. Drummond reached across and dragged one of the girls in front of himself. Careful you don't hit these little beauties. He stroked the hair of one of them. I chose them myself. They were going to be a delicacy for the father here, but I thought they might come in handy during our discussions. You want to negotiate? Matt said. His head throbbed, and he couldn't take his eyes off the tall being beside Drummond. He knew it watched him back just as intently. Negotiate? Does the plankton negotiate with the whale? He shook his head. You're already dead and just don't know it. He grabbed the collar of one of the girls and shook her roughly, causing her to scream and dance like a puppet in his hands. She cried and covered her face. Her sister reached out to her, clinging on, and was also shaken. But if you really want to play a game for the last few minutes of your lives, then so be it. Let's see. Hmm, you can have one of the girls if you give up your guns. He waited a few seconds, and then shook the child even harder. Come on, throw them down. It's a good deal, flesh for steel. Both girls, Matt said evenly. Ah, well, for both, I'll want something else. I want one of you. He looked directly at Matt. You. Matt felt his legs go weak. Abram shook his head. Nope. It's me or nothing. Drummond grinned. Ah, the sacrifice of the soldier patriot. He looked across to the tall figure. No words passed between them, but Matt knew they spoke just the same. Drummond shrugged. Okay, we'll play, for now. After all, we'll be having all of you soon anyway. Abrams looked at Adira, who shook her head. Her gun muzzle drifted across to the tall figure and then traveled down to the girls. Why would we want a pair of your disgusting shogoths? We've already had the pleasure of their company. Adira's eyes carried a challenge. I killed them both. Drummond's head rocked back and he roared with laughter. Oh, you mean Tanya? He laughed even harder and then he wiped his eyes. Put on a bit of weight, didn't she? He grinned again. She was a good soldier, enlisted Mr. Andy Bennett. But you know that now. Drummond's mouth curled in a delighted smile. I assure you, these two are still human. From behind him, the tall figure lifted a hand and ran a talon down the cheek of one of the girls, who screamed in pain and fright. Blood dripped to her chin. Shogoth, don't bleed, don't feel pain, don't feel fear, and only lust for food and to serve the great Cthulhu. These two are human, all right. He waited, then shook the girl again, treating her like a rag doll, to draw forth another shriek of terror. He looked to Adira. She's very frightened. Adira didn't flinch. Her gun pointed directly at the cowled figure. I don't care. Killing them might be the most humane thing. Drummond's smile faltered. Adira's gun muzzle edged up toward the dark cowl. Let's see what's under there. Drummond picked the girl up and stepped in front of the tall figure. He used one hand to reach around and grip her throat. He squeezed hard. She started to choke. First one is for you, then. Adira's face was like stone. Stop! Matt held up his hand and then pushed Adira's gun up. We're better than them. Adira glared and simply brought the gun around again. I don't want the girls. I want the book. The Alazif? You want that now? 
Drummond threw his head back and roared with laughter. To do what? A sound started up, deep, bubbling, and it took Matt a while to work out what it was. The cowled figure was also laughing. It leaned forward and spoke again to Drummond. Drummond cocked his head to listen, but this time Matt heard and understood every word. The words have already been spoken and the final seals removed. It is of no use to them now. This amuses me. Taunt them. Drummond snorted and nodded. We will consider your offer, your weapons and the soldier, for the girls and the book. The cowled figure drew the tome from his robes and held it out. Matt noticed the hand was little more than a slimy flipper that ended in sharp talons. He felt his gorge rise. Drummond grinned and took the book from the flipper and held it up. A deal is done. He shook the girl one-handed. Her face was now blue. The weapons, please, on the ground. He looked at the child. Oops, she's going, going, going. Abrams looked at Adira and nodded. He threw his handgun onto the dark sand. Matt did the same with his. Adira's fingers looked unwilling to release their grip. Matt turned to her. It's what we came for. We have to risk it. She growled and then tossed the machine gun onto the sand. And the others, please, Drummond said softly. Adira threw four more guns down. Drummond's eyebrows shot up. Well, well, you really are a one-woman war, aren't you? The cowled figure leaned forward again to speak in his strange, bubbling tongue. Drummond listened and then threw the girl to the side. Her sister scuttled over to comfort her and then quickly dragged her away toward the cliff wall. Drummond held out the book. You stupid bugs. What would you do with this anyway? It's too late. The seals are broken. Where can you go? What can you do? Even if you made it back to the surface, the world you know will have ceased to exist. You are not even specks of dust compared to the old ones. They have slumbered below the earth and between the slim sheets of reality for nearly as long as this tiny world has existed. They have dined on the massive saurians, the megafauna, and billions of other forms of life who rose to believe they were the rulers of the surface domain. Drummond's face was contemptuous. You are but caretakers, squatters, until the time is right for the great Cthulhu, and that time is now. He stepped to the side. Show them, father. Show them the true face of beauty. Beside him, there came the bubbling, viscous sound again, and finally the cowled figure reached up and pulled back the cloth. Matt heard Adira draw in a breath at the revelation of the creature's form. It was the first time he had ever heard the woman issue even the slightest sound of trepidation. Drummond looked over his shoulder, and then back to Matt, Adira, and Abrams. His eyes shone with a manic love. I'm so rude. Of course you haven't been formally introduced. I'd like you all to meet the first father of us all. He clasped his hands together like a teenager meeting a pop star, and he beamed up at the thing. An octopus, Matt thought. The creature defied reality. It gave the impression of being bipedal, with a vaguely humanoid shape. But now that Matt looked closely, he couldn't actually see where the feet touched the ground, or if there were feet at all. As he stared, the thing actually looked embedded into the dark sand, as if it grew up out of it. Upon its shoulders, there sat a bulbous, pulsating sack 
with two lidless yellow eyes that stared dispassionately at the three of them. There was no nose, just a couple of slits for air holes. Below that, the real madness began, with a nest of tendrils and sucker tentacles that writhed and squirmed. In among the coiling mess, there was a dark hole that opened wide. Behold the beauty of our kingdom. You will serve us as Shagoth, or your meat will be our food. It lifted an arm, and at first Matt thought it was going to point back along the way they had come, but instead the dripping paddle-shaped hand extended long, slimy fingers. To his horror, the fingers kept coming, shooting forward, splitting in two and two again, then thickening to become branches. The first dark branch scooped up their guns and flung them away toward the rock face. Then the other appendages came for Matt. Matt held up his hands across his face, but Adira never flinched. She just turned side on into a wide-legged combat stance and let one of her own hands flash out. The compressed salt dagger shot at the tall being nearly faster than the eye could follow, burying itself into the center of its disgusting face. Eat that. Her face was calm as the whip snapped back from them. There was a horrifying eldritch scream that made Matt's hair prickle on his scalp. Drummond looked panicked, and the hand holding the book snapped back. What have you done? He looked from the creature, whose face was now a knot of massed tentacles as they pulled at the dagger's hilt, then back to Adira Sanesh. He will be angry! For the first time, Adira's lips curled up into a smile. So he can be hurt. The Mossad agent spun, picking up momentum, as she crossed toward Drummond almost faster than the eye could follow. When she was within three feet of him, she finished her turn, and in her hand was the long carving knife. Ha! she yelled as it flashed down with blinding speed and great force across Drummond's wrist. The limb parted and fell to the ground, the fingers still clamped around the book. Abrams had sprinted to retrieve the guns, and Matt leaped for the book at the creature's feet, a seed of confidence taking root in his chest. But then the unthinkable happened. One of the tentacles drew forth the dagger and dropped it to the ground. Black blood oozed, but the writhing settled, and the yellow eyes glared balefully at Adira. The father seemed to inflate slightly. Drummond grimaced in either shock or fear, clutching a wrist that spurted dark blood onto the even darker sand. Heal me, father! Heal me! He spun to scream at the trio. You insects! How dare you! When I am king, I will have you tortured for the rest of your lives. I will torture you, then heal your wounds, and then torture you again and again and again and again! The father seemed to grow another foot taller. The hand started to rise again. Abrams distributed their guns, and Adira immediately shouldered the rifle a grim smile on her face. We need to get the hell out of here, Matt yelled, backing up, but flipping through the book hurriedly, attempting to catch up to where he had stopped trying to understand the symbols. He read quickly, while keeping one eye on the creature growing before them. The father pointed again. This time the long, boneless fingers dripped with black blood. You will be stripped of your flesh and boiled in the acid bath of my belly for eternity. But first I will make you watch as I consume your world. By the time we have finished with the planet, there will be nothing left save the worms in the earth. Drummond half turned, his bloody stump still extended. Except for my kingdom... There will be subjects and some servants in my kingdom, you promised. The yellow eyes shifted to the man, and the writhing alien face carried a look of such derision that Matt very clearly saw the moment Charles Drummond finally seemed to realize where he stood in the old one's plans. 
His arms dropped to his sides and the color drained from his face. You promised. The words were pitiful. Matt knew the man's role had ended. His purpose had been served. He had spoken the words and broken the final seal so that nothing could come between the new celestial convergence and the rise of the beast. His work was done. You fucking promised, Drummond ground his teeth. I risked my life a thousand times. I gave you everything. He stamped his foot like a child. Not quite everything, Charles. The father reached out, fingers growing once again into long tendrils to wrap around Drummond's neck and torso. It was then that the father started to grow, taking the struggling man with it. The little girls by the cliff screamed and turned away, sprinting madly back along the dark beach. It lifted higher and higher, increasing in size, so that the shawl it wore shredded and burst from its expanding frame. With the father's form revealed, they could see that it hadn't been standing on the sand at all, but was instead actually growing out of it. I could have told them! I could have told them! Drummond's words were faint now, as the thing lifted higher, pulling free more of itself that was buried beneath the sand. The huge pipe of flesh trailed into the water. Matt's mouth hung open as he saw Drummond beating at the cords encircling him for only a few seconds more before he was simply pulled inside the pulsating mass, his yells of protest turning to a pitiful scream at the last. The father tilted forward, its huge face looking back down at them. You think I am simply the servant of the great old one? You think I can be hurt? The voice bubbled and frothed in its anger. Good Christ, Abrams said, backing away. The father is not a servant of the Cthulhu. It's a goddamn part of it. Adira grabbed Matt's arm, backing him up. The vanity of the gods. Matt was already out of breath. They never thought we could read it, never believed we were ever significant enough to be a threat. But there is something in here. There must be. He looked up. Abdul Alhazred, the mad Arab, before he lost his life, took great pains to inscribe a warning, and perhaps his weapon or fortification against this growing horror. He hid it away for us, for the next time that the beast attempted to rise. He must have! Matt flipped page after page as the column of flesh that had been the father moved out over the dark water. Whether the being was like an appendage of the great beast rising toward the surface, or some sort of intelligent symbiote that Cthulhu had picked up in its eternal slumber, they couldn't tell. This thing is not immortal. We have already proved it can be hurt. Adira fired a full magazine into the dark flesh, but it absorbed the compacted salt bullets with little effect. Ah, we need a cannon, she said ejecting and then jamming in another magazine. Time to go home, I think. What home? Matt said. We die here or we die there. Unless we find an answer right here, right now, our home, our entire species will be gone before we even make it back to the surface. Ah, shit! Abrams backed into them. Whatever you're gonna do, now would be a good time, or we're about to end up like Drummond. From the cave mouths along the shoreline, the shagoth, the bloated bags of amoebic flesh, now poured forth. They came quickly, moving on slug-like pads, insect limbs, and in some cases the arms and legs of human beings. Adira and Abrams got back to back, ready to fight and die. Pick your targets, Abrams said, and then half turned. You've been a pain in the ass, Captain Sinesh and a pleasure to work with. Adira snorted. You too, Joshua. And I will save one last bullet for myself. I have no plans to end up like your Captain Tanya Kovitz. Abrams nodded. I heard that. 
He then half turned to Matt. Come on, buddy. Matt pointed to the red gates and the huge symbols upon them. The language of the underworld, the celestial speech. He looked at each of the towering glyphs. His altered mind now rearranged the huge symbols, making sense of them. He spoke the strange words. Fungluwe muglu naf kthu rilya vuga nagal fnagan. Huh? Abrams frowned. The words would have sounded like gibberish to anyone else, but to Matt, and in this unholy place, their meaning had the weight of mountains. In his house, at Rilya, dead Cthulhu lies dreaming. He read the text. Hunwigli, Odororan Wundli, Zastor! Matt's mouth dropped open at the implication, and with him dreams his brother, Zastor, the unspeakable one. Zastor, the Caduceus, the intertwined gods. We've seen this name before. I know it. He looked up briefly. There is another one. Matt flipped pages and then stopped. The Enochian glyphs flared like neon lights before his eyes. He absorbed their meaning, symbol after symbol. Great, so there are two of them. Abrams shot several of the Shogoth creatures, and Adira sprayed one of the approaching flanks. Cthulhu is engaged in an eternal rivalry with another ancient creature called Zastur, the Unspeakable One. He looked up again, feeling a little crazed. It's his half-brother. This thing has a brother? Adira asked, firing another few rounds. Matt shook his head. Yes, maybe. I don't know if it's a brother like we understand it, or if a single being separated in some sort of monstrous splitting and budding process. Only Cthulhu has sought to rule the universe by himself, without Zastur. That's why he keeps trying to rise. Adira fired another few rounds into the approaching mass of Shogoth. One is more than enough. No. Matt shook his head. Don't you see? They held each other in an eternal embrace, an intertwining, waiting for the end of time. But somehow, the celestial convergence allows Cthulhu to slip away and feed. Matt looked up. We need to release the brother. Are you mad, Kearns? Abrams turned briefly to yell over his shoulder. You want another of these things loose because you think maybe, just maybe, it will somehow help? Matt frowned and pointed to the growing thing that was the father, now joined with the massive trunk of flesh growing from the lake and disappearing up toward the invisible roof of the cavern. What the hell have we got to lose? Abrams looked to Adira. She just shrugged in return. I've already made my peace, she turned and fired again. Abrams gritted his teeth. What do you need? Matt turned another page. I think I need to call to him. Just call him. Where is he? Adira asked. Matt pointed to the massive red gates. Behind there, in the ancient city of Rillier. That's where Cthulhu came from. That's where he must be sent back to. You better hurry. Adira backed toward Matt and Abrams. They now had a wall of the Shogoth on three sides and the Black Ocean on the other. Getting low, Abrams emptied his gun and smoothly ejected and jammed in another magazine. Matt looked round, beginning to panic. Fear was making his mind a fog of confusion, Everywhere he looked, the cliff walls, sand, and the dark water moved with hellish life forms. Things scuttled, lumbered, and slithered toward them. Monstrosities with too many eyes, thrashing limbs, and sucking or needle-fanged mouths like creatures from the bottom of the deepest ocean trenches, all now descending upon them. Matt looked down at the page of symbols, crushing his eyes shut and saying a silent prayer for his thoughts to clear. 
He exhaled and opened his eyes. The strange circles, dashes, and dots formed sounds deep in his mind. He looked up at the huge gates and sucked in a huge breath, yelling the words, Enduane, Belope, Page Oz, Aziazor, Fanglu, Dualp, Ananail, Olvinu, Od, Zakampk, Oriel, Ol, Bolape, Anoko, Eglo, Ola, Pireta, Arkpe, Onkwa, Pada, Inok, Zastor. Matt waited for several seconds. Nothing, no sounds or emanations from the colossal gates. Abrams fired off three more shots. I'm out. He tossed his gun to the ground and pulled out his compressed salt dagger, the tiny weapon a joke against the approaching monstrous hordes. Matt looked down and read again. Zastor Uglu Cthulhu! Please, please, he wished. Cthulhu Enk Umugli! Matt looked up at the doors. There was still nothing. He felt his gut knot but read again, louder. Endoen bolape page od aziazor fanglu dual pananael olvinu od zakamp orel ol bolape anoko eglo ola pireta arkpi unknown apila paid inok zastor. He screamed the final two sentences. Zastor uglu Cthulhu, Cthulhu ent... Unhugli Zastor! Matt fell to his knees, his head nearly bursting from pain. Blood ran down over his lips and chin, and he felt a warm dampness at his ears. He looked up through bloodshot eyes. The gates remained in place. He shook his head. What did I do wrong? I said the words. What did I miss? He punched the sand, feeling the harsh grains scour his knuckles. Listen. Adira had now backed all the way up to him. Matt lifted his head and held his breath. There was nothing. Absolutely nothing. Strangely, no noise and no movement. Everything in the underworld had stopped and had now turned toward the mighty gates of red granite. Then there came a faint noise, but not from the column of glistening dark flesh that rose from the abyssal ocean. The noise came again, soft at first. There was a shifting, popping sound from behind the gates, as if layers of pack ice were cracking and then breaking away. Matt got slowly to his feet. There was an ear-shattering boom, followed by another and another, Footfalls of the gods, Matt thought. Another sound louder than the first. And then, unbelievably, the giant red gates began to bend outwards. It's... Matt spun to his friends. It's working. He grinned at Abrams, his fists clenched. The major made a fist and turned and grinned. I think we... The huge outgrowth of flesh, the appendage of Cthulhu that the father had become, crashed down upon Abrams, flattening him to the sand. It then retreated back to the water, with the squashed body stuck to it like some sort of tongue. A trail of glistening red was left behind in the deep furrow in the sand. No, no, no! Matt grabbed at his head. Not now, please, not now! The towering father seemed to shiver in delight, ominously leaning over them. Move! Adira turned to fire as a cacophony of screams burst through the huge cavern. As if from a signal, every manner of beast rushed toward them. Worms burst from the sand, huge scuttling beasts descended from the rock walls, and the loathsome Shoggoths were pouring down from the caves, like so many bloated army ants, intent on doing their master's bidding. Matt bumped into Adira, who had stopped running. He spun and saw why. They were trapped. And so, we have run out of places to go, and luck, my friend. Adira wore a grim smile. He admired her courage and perhaps even loved her a little at that moment. There was no braver warrior than this woman who had literally fought her way into hell for him. 
She had the HK MP5N rifle held in one arm and in the other a revolver. She lifted the handgun and looked at Matt, her eyes level. I lied. I have saved two bullets. It will be painless and far quicker than what is in store for us. She waited. Matt knew that one word or even the hint of a nod and she would put a bullet in his brain. He smiled at her, feeling a calm come over him. I've had a good life, he thought. He drew in a deep breath. A sound like planets colliding physically knocked them off their feet. The giant red gates of Rillier cracked open. Matt turned and threw a hand up over his face, but nonetheless saw the magnificent hideousness of the city beyond those titanic barriers. Bioluminescence shone from within, revealing greenish stone blocks of an incomprehensible age. Matt's face went slack with dread, and he beheld visions that were never meant for human eyes. There were great carven statues of weird shape and form. The geometry of Rillier was abnormal, non-Euclidean, and loathsomely redolent of spheres and dimensions apart. Everything Matt could see was gigantic, towering and colossal, insanely so. And then the pale light of the hidden city was shadowed as something vast made its way to the stone gates. Matt remembered more of the secret language of the Book of the Dead, or whatever people had called it over the millennia, and he whispered the words, That is not dead which can eternal lie, and with strange eons... Even death may die. Massive things like monstrous hands gripped the gates and pushed them wide. Matt got slowly to his feet, pointing. Behold Zastur. Chapter 28 The world was at war, and Decker led them all. Rows of big howitzers, tanks, and mobile rocket launchers ringed the far edges of the park in a circle of steel and fire. Eric Ford had worked overtime on the munitions, and the front lines were fully armed with hardened salt shells that they loosed in a constant barrage into the seething masses of Shogoths. Like a wound bursting open to spill its infection onto the skin, the sight of Cthulhu's rise was a many miles wide lump that had broken open to spill bloated monstrosities across the Earth's surface in wave after wave. The soldiers, Decker hoped, didn't realize that at one time the creatures they fought so hard were once their fellow human beings. Countless Shogoth ran, crawled, and slid on slimy pads towards the soldiers. For each hundred that were turned to lifeless jelly, more simply boiled to the surface to take their place. And in among the Shogoth, other huge monstrosities came to fight, feed, and throw themselves at the lines of humanity. Soldiers scrambled about, firing at anything that moved, but still many of the creatures made it through. Huge, towering spiders, centipedes as long as trains, ending in vicious scorpion stings or suckering mouths, and ambling towers of pustulant flesh, bulging with sightless eyes, also fell among the troops, simply toppling forward onto the men like mighty redwood tree trunks, squashing them flat and then absorbing their bodies. General Decker stood in his command center, watching the mayhem. High overhead, surveillance planes circled, delivering him multiple spectrums of his battle. None of them was promising. The plane passed over the Ground Zero crater once more, and he felt his stomach lurch. The thing, Cthulhu they were all calling it now, had finally riven the earth. Mile-long fissures were unzipping as it broke free. Decker didn't feel fear. Instead, his stomach knotted with frustration that he couldn't simply stamp it out with all the traditional firepower he had. We've got fucking lasers, EMP devices, microwave weapons, rail guns, and a hundred other ways to mete out death to our fellow man. And we're fighting these things with salt, taking them out one by one. Fuck it! He brought his fist down on the desk so hard everything jumped an inch. Well, we aren't finished yet. 
he turned. Ready those heavy thermobarracks. Let's see it choke down a few hundred two-thousand-pound exothermic blasts. Before him, the screen was becoming cloudy. What the fuck now? It filled with dark specks, like the battlefield was in a snowstorm. He turned to the room. Get someone in to clean up this fucking image. It's not the feed, sir. Decker frowned. The image wasn't getting any clearer, and in fact was becoming more covered over. Looking down from the aerial shot, he saw that the specks began to swirl like a tornado over the site. Give me resolution on that new mass. Immediately, the focus pulled back to about a thousand feet above the blast zone. Decker leaned forward and snorted softly. Well, I'll be damned. The tornado of specks could now be seen for what they were. Birds. The swirling storm of wings and feathers was getting thicker by the second, as more and more joined in. At the center of the eye of the feathered tornado, moving almost faster than the eye could follow, were the smallest. Sparrows, honey-eaters, and warblers. Then came the starlings, gulls, and pipers. And furthest out, moving slower, were the cranes and eagles. There were so many Decker had to blink to make sure his eyes weren't playing tricks. The sky was now becoming so filled it began to cast shade over the ground. He nodded to the screen. Yes, this thing is a threat, not just to mankind, but to all of us and every living thing. Beneath the swirling birds the ground finally broke open, and a red gas vented into the air. It was the bow wave of the colossal creature finally emerging from the depths of hell itself. As if on command, the birds started to descend, not fall or mindlessly strike the ground, but instead each turned itself into a missile, arrows of bone, blood, and feather that spiked down into the massive center of the emerging eye. Decker straightened the scene reminding him of Bible class from half a century before. And on the last day, the smallest of us will rise up and join the fight against the beast. Decker shouted over his shoulder, Cease fire! He turned to watch the hurricane of furious animals dive into the creature from below. Chapter 29 Matt and Adira stood back to back, trying to avoid the rush of the monstrosities that swirled around them. As soon as the shadow of the unspeakable one had moved to the Red Gates, the beasts of Cthulhu's realm started to retreat back to their master. First one by one, and then in their thousands, they went like dark rivers of shuffling horror. They poured back into the central mass, joining with it, merging and becoming yet more of the dark, jellied muscle that was vainly straining to reach our world. It seems stuck, not moving any higher. Something is stopping Cthulhu from breaking through. Matt grinned. Maybe General Decker was able to halt it. Then we can do no more. Adira spun to drag him along the sand until he managed to right himself. Matt turned to look back at the gates. Something blood-red was emerging like a mountain of pulsating muscle. Once past the barrier, it shot forward, colliding with the column of black, greasy flesh in the center of the dark ocean. The shockwave of the impact knocked Matt and Adira forward off their feet, and they both rolled to look back. Zastur had wrapped itself around its brother, and like a giant fist, it squeezed. Zastur will not let Cthulhu rise. It knows it is not their time, Matt said. The thing that had emerged from behind the red gates extended out and around the mass of Cthulhu, but its end was still lost somewhere deep inside the city of Rillier. Matt brought his hands up to his head to cover his ears, as there came a wailing from the million mouths, jaws, beaks, and toothless maws that had formed across the dark mass of Cthulhu. Matt looked at his watch. Oh, God, the convergence is concluding. We need to be out of here, or we're staying. Then see you at the top, Professor. 
Adira started to sprint along the shoreline. Matt followed, both of them heading back to the cave mouth they had used to enter Cthulhu's realm. They still needed to weave around all manner of hideous creatures that poured forth from the caves. There came the father's priests, the shaven-headed humanoids, also stick-like insectoid things with grinning human faces. There were slithering worms with spiked fangs and sides dotted with black eyes, skinless centipedes with running sores and lumps of muscled flesh that hopped on massive elephantine stumps. All continued to pour back into the core of their master. The screams of rage rose, and chancing a look back again, Matt saw that the huge column had begun to be dragged from the ceiling and was being slowly tugged toward the massive gates of Rillier. Finally, from out of the darkness above them appeared the head of the beast. Matt felt an animal fear shoot through his body at the vision of the monstrous ancient being. The Alazif's description was accurate, but still could never fully describe the horror that Matt witnessed. He had impressions of an octopus, a dragon, and even a human caricature with a pulpy, tentacled head surmounting a grotesque and scaly body. The face, or the front of the being, carried a huge central lidless eye surrounded by dozens of smaller black orbs, and then around these were masses of feelers. The thought of their world ever having something like this on its surface threatened Matt's sanity. Cthulhu emanated pure evil, and perhaps its slumbering dreams had touched humankind ever since he had crawled from the swamps and stood on hind legs. It had always been there, the evil presence influencing and haunting us. Satan, Diablo, Lucifer, Baal, Cthulhu, they were all the one being. And it was real. Cthulhu arched down, its flailing tentacles, thicker than city blocks, bloomed apart to reveal a huge beak that it tried to bury in the flesh of its brother. Whipping tentacles smashed rock from the walls, and specks fell from its body. The servants clinging to its skin were being shaken free like fleas from a dog. The two mighty creatures had wrapped tentacles around each other in what was far from a loving family embrace. Each exerted impossible pressure on the other's form, but slowly, Zastur was dragging Cthulhu back toward the Red Gates. A huge chunk of stone the size of a battleship fell from somewhere overhead to strike a far stretch of beach, crushing flat hundreds of the swarming creatures and creating a tremor beneath their feet. That settled it for Matt and Adira. They were sprinting now for their lives. Gradually, the planets were moving out of alignment, and whatever labyrinthine maze had been opened to reveal this dismal place of abominations would soon be shut. Adira had her gun up, but the beasts they passed ignored them in their haste to return to their master. Amongst the dark, reeking mass... There was a flash of red, and Matt zigzagged toward it, increasing his speed. Hey! Adira angled after him. The lump of red looked up. The twins in their dirty pajamas clung to each other, their faces streaked. Matt jinked past something that looked like a dog-headed spider, and then bent and reached out while trying not to slow his pace. He grabbed up one of the girls, who immediately clung to him. The other he snatched and just held under his arm and accelerated once again. Go, go, go! Adira pushed him in the back and then sped to get in front of him and force open a path. The Mossad woman's long legs pumped hard on the dark sand, and Matt gritted his teeth, his head already swimming with exhaustion as he tried to keep pace. They ran hard now, bouncing off walls as time moved rapidly against them. Adira was first to the shimmering curtain between their worlds, but when she went to run through, she bounced backward. It was now less like a bodiless separation than a wall of glass. She collided with Matt and knocked him to the ground. The girls screamed and rolled from his arms. Shit, no! 
Matt got to his feet first, the twins already clinging to him again. He helped Adira up. Her nose was bloody, and she shook her head. Shitza, that was like hitting a wall. She rubbed her face, smearing blood. Matt reached out and touched the wall. He pushed at it, but his hand refused to go through. It's closed. We're too late. Over my dead body. Adira planted her legs and lifted her gun, firing a dozen rounds into the wall. The last few passed right through, striking the rock tunnel beyond. She turned and grabbed Matt, and one-handed fired again, upsetting the wall's stabilization just enough for them all to dive through. The distortion wall immediately reformed, and then, like some sort of gigantic digestive system, the rock walls began to soften, pulsate, and ripple like the peristaltic motions of a giant animal's gut. Then they too began to collapse, just like the soil in the sinkhole in Iowa, Matt thought, getting to his feet. He sprinted now, first beside Adira and then behind as the weight of the girls slowed him and the ever-narrowing tunnel forced them into single file. In another moment, he saw a tiny dot of yellow, the dying glow stick lying at the bottom of the pit. The walls now were barely further apart than his shoulders, and he yelled until his voice was rasping. Dive! Dive! Adira did just that, and Matt followed. They both landed hard. Matt spun in time to see the walls coming together like lips, swallowing everything that had been behind and probably below them. The huge stone lintel with the carvings remained in place above them, but beneath it now there was nothing but a blank wall. Matt remained sprawled on the ground, the girls still with their faces buried in his chest. Adira was lying on her back, breathing hard. He closed his eyes and concentrated, reaching out with his mind, trying to feel the monstrous presence. There was nothing. The sensations he had felt after the touch of the Shogoth, the second sight and connection with the beast, seemed gone. He looked down at his hand. The book was still there. Is it over? Adira rolled her head to look at him. He smiled, seeing just how battered she was. Over? I don't know if it will ever be over. Maybe for this millennium it is. We need to see what happened above us, see what's left. Call me a cab. She shut her eyes. Matt grinned and looked across to the tiny dot of yellow that was fast fading. I'll call you mad if you want to be down here when the lights go out. She groaned and sat up. Suddenly, I want to see the sun again. Matt got to his feet and pulled her up. She pointed at the book. That thing is trouble. It should stay here, or better yet, be destroyed. Matt looked down at the cover. The glyphs, the Enochian, the language of the angels or the underworld— None of it made sense to him anymore. The power to read them was gone. No, it's not for us to decide that. It is both a sword and a shield. It needs to be protected for the next time. He craned his neck to look upward, but felt a tug on his arm. He looked down. One of the small girls looked up solemnly. We want to go home now. Matt nodded. Good idea. Let's all go home. What the hell? Decker watched in disbelief as the Shogoths retreated like army ants pulling back into their nest. They ignored the soldiers firing at them, even though they exploded into black goo when struck. The very last seemed to become confused, ambling about, and then didn't even bother trying to make it below ground. Instead, they simply started to fall apart, becoming an oily sludge that steamed and ran into the cracks of the earth. Beside him, Don Mancino was amazed. Did we win? 
Decker stared for a full minute and then shook his head. Win? No. We didn't beat them or the thing rising. We never laid a freaking glove on it. Something or someone else stopped it. And for how long? He snorted. Ask me again in another 1,300 years. What happens now? Mancino asked. Decker exhaled. Damned if I know. Put the world back together might be a good place to start. He snorted softly and then turned to the room. Pull everyone back and find me Major Joshua Abrams. I'm betting that he and that mad professor of his had something to do with this. What about Captain Adira Sanesh? Mancino still stared at the screen. Decker thought for a moment and then shook his head. Sergeant Major, right about now, I wouldn't care if we made her the next president of the United States. Leave her be. He saluted and headed for the door. Epilogue. Arkham, Essex County, Massachusetts. Matt walked slowly across the quadrangle of Miskatonic University's grounds. Tucked under his arm was a prize that was beyond value, the book. It was both a curse and a salvation for the human race. Abdul al-Hazred, the mad Arab poet of Damascus, had been shown insights into the world that could have been. And even though it had cost him his life, he had written down the strange symbols and words and then ensured those words remained safe for when they would next be needed. Where those thoughts and words originally came from was a mystery. Perhaps there were other great beings, elder gods, less inclined to destroy and consume life than the more odious things that slumbered somewhere deep beneath our feet. And now it was Matt's responsibility to keep it safe. The original book could never be taken back to the Library of Alexandria, but it still needed to be hidden away in a repository, somewhere secure and off the beaten path. He knew just the place. He had learned that the Ole Misk, the Miskatonic University, had a deep vault below its old science lab. It was strange. The university, though a prestigious one, would not have been his first choice for storage of something so valuable and without doubt critical to the survival of the human race. But it was as if the book had decided for itself, guiding and then compelling him to bring it here, perhaps to be hidden away and forgotten for another thirteen hundred years. Just touching the strange leather of its cover caused images of the abominations to swirl like mad dervishes in his mind, along with the passages in Syriac, ancient Greek, and Arabic. There were also the symbols of the first angels, though they were now impenetrable to him. He knew he would never be fully free of them until he performed one last duty. Matt entered the university's stationery shop selecting the most expensive vellum paper he could find and a fountain pen. He needed to write to add in their battle and how they managed to push back the old one. He had to quickly get it down, tell the story of Cthulhu, the Shagoths, and the other abominations. And he needed to include his own warning before his mind was blank to it all. He smiled as he pushed out of the store, making the small bell tinkle overhead. He headed to the Miskatonic vaults, but first he needed to find a place to write. Maybe one day they'll refer to me as the Mad American, Mad Matt. He grinned and turned his face to the sky, catching a ray of sun on his face. Overhead, a bird circled, and as he watched, another joined it, and then another. As he passed across the campus, a small cloud of birds formed above him, following. Author's Notes
Many readers ask me about the background of my novels. Is it real or fiction? Where do I get the situations, equipment, characters, or their expertise from? And just how much of any legend has a basis in fact? In the case of Book of the Dead, there is one absolute reality. Its real creator, the American author Howard Phillips, H.P. Lovecraft. My book, most of the creatures described, and even my hero being a professor in search of science and knowledge, are drawn from Lovecraft's mythos universe. This book is where I pay homage to the man. I hope he would have approved. Howard Phillips, H.P. Lovecraft Lovecraft was born in Providence, Rhode Island, on August 20, 1890. Today he is considered one of the most influential fathers of monstrous and macabre horror, though it was only years after his death that he received the recognition he and his work deserved. A young Lovecraft spent his early life being cosseted by an overprotective mother as his father was confined to a mental institution. His grandfather turned out to be a significant influence, as much of the time he was with Howard was spent telling him fantastic make-believe stories, and this soon became their favorite pastime. It wasn't long before an eight-year-old Lovecraft began composing his own rudimentary horror tales. Then later, when in high school, he began to involve local children in elaborate fantasy play-acting, only stopping the projects just prior to his 18th birthday. At school, Lovecraft abhorred many of the traditional subjects, but developed a keen interest in history, linguistics, chemistry, and astronomy, and obtained a deep understanding and knowledge of each of these. Though his intellect was being honed, his lack of interest in traditional topics led to him failing to graduate. Lovecraft began to withdraw from the world, and soon was living a near nocturnal lifestyle. However, his writing, if mostly just personal, continued. At 23, his literary flair was seen in the letter pages of a story magazine, and he was soon invited to join an amateur journalism association. This was the trigger he needed, and he soon began to send out more of his works. At the age of 31, he had his first formal publication in a professional magazine. Lovecraft's life seemed to be thrown open then. He lived in New York, married an older woman he had met at one of his journalism conferences, and by 34 was a regular contributor to a new fiction magazine called Weird Tales. Lovecraft returned to his home in Providence in 1926, and over the next year he produced some of his most fantastic works, including The Call of Cthulhu, first published in Weird Tales in 1928, which was the authoritative basis for the Cthulhu mythos, so named by a contemporary author by the name of August Derleth. A recurring theme in Lovecraft's work is the utter unimportance of us, humankind, when faced with the true horrors that live in the Old One's universe. Lovecraft made many references to these elder gods and great Old Ones, who were described as a race of ancient powerful deities from the cosmos, who once ruled the earth long before humanity's oldest ancestors had even crawled from the ooze. These titanic monstrosities are now in a death-like sleep, hibernating, but still reaching out to us. This reaching out was first spoken of in The Call of Cthulhu, in which the humans were sent mad when they even had a glimpse of what exists in this shared universe. Sadly, for H.P. Lovecraft, fame and fortune eluded him, and he was never properly able to support himself as an author. Once again, he began to withdraw from the world, and as he never promoted his own work, many of his pieces were left unappreciated, unsold, and unread for decades. With his inheritance completely spent in continuing ill health and deeply troubled, he died at the age of 46. Today, he is regarded as one of the most significant 20th century authors in his genre, 
and a genius well beyond his years. H. P. Lovecraft's literary gifts to us remain vibrant to this day, and his influence has been remarked upon by authors such as Stephen King, Clive Barker, Joe R. Lansdale, Neil Gaiman, F. Paul Wilson, Ramsey Campbell, and Brian Lumley. All have cited Lovecraft as one of their primary influences. As do I in this book, Book of the Dead. Cthulhu H. P. Lovecraft's Great Old One and Monstrous God from the Below Lovecraft gave several pronunciations for the name, but his favored version was Clulhlu. The first syllable, Clul, is pronounced gutturally and harshly. So try Clulhlu. However, the pronunciation has changed, and today it is more common to hear it pronounced as Cthulhu. After the call of Cthulhu, Lovecraft's evil deity went on to be featured in numerous popular culture references, from books and movies to online games. In The Call of Cthulhu, H. P. Lovecraft describes the Cthulhu as follows. A monster of vaguely anthropoid outline, but with an octopus-like head, whose face was a mass of feelers, a scaly, rubbery-looking body, prodigious claws on hind and fore feet, and long, narrow wings behind. A mix between a giant human, an octopus, and a dragon, depicted as being hundreds of feet tall, with human-looking arms and legs, and a pair of rudimentary wings on its back. Similar to the entirety of a giant octopus, with an unknown number of tentacles surrounding its supposed mouth, able to change the shape of its body at will, extending and retracting limbs and tentacles as it sees fit. A Shagoth, Vile Servants of the Great Ones The Shagoth were first described in Lovecraft's 1931 Antarctic adventure novella At the Mountains of Madness. Note, that was one of my own influences for Beneath the Dark Ice. In the story, Lovecraft describes them as huge, amoeba-like creatures made out of glistening black ooze, with multiple eyes that formed and popped open all over their surface. These eyes could float freely over the lumpen body mass. In another description, they are said to lack any formal or base body shape, and instead could produce limbs, eyes, and mouths at will. If you have ever seen John Carpenter's movie, The Thing, you'll get an idea of the influence Lovecraft had on this film director's work. The character of the mad Arab, Abdul Alhazred, found the mere idea of their existence on Earth to be horrifying enough to drive a person to insanity. The Gates of the Hidden City Relier is a fictional lost city that first appeared in The Call of Cthulhu. Relier is sunken deep under the Pacific Ocean. Lovecraft put the coordinates at approximately latitude 47 degrees 9 minutes south, longitude 126 degrees 43 minutes west. The water there is impenetrably deep and warm. In 1997, Navy sensors detected a very large noise, picked up on two different marine sensors thousands of miles apart. Being produced at latitude 50 degrees south, longitude 120 degrees west, close to Lovecraft's Relier. This sound, known as a bloop, is not thought to correspond to any known living or non-living source. To this day, the phenomenon is still unexplained, and no agreed or adequate explanation has ever been provided. Forbidden Knowledge Secrets and knowledge that are buried, sunken, long forgotten, or forbidden is a recurring theme in Lovecraft's works. Many of his characters, usually scientists or professors, are driven by curiosity or scientific endeavor, and in many of his stories, what they uncover in their searches usually proves to be a Pandora's box, with the secrets they reveal, release, usually destroying their discoverers both physically and mentally. 
the old gods' influences on us. The creatures of Lovecraft's universe will often have humans who act as servants. Cthulhu, for instance, is worshipped as a god by many secret cults in both the Western world and among the Greenland Eskimo, Inuit, and the voodoo covens of Louisiana. Lovecraft was like many of his turn-of-the-twentieth-century contemporaries in that he saw modern man as being closer to science and rigid thinking and the indigenous natives as being closer to the spiritual, supernatural knowledge unknown to civilized man. This closeness to the natural world was what he saw as making the savages, the keepers of the ancient, and long forgotten in the modern world, lore. Miskatonic University The university where Matt Kearns finally deposits the book first appeared in Lovecraft's 1922 story, Herbert West, Reanimator. It is a fictional university located in Arkham, a made-up town in Essex County, Massachusetts. It is named after the Miskatonic River, also made up. Miskatonic University was supposedly known for its fantastic library collection of ancient occult books. The Miskatonic Library also holds one of the very few surviving copies of the Necronomicon. But this wasn't the only fantastic tome it held locked away in its vaults. It was also said to include the mysterious Book of Ibon, that strangest and rarest of occult volumes that was said to have come down through a series of translations from a prehistoric original written in the lost language of Hyperborea. And now it contains the original Al-Azif as well. It is locked away in its deep vault. Hopefully, it'll be there when next we need it. Belinda hopes you enjoyed the reading of Book of the Dead, written by Greg Beck and read by Sean Mangan. Our audiobooks are becoming increasingly popular among travelers, families, and people who are on the go. If you really enjoyed this audiobook, please introduce your friends and family to the experience. We're sure they'll love you for it. If you want to hear more about our fabulous range of titles, please visit us online at bolinda.com. Thanks for listening, and remember to always take a Belinda audiobook with you. <laughs>